This is Surrey County Cricket Club, born in a tavern in 1845. The symbol of Kennington, we've seen London grow around us. Cricket's original champions, as Charles Alcock brought his vision to life and we cemented a reputation as a place of firsts. International football, FA Cup finals, international rugby, test matches, as well as where English pride came to die before a great rivalry was born from its ashes. We share our feathers with royalty and pass on the honor of the brown cap through generations. We've seen England's best spend their careers with us. Well, that's Jack Hobbs. Head and shoulders, yes, over all other living batsmen. And the game's best finish under our gasometer. We've won seven in a row, thanks to Surridge, May, Barrington, Locke, Laker, and the Bedser twins. In fact, we're well known for our famous siblings, but there's always been one family who have stood out. We saw the West Indies grip a nation on our doorstep, and a pioneer set records galore in the women's game. The end of the century, brought a fresh take on Ik Dien, as Holyoke and his England teammates transformed us on the pitch. The changing of the oval skyline brought the greatest of finales. There it is. England have regained the ashes. And an era of final test triumphs. Alistair Cook has done it. A century in his last. Well played. On our way to our own red ball century. We're one half of the game's oldest rivalry, and it's only London Derby. Oh my! Can you clear the pavilion? Local players are always the lifeblood of our side. But the world's best are attracted to us too. We've come through tragedies. Now, we're home to world champions and cricketers of the year. 175 years have passed. There's much more to come. This is Surrey County Cricket Club. Heart of London, pride of the county, the grandest stage in world cricket. Good morning, welcome back to the Keir Oval for day three of this clash between Surrey and Somerset, the second round of the county championship in 2024. On day two, uh, well, Surrey made the most of good batting conditions, losing only six wickets across the course of the day, advancing while well, taking the lead and moving it on to 73. So they'll resume today at 358 for six with Cam Steele, 35, Jordan Clark on seven. Top scoring for the home side was Dom Sibley, who posted an even 100 and a half century for Jamie Smith. Also one for Ben Vokes, who was the last wicket to fall last night on 57. So let's take a look at the highlights first, and we'll return here for live action in about 10 minutes. Runs for Burns, his first of the day. Played late, played softly, down to deep third, all along the ground for four. In red ball cricket. Now that's a genuine edge, but into the ground and runs away for the first boundary of the day. Now that's gone fine. And it beats the fielder. Two boundaries for Sibley in this over. Um, by the way, edged, but in front of second slip. Down to the boundary for four. A little streaky, but played late and into the ground. Slips might be a little too deep, perhaps. They'll be thinking about that. It's actually nicely played by Sibley, reaching out. Yep, his hand slightly away from his body, but he's found a gap. He's found another four. <laughs> nicely played by Burns. It was loose down the leg side. And he's got a little flick on it. It was a free shot, really. That's a sumptuous shot from Dom Sibley. That's come right out of the screws. First time we've really seen a ball pitch short, I would say. Sibley latched onto it immediately. Lovely. 
finds the gap between mid on and mid wicket the chase is on but I think it's going to be fruitless it is another boundary for Burns and Surrey's deficit moves below 200 that's thrashed away that is a marvellous shot the rapier blade of Burns foolish this time and punched tidily up to mid on he's in fine fettle this morning is Dominic Sibley and that is his 50 85 deliveries Cameron Ponsby leg size this time and that will be so frustrating for the bowler because he's applied a degree of pressure here he's bowled one side of the wicket he's beaten the bat twice they thought they'd had him in the previous over classical burns waits for it cuffs it away no third Make that four more. Easy pickings. Pull into the gap. Easy as you like. All along the floor, Rory Burns is starting to tick here. And that brings up his 50 as well. 51 from 74. Beautifully played. It's going to beat the man. It's going to run away as well. It's going to be a chase for mid-off. Can't see him hauling it in. And no, that runs away for four more. Dominic Sibley. He's enjoying himself here. That's nicely worked out towards the boundary by Burns. He's going to get four more all along the ground. Nice use of the feet advancing on Bashir. Driven down the ground again and beaten the man at mid on, even though he was relatively straight. Been a feature of Don Sibley throughout this knock now. I make that a dozen boundary fours that's going to run away for four erring slightly in line by Craig Overton but you do not give Dominic Sibley anything on or outside his pads beautiful shot of the morning for me everything right about it and that will just make its way up to the dugouts there at extra cover That's clever. Nice steer. Resourceful as he's been throughout the course, really, Sibley. Trying to apply pressure to the fielding team. Oh, caught behind. Yep. The partnership is broken at last. Bashir. Bit of extra pace through the crease. Burns went back to cut. James Roo, tidy chance pouched. shots that's what Pope is just so efficient at doing putting away balls on leg stump boundary to finish help yourself stuff for Ollie Pope there placed it between backward point and the cordon ends the over that'll be four though that's well timed it's just a tiny bit too full perhaps slightly leg side-ish and punched by Dominic Sibley who moves now into the 90s shortish again this time and that'll be four more back to back Dominic Sibley just hanging back and waiting for it hitting it on the top of the bounce punching it past the man at extra top edge will it land safe no he's taking it this time hard in mouth moment but he's managed to haul that one in Brilliant. shot that is a lovely shot one of the shots of the day to get going Jamie Smith has just punched that one straight past Casey Aldridge who couldn't even begin to get down out of his follow through strong shot it was there to hit it was a real drag down manages not quite to pull it in and so that is two boundaries from the over and Casey Aldridge is down Oh, four more he's only been out there 15 minutes and he's hit two of the shots of the day already carbon copies really longish half volleys by Casey Aldridge who's striving as best he can oh. four more thanks very much goodness me it's just gorgeous to watch isn't it do gamble responsibly thanks. he's tucked that round the corner 
he's coming back for a second and there it is you can hear the applause around that time oh yep it's through the left arm spin removes the man on an even hundred we saw that yesterday around this time of day that's a nice steer Smith who's come out playing his shots down the ground there using the pace taken on and does it well I mean since Smith's walked out there the games look different that's gone 20 rows back it could have easily ended up out towards the gasometer it's gone high and he's cleared the man pretty well I was gonna say comfortably not by too much bit of a top edge but that's enough nonetheless second maximum now for Jamie Smith so Bashir back into the attack and he's been punched very nicely off the back foot for four it's beautifully timed nothing more than a, a jab really into the offside Ben Folks trying to it's a short pitch bowling to the leg side boundary which I think was wise yeah easy as you like drag down and Jamie Smith has just pumped that straight through mid wicket effortless really short boundary and he's peppered it foolish this time and it will bisect the two men on the drive and limp over the line for four more hoiked into the onside and they're easy pickings now really Pretorius getting the new ball from JM Finstand and he's clipped through mid wicket for four by folks that's his best shot so far edge stand through third slip not sure whether it would have carried but it will get to the rope it wouldn't have carried Adam and he played with relatively soft hands nonetheless oh, oh knocks him over with a beauty stump cartwheeling perfect response from Overton down the outside edge with the previous ball and that's back off the deck first runs for the club it'll be a boundary there was a chance for it to be cut off. Yeah, well placed. Down the gap there. Between mid wicket and wide is mid on. Folks, second boundary since T. Yeah, towards extra cover for four more to complete the over. So, folks on top of the bounce there. All timing to 33. Oh, give it him. Well, well. Lawrence does go across his stumps. Oh, now that looks close. Yes. Moved across his stumps, did folks, so it's not going to be a consideration because there is a second bowling bonus point. Safely negotiated by Cameron Steele. He will come back tomorrow unbeaten on 35. He'll be joined by Jordan Clark, unbeaten on 7. Surrey. 3.58 for 6, that lead of 73, they're ahead of the game. Tomorrow, you fancy. So that is the state of play as we resume on morning three here at the Keir Oval. Adam Collins with you, Daniel Norcross with me, Surrey in a good position, 358 for 6, batting all the way through yesterday. A lead of 73, still 35 at the close, batting with Jordan Clark on 7. They've put on 19, that final session brought 95 runs, 3 wickets lost. Two of them leg before and one uh, stump cut wheeling out of the ground. So reward for bowling straight. Uh, what we know, Daniel, as we cast forward, is that tomorrow has uh, has a slightly problematic weather radar. It's mucky. Which, which suggests that the cricket we see today might be enterprising, at least early on with Surrey still batting. I would expect them to be anyway, because with Cameron Steele, Jordan Clark at the crease, and yes. Jamie Overton and Gus Atkinson to come, they are aggressive players, but... There will be, I think, a little bit more urgency still, won't there? That lead, they want to get that lead up a bit because in a perfect world for Surrey, they want to get so far ahead of the game, like 140, 150 kind of lead, yeah. that you put so much pressure on Somerset in their third innings and try and do the bulk of the wicket taking today because tomorrow's forecast, it's one of those weird ones. It's showery rain that rushes in and out. It's a nightmare for the ground staff. It's a nightmare for spectators. We've been on those days, Adam, where... There hasn't been that much rain, but the timing of the rain has meant that you don't get on for hours on end because as soon as the covers come off and the players go out, the rain comes again. 
And so Surrey will need to be enterprising. But I think, you know, it's the natural way that they're going to play anyway. Yesterday, they sort of made sure of the game in a way. that Well, they sort of made sure that it was going to be unlikely for them to lose by batting long and pretty solidly. Uh, and you've got to give a lot of credit to Somerset. I mean, Shoa Bashir and Casey Aldridge yep. in particular bowled really well. You can see from their figures there. Shoa Bashir, 31 overs, bowling off spin, predominantly to right-handers on a pretty good wicket. He's only going at two and over. That's really impressive. And Casey Aldridge is a young man. And you now the wicket of Ollie Pope was a really good example of intelligent bowling. He bowled dry, he bowled hard and into the wicket. Pope likes to get on with it. He got a bit frustrated, went after one that wasn't quite there for the shot, top edge, and he's out. So, you know, th this, is a, this is a good attack that knows what it's doing. It's not going to give runs away easily, so Surrey are going to have to make the pace. Yeah, they stuck with it. it it's been a, a story of uh, two sessions, really, in that the first session across the two days has been worth one wicket, and the yeah. second session has been worth ten. Isn't it interesting? So as far as uh, well, what we might see now, if that pattern continues with Surrey really going at it, but it'll be difficult, because you mentioned the way Bashir bowled yesterday. To my eye, it's that he's gone away on this winter tour, played these test matches, and return to the level below and now trusts himself a little bit more using the width of the crease, varying his pace, uh, how much he was flighting the ball. Uh, I, I just felt like a, a very accomplished performance from him yesterday without luck either. One wicket, an Didn't important it? one. I mean, uh, it, when it, he struck to remove Burns after that big partnership of 167, but he looked a, he looked like a bowler who's returned from test duty. He really did. Uh, and what was so impressive, well, because there wasn't a lot of turnout there for him, was there really? There wasn't a lot of assistance, as you'd expect. Kookaburra ball day two but his lengths his lines they were so remorselessly accurate um, yeah I think it's 110 overs isn't it for bonus points I think I'm pretty sure that's all right we're going to note through that I don't think is that can be right <laughs> no that's okay we'll, we'll just um, we'll put that to one side for the yeah. time being so yes play set to resume in a couple of minutes from now another lovely day uh, well for the for the time being at least even the radar today is completely 100% free of spots on it so uh, that'll be the job for Steele and Clark to dictate terms early on. It's a, it's a relishable day, though, today, yes. isn't it? Because you've got this kind of feeling that with Surrey in the lead, I think, you'd, you'd, obviously, you'd expect them to spend 15, 20 minutes getting their eyes in, getting adjusted and used to the day's play. But after that, I think we're going to see action one way or the other, be it wickets or runs. It's going to be it's going to be fun. And there was a buzz, actually, when I came out of the tube. There were people. There were young people. There were all sorts of people coming to the ground. <laughs> It's a Sunday. It's possibly the sweet spot. I think Elizabeth Ammon of the Times said this yesterday to me. She said it's the sweet spot because club cricket hasn't started yet. The Easter holidays are coming to an end. This is a good weekend to come down and watch the cricket. So if you're nearby, um, do pop in. I think we're going to have some fun today. And if you're not able to come down, stick with us throughout the course of the day. It'll be myself, Adam Collins, Daniel Norcross, Yaz Rana, Cam Ponson, be Katia Whitney. I think George DeBell's dropping in at some point later is today. He? Oh, I'll tell you else who's coming at lunchtime. Ben Bloom. Ben Bloom. And mm. we and we welcome Madam President to the box. The President of Surrey is coming, so we've got to be in our best behaviour. OK. All right. Noted. Make sure everything's clean and tidy. It rarely is in this commentary. <laughs> oh, no, we'll, we'll, have to. We'll, we'll take a step up. I liked what you're wearing today, by the way. We're going to have... It's for the President. Uh, we're going to have Overton start day three. Away from us at the Vauxhall end. So Clark, who made a, an excellent century here last year against Knotts. Tell you what else we might get. We might get Overton to Overton, and that's always fun. Yes. There's usually a bouncer or two thrown in when those two are facing each other. I'll say more like a bouncer or 12, if I recall yeah. correctly, the last time they faced <laughs> up against each other. Yeah. So the slip the gully, remembering with this Kookaburra ball. They took the second new one 31 overs ago to start the final session yesterday, so that that won't have much about it. Beat point setback as well. Shot. Nice way to start. Straight drive. Healthy swing of the blade. Boundary. Second ball of day three. Lead up to 77. And that'll make him feel good. Right out of the middle of the bat. A little too full from Overton. Seeing if there's any swing early. It's, it's been a strange thing. We asked Andrew Sampson this, and I don't know if he was able to get back to me because it's quite tricky to break down. But Mark Church and I had a feeling that in April, the middle session was the most productive because we felt that the pitch had warmed up a bit, the air temperature was better. 
you're quite big on this, aren't you, about yeah. the April and how cool it is, and acknowledging it, it was 20 on day one here, 21 yesterday, mm. and, a, and a forecast high of, I think, 19 today. So we're not having April weather that we had two or three summers ago when it was bitterly cold for yeah. those first three or four rounds. It's surface temperature, Colo, because that ground is has been cold and stayed cold for months and months. <laughs> so it's that dis it's that difference between air and ground temperature okay. that really makes a difference, I think. I say this as a man like everybody else in cricket who has no real idea of why the ball does what it does at different times and in different places, but it's just the effect of observation, I guess, that makes us think these things. I often think that it's a little bit odd when something, oh, well, I'm, I'm from these parts and the weather comes from there. I mean, yeah. living somewhere for a long time does not make you a meteorologist. <laughs> no. Ooh, inside edge saved by that, possibly. So Overton, who bowled 19 overs yesterday, picked up the wicket of Jamie Smith, who was flying. He was up to 51. The ball after his half century. He had his off-stump cartwheeling Overton. Nice piece of bowling with the second new ball. Might have been the ball of the day, that one. Yeah. Just held its line enough. You don't need to move it extravagantly. Just enough to beat the bat. That's what he did. Ends the over. Just a boundary from it. 362 for six. That leads 77. I do wonder what Craig Overton's career might, might look like in, in sort of two or three years' time. He's had those experiences with England across the formats and... He's been in a lot of squads, mm. but not quite so much of late, having had the back surgery over the winter to extend and prolong his career. That meant that he missed a year of franchise cricket, missed a year of being able to maximise his income. Clearly devoted to the club here at Somerset. He's been formally made the vice-captain to Lewis Gregory. So with Tom Abel stepping down at the end of last season, a new leadership axis at Somerset. In order to, to get back to England, what would he need to do? Casey Aldridge, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm buoyed by this. I, th I thought Aldridge was really impressive yesterday. They, they just found a way to drag that run rate back. It was up in the fours about an hour before lunch and down to 3.23, in no small part due to the work of Aldridge bowling in tandem with Bashir. He came very little away, didn't he? Yeah. Picked up Pope and Lawrence. First ball for Steele today goes out to deep backward point where there is protection. Lead 78. And what I really loved was that um, soon after getting Pope out, he went for a couple of boundaries in an over, a couple of overs later, and he was furious. He hated giving away runs. I, I like to see that <laughs> in a bowler. Now, given the dominance of Surrey's position at various points yesterday with that mammoth opening partnership, you know, still to be so niggardly about every last run is quite marvellous. Some early news from round the grounds, by the way. Come to in just a sec. Ooh. News already? News already. He's swinging a miss there from Clark, by the way. Gives a sense of how he's going to play this morning. Alex Lees, on his 31st birthday today, has just passed his 10,000th first class run, and he's four away from 100. That's all lovely. We might, we probably could have waited four runs on before telling you that story, but that's okay. Oh, no, no, no. It's, yeah, 10,000 first class. <laughs> 10,000 more important than 100. I like oh, the fact so. that it's on his birthday. Like, yeah. Might be not a bad early one for Surrey Broadcast at gmail.com. Now I think about it. Where significant things have happened on cricketers birthdays. I can give you a brilliant one. Okay. I, I, my, my, the one that I will always return to is... Hattrick on his birthday, Peter Settle. Yeah, of course. Yep, that is terrific. Um, but I wish Andrew Sampson was birthday. here for us. Because I set him a task so fiendishly <laughs> difficult that I thought we were going to fall out over it. <laughs> oh, he's, he's here. Here he is, he's Sammo. Here. <laughs> what did I miss, he says, as he <laughs> enters the room. So the match was taking place that I'm going to talk about now at Headingley in 2018, I think. And one Sam Curran was playing for England. Against Pakistan, wasn't it? On his 20th birthday. Yep. And he got out for 20. Mm. And of course, what does Norcross do when he's got Samson next to him? <laughs> he says, ooh, that's strange. 
<laughs> Let me ruin your day. Driving on the up there, Clark. You can see here already that the steel's slashed a backward point to start the over, and Clark on a couple of occasions trying to wallop it through the offside. We're, we're going to see some brisk batting here. Please continue. I mean, it's an obvious question to ask, isn't it? So, no, Andrew, how many times has somebody got out on their birthday for the score of their age? Has Sam got 20 on his 20th birthday? And Andrew gave me a look filthier than any he's given me before or since. <laughs> and the over one from it, lead 78. It was a sort of, you've got to be joking. Uh, he reliably informed me the next day that he was... Yeah, it took you... No, it took you... You said you, you did it overnight. It took you about four hours to find. <laughs> the same day, right? <laughs> And it had only happened once before in Test cricket. Isn't uh -huh. that strange? It's an England opener. Only one. Hang on. Only one time in Test cricket has someone been dismissed on their birthday, birthday of the same their score. Age. Yeah. I'm staggered by that. I am. I thought it was extraordinary. You consider the the, the span of ages one plays Test cricket in. Yeah. You know, roughly. But I guess you've got to be getting 20s, out for like 30s. 19 to 40, haven't you? Yeah. But that's yeah. okay, right? Like that's. The, what my, I guess my yeah. point is, yeah. it's a very common time to be dismissed. I would have thought so. I would have thought so. In the England opener, played with Jeff Boycott. Jeff Boycott liked him, didn't he? Yeah. Played with Boycott. Let me think about this for a second. Possibly Dennis Amos. Early Boycott. Early Boycott. Earlier boycott. He okay. made 26 on his 26th birthday. Early Boycott. So we're looking South Africa mid 1960s opening with Boycott there by chance. Not quite. A bit, a bit earlier. earlier. It might have been. Might have been. Okay. Why don't you just give us this one, Daniel? Who was Jeff it? Puller. Jeff Puller. Okay. On his 26th birthday, made 26. That's one. When Andrew story. got there, I, I sensed there was a certain relief. <laughs> <laughs> I might throw another one to you along those kind of lines around, around yeah. scores and, and, and other parts of players' lives. So I don't know how we got onto this. On SEN, on our radio coverage a couple of summers ago, we got deep in the weeds on... Um, players scoring their heights in centimetres. Oh, so like two metre beater getting a double hundred. Sure, let's yeah. do that. Or, or someone who's you know 180 centimetres tall, yeah. six foot in, in old money, making 180. And we battled with this for quite some time. I and actually would. Working with us on, on commentary, I won't say who yet, um, this expert who, who spent sort of quarter of an hour throwing up names, having them knocked back, quite enjoying the, the process. Yep. Quite a um, quite a forthright commentator, quite a, a punchy guy, but a fun-loving guy as well. I'd have gone anyway. with someone shorter like Sachin Tendulkar. Well, you're kind of on the right path here. Shorter, so generally Gavaska. So after going through this whole process, and I'm sure there'll be players we didn't get, and Samson might be able to help us out with a few more. It was the last ball of, his, of the commentary stint before he was going, and he goes, Oi! What about me? <laughs> Guys, I'm I'm 173 centimetres tall. Oh. And my highest score in Test cricket was 173 against India in Auckland in 1990. <laughs> then Ian Smith promptly put the headphones down and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> so Smithy had had it all along. He knew he was going to you know do the mic drop at the end with his own height. Brilliant. His own test high score. Wonderful timing as always. What about me? What about me, lads? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there going, you're kidding, are you? What was Warren Lees' highest score? 152, yeah, he's a bit taller than that, wasn't he? But imagine, I would have thought Sachin and Sunil might be in with a chance, because they would only been about 1 metre 60, so... Yeah. I, th I, I think we were very close on Kawaja from memory. Kawaja's got a 180-odd and he's about 100... But it was one centimetre off. This is fun, isn't it, this game? Yeah. <laughs> Don't cheat. Like, don't look it up. But surreybroadcast at gmail.com. That's a maiden complete from Big Craig Overton. 363 for six remains to score. If you're going to play along on surreybroadcast at gmail.com, do not cheat. Do this off the top of your head. Have a stab. Have a stab, Who, yeah. Whose highest score uh, was the, their height and centimetres? Does it have to be their highest score? We just set that as a criteria. Let's say any score. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you've let's, scored, let's open you it up. scored it. If you've scored it, yeah. Something you say, what if Ollie Pope's got in that sort of general direction? He'd yeah. be, what, about one metre 
78, wasn't it? No, I think a bit less than that. I think got, yeah, 174, 175, something like that. Derek Randall got 174. I wonder how he tall did. he was. That's a good shout. Of course, the second part of this is trying to work out what heights are in the, yeah. centimetres, which <laughs> isn't, you know, it, when it was arranged in feet and inches, it requires some conversion. Yes. Samson's back with the laptop. He'll tell I, us how tall Derek Randall was. I was going to ask, Andrew, how you actually <laughs> worked out the birthday thing, because it can't be in your database, is it? I must have done a, there must have been a lot of trial and error. <laughs> Which might have been why you looked at me so askance. Derek Randall was five foot eight and a half, so we'll have to put that in there. Okay, leave that with me. 68.5 times 2.54. <laughs> Feet, inches, centimetres, calculator on Google might do it a bit more quickly here. That's 176. Oh! 177 if you round He's up. He's three runs away. Yeah. Two and a half runs. Yeah. I think you're allowed either side to point something. I'm trying to... I don't think that's right, by the way. This calculator, five foot eight. No, well, do a different no, calculation. No, that, that can't be right. I'm, I'm going to do 68.5 times 2.54. Yeah. I'm going to try it again. Different calculator. 173. 173.99! Oh, you round no. up, that's it! One, five foot eight and a half. It's bang on! It's bang on! <laughs> Not much excites you as much as that. I mean, I tell you what, I might have to take a photograph of this for our social media. Here we go. <laughs> 173.99. Holy dooly. That's true, we are saying that. We're saying that, that Derek Randall was a centimetre taller than Ian Smith. <laughs> Do you know what the other Derek Randall one I found recently? Sorry, we're going down. You know what? We're allowed to. It's county cricket. We can drift. We can drift. We will drift. We're still watching the game. Yes. We're going to tell you that Aldridge is bowling nicely and that Clark's trying to move the game along in the lead 78. Jimmy Anderson made his List A debut in the year 2000. Right? Goodness me. So he's old. Four years ago. It's his 25th season. So that he played his, cricket. his list day debut was played in the what was then called the Nat West uh, Trophy. The Nat West Trophy. It was the elimination yeah. tournament. The, four, the, the one that came after the Gillette Cup. Single out to cover. That being, that'll keep, mean that Clark keeps a strike on 12. Leads 79 at 364 for 6. It was the... Uh, National Westminster Bank Trophy 2000, which included right. the minor counties. That's, That's right. an important part of the story. So Anderson, May 2nd of May 2000, played in a game where he opened the bowling and opening the batting for Suffolk in the minor counties was Derek Randall. And Derek Randall, at this stage, he was born in 1951. So Randall's 39. Would that make him 39? 49, 49. 40, sorry, my apologies. 49. So Randall was a 49-year-old, played against Jimmy on his list day debut. So, and Randall made his list day debut back in, gosh, let's find his first. About what, 1969? Probably, possibly John Player League, perhaps. Let's have a squeeze. As a youngster in Nottinghamshire. 1971. That means that you can get back to 1971 in one go. In one go in the state cricket. Acknowledging that Jimmy's not played a game for Lanks yeah, in, that's in 50 over cricket for a number of years. But still, yeah. he's an active Lancashire player. Yeah. It's Theoretically, he could play in the Correct. in the um, Metro Bank this year, right? That's a 53-year that age span, time span. I mean, this is... In this one is, link. This is... Uh, it's the stuff of beauty, Colin. Yeah, this is kind of that one where, where you can get from... Yeah. You know, we do this all the time, of course. I don't want to labour the point. But thanks to Wilfred Rhodes making his test debut in WG Grace's final test match in 1899 at Trent Bridge. And you can span that to when Bradman came here in 1930. Unfortunately, Rhodes didn't play a test in 1930, but he did play um, two games against Bradman on the 1930 tour, one for Yorkshire and I think one possibly for the MCC. But so for England, he would have played with, say, Hammond, who kept playing sure, through to 1946-47. Yeah, that, that link thing gets done a lot, but I just quite like that mm. in list A cricket, there's this quirk, this wrinkle. 
That is a beautiful question. And then he pulls Derek you... Randall. I, I, do not ask me how I found that out. It's the history show we make on the, True. On the podcast yes, that yes. leads us down these paths from time to time. But yeah, Randall is a 49 year old still opening the batting for Suffolk with this wow. kid, Anderson, Burnley. So put it another way, J- Jimmy Anderson has played professional cricket against a man who is currently 73. It's good, isn't it? That's quite something. <laughs> so we had one a couple of years ago where where Tavaray and Triscothic crossed over. They played very briefly because Triscothic made his first class debut in, was it 93 possibly? Samo tapping away. Edging, not carrying. Softer hands there from Steele. Not a bad over this from Overs. So there was the, there was the crossover between Tavaray, which takes you back right. yet further. Although maybe not as far back as, uh, as Randall, come to think of it. Well, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, the, the link between now, say, Shoa Bashir or Rayan Ahmed. Rayan Ahmed, who's only, what is he, 19 years old? Yeah. So he's only one degree of separation from a 73-year-old Derek Randall. So what we need is Anderson and Rayan Ahmed to play a game in the Metro Bank against each other this year. So if Leicester are drawn to play Lanks, can we speak to Jim about this? We probably can. I think we've probably got it within our gift to ask Jim. Can he, can, Jimmy, can you play a game in the, in the 50 over comp this year? Can it be when you're drawn against Leicester? As a warm-up for the test series. Of course. Just, you know, very early on, the beat, just, just to get the shoulder loose. <laughs> you know. By the way, we've got a number of emails in here from uh, uh, one from Nick, one from Tom. Asking about Athers and he's 185 against South Oh, that's Africa. not a bad shout at all, is it? Afraid to say I've Googled it. Ath's 183 oh. centimetres tall. So not quite. So I think I'm 1 metre 88, because I think I'm 6'2 and a half. So it's 183, basically 6 foot. Basically, yes. It's uh, a single from the over. So after trying to really bounce out of the block, they've been kept back for the last two overs. The lead's 83, 65 for it's 6. It's a good shout, though. It's a yeah. very good shout. Keep them coming. Because Surrey at the moment, just to be clear what's going on here, um, Steele and Clark getting their eye in, getting ready for an assault is what it feels like mm. to me. Getting the feet moving nicely. Ball's not doing a great deal at the moment. And it's a familiar morning session pattern that we've had in this match so far. Shout down the leg side given. So that front on action with Aldridge hitting the seam and Clark catching up with it. He's caught behind for 13. So Somerset, first blood on morning three, 365 for seven. Horrible way to get out, isn't it? We call it the strangle. I don't believe that Aldridge was probably <laughs> bowling for that. It would have been a little tickle, a faint tickle if it was any. Jordan Clark turned his back on the umpire instantly, didn't he? Which can sometimes indicate guilt or genuinely believed he didn't touch it. Take a look on the replay, but the Somerset players went up immediately. Umpire had no hesitation. That's well. That's Ollie Pope getting out yesterday. If you're wondering, to the same to, bowler, to Casey yeah, Aldridge, because yeah. that's Aldridge's third wicket. Yep. I and think that the point there about about the way that he lets the ball go with that really hot chest on action mm. means that he just generates a bit more movement towards the right hander than it might look on the way down. But that's it for Clark. So 13 from 34. Never really got going. It's a blow for Surrey, but for fans of sibling rivalry, it does mean that we're going to have Jamie O against Grego by the looks of things. Here we go. <laughs> After this over, of course. While we wait for the Overtons to come together, just round out on Ian Smith. That 173 was the highest test score by a number nine. New Zealand were 85 for six and 131 for seven against India at Auckland in 1990, I'm told. Then Smith clobbered 173 from 136 balls. I've seen the highlights of this. He absolutely tees off counter-attacking gem from... Does he? Ian David Stockley Who's Smith, as Coney calls him. So who would be in that, that India side? That would be the same one, of course, not 1990, when Gucci was 3 3 3. So, like, some Manoj Prabhakar, Prabhakar yeah. um, Kapil Dev was Early Srinath. Yeah. I think a bit too early for Srinath, wasn't it? Certainly Kapil Dev, Prabhakar. Yeah. Madan Lal, or too late for Madan Lal? Ben Kadapati Raju, he played in that series. <laughs> you got to. You'll do that the full Richie. I just like, I just like saying, saying I just like saying the name, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course lie. you do. <laughs> like Yudashika Prabhadani. Those names that we, we get to say. Ricardo Vasconcelos. 
and so on. Okay, first ball for Overton. Narendra Hawani was playing, so 16 on debut, did he? And, uh, six, yeah, took 16 wickets. And Wassan, I remember Wassan, he took four. Dazaruddin scored 192. That would have been attractive in 259 balls. How tall is he? <laughs> oh, <laughs> he's a tall fellow, Dazaruddin. Yeah. I'm not sure he's 192, but. Yeah, he's over six foot. This is the question that's going to bedevil me, and every time I see a score of one, <laughs> sort of 168 up to about 195. <laughs> Googling players' heights. You've done it for me now. You'll have, you've a, you'll have a, done another you'll rabbit have a feet and inches to centimetres calculator <laughs> bookmarked on your laptop. <laughs> double hundred. It, I wonder if anybody's got a test double hundred that's their height. Yeah. Um, by the way, this this won't be surprising in, in context, but that was Randall's last list day game too, by the way. He didn't play one between 1996 and 2000 when Suffolk qualified again. So yeah, it's not only did they play... They linked together. It was Anderson's first and, and Randall's last. Which what makes did he, it what did he get? Uh, Rags got four. He didn't get out to him, sadly. He was stumped by Edmonds from the bowling of air. Anderson, one for 34 from 10. His first Not shabby. Uh, list day wicket was Russell Catley. Russell Catley is a name I'm not overly familiar with. No, he, uh, he, he played for Suffolk, and, and that was that a minor counties player briefly. But he has that... <laughs> He has that um, distinction. I hope he tells that in the pub that, oh, well, he... It's the first of thousands. <laughs> yes. A he pioneer. Passed away a couple of years ago, Russell Catley. But, yes, had that, um, had that moment with Anderson. Now, there appears to be some kind of party going on. Can you hear that? Yeah, this is Sunday morning routine here, isn't it? Of with course this, it is. the church yeah. around the corner. Yes. is the call but it's not going to get there so uh, a successful over for Aldridge and for Somerset they're three away from bowling out the home side and then being able to get themselves back in the game that's the other side of this we're talking through the prism of how Surrey might dictate terms but it's not been that kind of game of cricket so far whatever we've expected it to go one way there's been there have been twists and if Somerset can finish the job here let's say conceding a lead of 100 or so and bat through the day well they'll be the ones you know a strong well, position when we rock up tomorrow, ignoring the rain that's forecast. Reflecting as I am on the pattern of the game so far, the partnership between Lamanby and Renshaw was probably the most fluent of the match, wasn't it? I think they put on 178 and looked good as gold until Lamanby reached 90 something. When things just yeah. you, things just twisted a bit when he was in the 90s, True, and then yeah. the, the run out on 99, and he was dismissed on an even hundred, as was Sibley yesterday. Here we go. Now. Siblings bounces straight away, <laughs> sharp. Was that the most predictable bouncer <laughs> that you're going to see this year? And and, uh, <laughs> and it was Jamie with both feet off the ground as the ball went over his lid. We'll need a second look at that. G'day, bro. <laughs> this is fantastic. There was a small yeah. part of me that wondered if he was going to fire in the Yorker. Because How close was it to clipping him on the shoulder? Not far at all. That's hostile, isn't it? Really well directed. So game on here. Overton to Overton. I might get Andrew to, to find out how they've fared against each other in the past. I think there's been a, a, a bounce of barrage from, from one to the other fairly frequently. Did, did, did Jamie hit Craig, I think? It's a beautiful ball, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we'll get off the mark with that little bobble at mid-off. So we have to pause our interest in, in the sibling rivalry. I think you're right. That does ring a bell about the concussion. I think he hit him twice, didn't he? I thought he hit him once. He yes. Went off for some treatment. The first ball back, he bounced him again. Yes, it was... Um, it's a commitment to the cause that I was very impressed by. June 2022 was when this all played out. So uh, he was hit a couple of times, but concussion signed. So there is there is some backstory here, I suppose, given it was Jamie with the ball last time. Um, you can... That was 
was in Taunton in 2022. So Somerset were all out for 180. And then when Surrey went in, now my apologies, it was earlier, wasn't it? It was, it was when Somerset, of course, were, were batting. Um, but yes, just uh, whoever wrote this news story has buried the lead. I'm, I'm seven, paragra seven <laughs> paragraphs in and there's no mention of it yet. Come on, guys, tell us the juicy bit up front. Been good stuff from Somerset this morning. They've not let Surrey get away. They've been tight. The, the bowling's been tight from Somerset throughout. I've been very impressed by that because you know you can get a bit dispirited when you see a side moving ahead and the pitch isn't giving you much and the ball's not giving you much. And they've kept nagging away Somerset. They keep on taking wickets whenever Surrey look like they're just getting out of the game. Andrew jumps in and says that there's one test 200 by a player that's two metres tall <laughs> as Overton finishes the over 367 for seven, the Leeds 82. Oh, this is agonising though. Probably. It's close though, isn't it? Jason Holder in that brilliant double 100, match winning double 100 against England in 2019 at Bridgetown. So he made 202 not out. And Jason Holder, 201 centimetres tall. <laughs> that would have been too nice. It'd have been in his spikes though, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> to, to <laughs> Probably stood two metres too. Yeah. In heels, he's 202, as they say. That's a great find from Andrew. Great having Andrew Sampson with us here. A privilege to have him at the commentary bench. But he gave gave us the stat of the season so far yesterday, which is an absolute beauty. The Derbyshire spinner Thompson took 10 wickets. Mm. 10 wickets in the match. It's the second earliest time in the season ever that a spinner has taken 10 wickets in the county championship right yes because we're so early in april aren't we beaten only by adil rashid on the 8th of april 2008 wow Short april weekend. 10th i might have been the 10th sorry i beg your pardon the 10th of april the 8th of april was my wife's birthday and i think we established yesterday that the, the seven fur that he took in the first innings was the first time a derbyshire spinner's taken a seven fur since jeff miller in 1982 so was noteworthy on a couple of levels. As Derbyshire claimed a first innings lead. Might, actually, I won't have time to go around the grounds. Maybe you can do that with. I'll uh, do that when you come off. And, you, and you this over, to, if yeah, you like. uh, yeah, we'll see how. We, yeah, you can do that. Um, I've got probably one more over after this before Yaz jumps in. Nice solid shot, isn't it? So let's go Division One first for me. Tell me a story or two. Division One. Well. Let's head to Chelmsford, as I think we must. Where a wicket has fallen, Kent 262 for three in reply to Essex's 530 for seven. That game feels like it's heading towards a draw, but who knows, a little rash of wickets there can mm. give Essex a chance to put the foot in the throat. Still batting is Ben Compton. 104 not out of 245. Bell Drummond was LBW to Jamie Porter for 135. So loved seeing him have a great start to the season. That the Ken mm. captain Daniel Bell Drummond always felt to me the kind of player who, if things broke differently for him at different points in his career, he'd be part of the national conversation. Well, I through make an extraordinary hundred against Australia down at Canterbury in 2015. I was going to say we did that game together, didn't we? Might have been the first game we did together. I remember you seeing him. It was, you saw it was the first time you'd seen him, I think. Yes, and it was. you were you, you you wax lyrical. I said, it's, it's, he's been around a while here in England, but you wouldn't see him in Australia because yeah, live streams were not so prevalent. So it was an 80 team. baller against like Johnson, Ryan Harris, Mitchell. St you know, it was a very strong Australian attack. Nathan Lyon, and he just pongoed them. Um, a bit like our chum Stephen Crook. Yeah, quite so same tour. Yeah. Strange. Uh, Hampshire against the Lancashire, the Utilita Bowl. So it feels like it might be heading drawwards. Oh, another bouncer. Short one to finish. There'll be a change in comms. Daniel, your round the grounds will continue. Then Yazrana will come in for me at 368 for seven. The lead this morning has moved from 73 to. 83, so 10 runs in 30 minutes. Not quite what we were expecting, but losing one wicket as well 
that of Jordan Clark, who was dismissed on 13. More to you, Dan. Thank you. So, um, Jamie Oath is just getting a couple of pills. Could be some, some painkillers for his back. Yasrana's going to join us. So, yes, back to um, around the grounds and the utilitar bowl. Keaton Jennings is still going, 94 not out. As Lancashire have posted 243 for four in reply to Hampshire's 367. It's going quite slowly there. Which um, makes that game feel like it's heading for a draw, but you never know. Things can happen quickly. To Trent Bridge, where Worcestershire are hanging on gamely. Nottinghamshire made 399. Worcestershire 244 for six. Smith unbeaten on 35. Donavera 34. So that deficit now just 154. More. Warwickshire Durham. This is a run fest. <laughs> 698 for three. Plays 210 for three. Durham 210 for three. Alex Lee's still there. As we established a ton on his birthday. He's got the other Ollie Robinson for company. 39 not out. Destined to be always known as the other Ollie Robinson. Seems a bit unfair, he has. Yeah, I asked him about that last year. I spoke to him. As Bashir comes on for his first bowl of the day. I asked him about that during the Ashes last year, uh, just when the other other Ollie Robinson was was making quite a few headlines for what he was doing on the pitch, but also what he was saying off it. Um, and he said he sort of enjoyed it. A bit short from Bashir. Because that's basically he would get potentially entangled, a bit like poor old Stephen Smith does, the, yes. uh, the other Stephen Smith, <laughs> who had quite a wretched time of it after Sandpaper Gate. And John Lewis. There's a, there's a fellow who got the Twitter handle John Lewis early on, didn't he? And then has to gird his loins for when the John Lewis advert comes out. Yeah, and that, that, well, that's John with an, with an H. If you take away the H, you've obviously got, you've two, got the other John Lewis. two John Lewis's <laughs> as well. Yep. Now, I quite like this move here, Yaz, to bring Bashir on. Because Greg Overton was bowling his, his bombs at his brother. It's all well and good, but I think the tempter here. Jamie's not going to be able to resist having a go at Bashir, is he? And Bashir's had it on a string this match. Yes, with slow progress this morning. That single into the leg side from JB Overton, just the 11th run of the day so far, 33 minutes in. Ninth over. Yeah, game, game isn't really moving in any direction. I think Aldridge and Overton started the day really well. Kept the pressure on the Surrey batters, but also a couple of occasions where there were genuine edges that weren't close mm. to carrying. So I like this move. Bashir very impressive yesterday. And obviously a lot of debate, not just this round, but last week as well, as Bashir completes his first over of the day. Sorry, 3, 6, 9 for 7. A lot of debate about the merits of the Kookaburra ball, but I think as you look into this round in particular, spinners are doing a lot of work compared to what you normally expect this time of year. There's so said 10 wickets for Thompson. Yeah, exactly. And, and Surrey's Mason's leading wicket taker this season, Cameron Steele. Yeah, with, precisely. Um, Dan Lawrence not far behind. And also in that game between Glamorgan and Derbyshire, at Cardiff, Mason Crane, four wickets in the first mm. innings as well. Fascinated to see how he goes this summer. He's barely played for Hampshire in the county championship over the last couple of years. Very hard side to get into. Aldridge continues. Very close. Well, it's a hard side to get into when, you, when they've got Liam Dawson as yeah. well. So it's very rare that teams pick two spinners. I think we'll see Lancashire do it at home a fair bit. And... You know, there's a template there. It's a template for, for Somerset as well. When Jack Leach becomes available to have tracks that assist spinners without being, you know, minefields. And you could have Bashir and Leach in tandem. It'd be a very effective pairing. Short pulled into the leg side, but there's a man on the fence who'll collect the ball. Just one for Overton, four off 19. Quite who would be replaced though in what has been a really good 
Somerset bowling effort here. Pretorius got the ball to move a bit yesterday, beating the outside edge of the right-handers. Bats, I think. Aldridge has been very impressive. And uh, Lewis Gregory, of course, skipper. So Craig Overton's a must. Speaking of Craig Overton, I think Craig Overton's just swapped the bales. Has he now? And very nearly brings a wicket with it. Well, the oval is the site of the bale swap, isn't it? <laughs> He's done it at the wrong end, I think. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. But yeah, I mean, on, on decisions to be made around spinners, I mean, sorry you've got a decision to, to, to make mm -hmm. as well. Cam still, as you say, is a leading wicket taker so far this season he's, he's been excellent he's effectively playing ahead of Tom Laws this round if you compare the Surrey side to the Surrey sides picked in the second half of last season you think that's a partly a Kookaburra decision I mean when you think about what the Kookaburra's designed that what this, this experiment is all about it's designed to try to ready England for Australia with hard pace which we saw with Atkinson over to Jordan Clark bowling really quickly and a bit of, you know, spin with a bit of action on it. And Cam still delivered it. Surrey basically delivered what the directive was after. No, 100%. I mean, people listening to this will be wondering why does a different ball bring spinners into it? It's because the Kookaburra ball swings less and for shorter periods of time, which means that sometimes the Duke's ball just keeps on swinging so you just keep on mm. why change the seamers when it when it's creating problems for the batters so with uh, with a kookaburra with less swing less off the pitch as well for the seamer it brings the spin in as a different threat earlier in the game and we've seen in both innings so far in, in this game Dan Lawrence was brought on to bowl very early in the Somerset first inning show Bashir I think was brought on within the first 10, 10 overs of the sorry innings here as well so we've seen spinners play a slightly more prominent role than I think we usually do at this time of year and another factor I think as well is that it really gives a chance for, for batters um, to, 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 to put together really substantial innings early in the season I remember Stephen Fleming um, a few years ago was talking about how when he was coming through at New Zealand there wasn't that much batting talent so he was almost overly promoted at every point in his career so when he got into the New Zealand side and he famously didn't have a great conversion rate in his test career mm. he hadn't really learnt to score big hundreds and I think as we, if you look around the, the, the grounds this this week there are a lot of big scores from top order players and I think that's a good thing for players long term to have under their belt. Um, I might ask Andrew if he's willing to update the averages for April scores in the first 10 seasons because I think as a result of this round of matches April may just have gone ahead of June as the most run heavy month of the lot. With that breaking possible news <laughs> I'm going to love you and leave you because Cameron Ponsby's here and I need to go and read a book because we're going to be talking to Ben Bloom and Madam President Trish Garrard is going to join us at the lunch break. Looking forward to that. It's been a steady start from Bashir into a second over of the day. bit more flight and a bit of width and it's punished by Cam Steele who drives powerfully through cover for four. Sorry, move on to 375 for seven. It's an excellent shot from Steele who's had an excellent start to the season as uh, Cam Ponsomey joins me in the commentary box. Morning Cam, how are you? Very well, yes. Love to see you again. I think Cam Steele's continuing his reputation as one of the great the greatest player of April cricket <laughs> of all time he's always managed to start the season exceptionally well especially against Lancashire had a career best bowling figures 5 for 25 last week he started the season with an unbeaten century against them last season so April and Lancashire kind opponents 
for Cam Steele. Straight to from Bashir, defended into the offside by Steele. Another player who falls into that category is Sam Robson. Sam Robson went years without scoring a first class 100 after the FA Cup final. <laughs> It's wonderful when you can find such kind of arbitrary <laughs> markers of time. <laughs> Different sport. <laughs> kind of middle, back end of May. I think it's interesting what you're saying about kind of the ongoing conversation about Dukes versus Kookaburra in terms of the criticism of the Kookaburra is perhaps that is going to induce in kind of dull cricket and look at all these runs that are scoring and kind of do, do the runs count if it wasn't with the Dukes ball, etc. But you're, it's always it's this constant pursuit of like the Goldilocks perfection kind of mm. points of cricket where normally the debate is goodness me no one's scoring any runs and now it's kind of potentially gone the other way with these two rounds of cricket and I think when it all comes out in the wash it will be okay that's my that's my hunch Aldridge continues from the Mickey Stewart members pavilion end yeah I I I'm broadly fine with it. Um, I think we were in a position a couple of years ago when all the whole Strauss performance review stuff was happening. England had uh, a couple of disastrous winters in a row. There was a period of three or four years where it felt like there weren't that many players scoring that many runs. Sean short and flicked into the leg side for a single. Houghton moves on to five. I remember speaking to Alex Lees just before he made his test debut and he's quite a good example of someone who manufactured quite a funky technique to deal with the specific challenges that facing uh, a ball that does a lot early season does. Uh, famously against bowlers who bowled around the wicket to him, he was batting way outside off stump and you could basically see the entirety of leg stump. Driven nicely down the ground, beats the man at short mid wicket. Still will pick up at least a couple here. And Lees had sort of changed his technique to something that wasn't really necessary for the challenges that he ended up facing in Test cricket. And now he's simplified his game a bit more, and he's, he's probably in the form of his life now at the moment. He's had an excellent couple of years since he last played for England. He's away with England Lions again over the winter. Century today passing 10,000 first class runs. Brilliant piece of fielding back to the point. Oh! Direct hit, and I think Cam Steele would have been in a bit of trouble. That was a wonderful piece of fielding. I, I must admit, I'd looked off towards the boundary, assuming that it pierced those two fielders at kind of backward point. So Tom Lowen be the one thought you'd done the work. Have a look at the replay here. Cut well from Steele. It's one of those where you almost say yes because of the shot. A brilliant piece of work from, from Lambe at back point. Got him! Steele cuts again. And this time he picks up the wicket. It's Lambe at backward point. Great piece of fielding the previous delivery and this time still more uppish cuts it straight to Lambie and Somerset pick up their second wicket of the day and Casey Aldridge has been impressive all throughout this Surrey innings picks up his fourth wicket 456 Surrey lead by 93 and Cam 45 minutes into the third day it's been a very very good start to the day for Somerset it's an absolute coach's dream from Lamanby there as we see the replay of the catch. The ball before keeps Steele on strike. And to be fair, you could argue if he'd let it go for four, he'd still have been on strike. <laughs> but nevertheless, he saved the runs. And one ball later, Steele isn't able to get on top of his cut shots. He flies towards Lamanby at a point. A wonderful piece of kind of one two fielding from Lamanby. We'll see the replay one more time. Surrey lose their eighth wicket. Celebrations. Satisfaction for Casey Aldridge, disappointment for Cameron Steele. Gus Atkinson comes out to the crease at number 10, scores 378 for 8. 
the lead stands at 93 and there's been a number of times in the last season where well sorry further proving the strength of their tail in that you break, get them five down you get them six down and rather than the kind of final four or five wickets being rattled through they're able to add another kind of 100 to 150 runs Atkinson first class average of 28 three or four first class half centuries so yeah I, don't, I doubt the fun is over quite yet just for sorry hmm. they have really struggled to just force the game along this morning Aldridge has bowled really tidily Overton started well as you say the run rates now is now down towards three points just a flat three basically and when it, the beginning started that was up above four and over and it's slowly some of us have dragged that run rate down they've done a fantastic job in the field I think despite looking very likely to give up a lead of a, over a hundred runs it's no ball from Aldridge and Atkinson also gets off the mark with a flick down towards fine leg I've been really impressed by Aldridge all game um, he's someone who maybe if you looked at his numbers at the end of last season there's not there wasn't anything there that necessarily leapt off the page but those at DCB HQ clearly had, see, had seen something he was obviously picked for that Lions Tour to India dug in and Ozen does well to get out of the way of it at the end of another good over for Somerset sorry now 381 for 8 and just reinforcing your point cam there were points yesterday where it felt like Surrey could really run away with it. You know, 167 for the first wicket, 192 for one, 214 for two, 272 for three. And it's been an odd couple of days, really, in, in that wicket-taking hasn't looked particularly easy. But at the same time, with the exception of that renshaw Lambie partnership on the first day, run scoring hasn't been particularly easy either, you'd say batters have had to really struggle four runs and actually we've had those two massive partnerships but yeah. aside from that really it hasn't been anything particularly substantial I think you're correct I wonder if there was a slight adjustment in length after that first morning where Surrey over pitched quite a lot and Lamanby and Renshaw or Lamanby in particular striking very quickly then maybe the lengths for the match as a whole without that movement have just slightly come backwards. You know, you, you mentioned Surrey going at pretty much exactly three runs and over. If you look at that Surrey middle order, Pope, Smith, Lawrence, Folks. We know how Jordan Clark and, and Jamie Overton score their runs as well. To, to keep those guys quiet and, and really frustrate them and restrict the run scoring options is some feat for Somerset. And a big part of that is Shoa Bashir. 33 and a half overs, one for 68. Just one wicket so far, but uh, maintaining an economy rate of pretty much exactly two runs per over been bowled so much extremely impressive he's operating at the moment pretty much with a with a ring field there's a man deep in the leg side they're catching short mid wicket quite a square fine leg As an off spinner yourself, thank Cam. you very much. Um, talk us through. I've, I've, looking at Bashir's field, I find it quite interesting that there isn't really a fine leg. And is that is that because of the, the bounce he gets? He's quite a hard bowler to, to to paddle sweep. Or is that? I think you're probably leaving that as an option open to the batter. So that's probably the risk. If you're wanting them to take a risk, that's the one he'd they'd be happy for him to take. And you said it's a very simple field. It's just one fielder out on the boundary on the leg side aside from that a complete ring 
kind of speaks to the simplicity of the plan in effect is that Bashir is there to hold down an end in this particular instance and ask the batter to take the risk and go over the top. Swiped into the leg side just for one. Aldridge from the pavilion end operating with a deep backward square leg, a deep fine leg and a deep third. Remember that boundary towards the gasometer side of the ground, quite a bit shorter. I think both of Casey Aldridge's performance and Gus Atkinson's in the first innings, and both of them having well, Aldridge with the England Lions, and Gus Atkinson with the full England team, it's kind of further reinforcements of how England value kind of how as much as how many, and the way people go about their cricket. Short again from Aldridge, Atkinson attempts a pull shot but doesn't get hold of it. The field change for that ball to Atkinson. Craig Overton has been moved to a sort of leg gully position. And just one man in front of square on the leg side now. A fielder. And a sort of wideish, shortish mid on. Slightly full of ball, almost catching at Atkinson off guard there. And I find Ax uh, Aldridge quite an, quite an interesting bowler because he sort of he's quite a muscular. He's got quite a muscular action, and we've got the speeds up here. He's he's not express pace, but he sort of bowls like a bowler who's faster than he is, and he's doing that well. And you know, it's not just about speed; it's how accurately you can target certain bits of the the pitch. You can. How much can you bowl to a plan, I guess? And he's been very tight with his lines and lengths um, throughout this sorry innings. Well, one of my great failings, Jazz Runner, is, is how interested I am in speed guns. And I, I find this very interesting, though, because I think you've got a very good point behind this. Well, I'll try and remember what that point might have been. But in, t in terms of, I find that when I used to have access to a particular database, you could see how people's average speeds kind of varied from competition to competition. And unlike somewhere like Major League Baseball, where it is kind of standardised across the league because it is one entity, different speed guns are going to work in slightly different ways. And so you could see, uh, if you looked at kind of England bowlers last summer, their average speeds in the, the 100 versus then kind of like the Island ODI series versus then like the Caribbean would be different. There's obviously an element of fatigue in there. But when we see here, we, we're, we're looking here going, oh, he seems to be bowling. Well, it's quite quick. You go look 78. You think, well, is that is that the true mean? What 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 are the conspiracy theories, Yaz? Driven through the offside, punch rather from Atkinson. He picks up his first boundary. Hint of width from the impressive Aldridge, who's bowled unchanged in the pavilion end so far this morning. Gives away four. Sorry, move on to 386 for eight. It's a really delightful shot from Atkinson. Punch through the offside. It's one of the kind of blessings and curses of playing for Surrey is that Atkinson said very publicly, I know he's a, it's not exactly the most dramatic thing to say is I would like to bat higher. I think every cricketer in the world says that. But one of the great things of playing for Surrey is you get to play in kind of a team that wins, competes for trophies every single year. One of the bad things about playing for Surrey is that if you would be looking to bat, I don't know, seven or eight for another county, you're down at ten and battling to try and get a sniff at nine. The only problem is you've got Jamie Overton at the other end. He's averaging 30 in the last two or three years of county cricket. And he but can't get above nine at the moment. <laughs> so. yeah, that, with that boundary, Surrey's lead pass is 100. As Bashir continues. I suppose on your speed gun point, which is completely yep. fair, and the, the the good point that you've previously made, that you didn't make there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm looking forward to remembering what this was. Is that what is also important is is what it actually feels like for the batter. Yes. And some bowlers can feel quicker than what the speed gun says. Appeal for LBW, but Overton well outside the line of off stump. Of course, because it all comes down to kind of like pre-delivery cues. It's what, what you're reading before a bowler releases the ball. You see the replay here of Bashir's LBW appeal. Overton down on the sweep, and I, I feel quite safe in saying that's not out. Slightly flatter. Cut into the offside, but there's a misfield at backward point. 
it's all back in. So Everton picks up two. Yeah, Boomer is the most obvious example yes. of someone who we know that he he basically because of his hyper extension bowls from closer, closer. than other pe- other bowlers. So it's even natu- whatever it says in the speed gun, it is going to feel slightly faster because he's literally bowling from closer to the batter. But my point in Aldridge was more that I think comparing him on the speed gun to other bowlers in this match, yes, he's probably four or five MPH slower than what Atkinson's produced what Jamie Overton produced down the ground and six bit of aggression from Jamie Overton advances down the ground doesn't quite get to the pitch of the ball but that doesn't matter Jamie Overton who is fast becoming one of the best six hitters on the on the T20 franchise circuit Posits that one into the stands. Picks up six. Shorter from Bashir. And slightly slower as well. Overs and rocks back. And doesn't beat the man at shortish cover. Very different field for Jamie Overton now. Three men on the fence and a, and a deep mid-off fielder as well. Just four men in the ring. Past the man at slip. Shear finishes another over. 394 for 8. Sorry, off 126. But as you're saying, kind of the pre-delivery cues and how bowlers feel different. The kind of most famous historical example is Brett Lee versus Sherbach. So mm. kind of generally considered the two fastest bowlers of all time or of their era. And Brett Lee had that beautiful action where you could see the ball all the way around. I remember speaking to a former uh, international player and he actually said that he found Brett Lee one of the nicest bowlers to face because you could see it that whole way but my kind of favourite example is actually again from baseball and the, a key difference between baseball and cricket is that baseball you have to have your back foot on at a certain point but you can move forward you can throw from as far forward as you physically can and so there's a, one pitcher whose fastball was around 90 miles an hour and that's equivalent of about 80 in cricket but no one could hit it and it felt so quick and the reason they said that is because he was a hider and a strider. And they, you could only see the ball for kind of 0.2 seconds before mm. the ball was thrown compared to kind of 0.4, 0.5 of everyone else. And he also had the longest stride, so he was throwing from as close to you as anyone else. Bowling change from the Mickey Stewart members' pavilion end. Pretorius on for his first bowl of the day, replacing the impressive Casey Aldridge. Fuller from Pretorius, that's flicked into the leg side by Gus Atkinson. Name of that pitcher, as Andrew Sampson promised me to go and look it up, is Yusumero Petit, who baseball writer Ben Lindbergh described as the poster boy for the power of deception. I just felt so much quicker than he actually was. One day, I'll find something new to talk about. But until that day, I'll happily settle in speed guns. Fields, well back for Jamie Overton, plenty of scoring opportunities. As Cam alluded to earlier, Gus Atkinson is no ordinary number 10 and Overton at the moment is very happy giving the strike to Atkinson. I also wonder if there's an element of ego at play. If I was Gus Atkinson in this situation, I saw everyone coming in for me, I'd be going, you know, I'll show you. I'm going to stick it over the ropes. Short again and pulled well by Atkinson. Pierces the gap on the leg side boundary. He picks up four. A Surrey reach 400. Just moving things along slightly quicker in the last 10 15 minutes. Jamie Overton and Gus Atkinson. And I think to your point, Cam, as well, Jamie Overton must relish the, the easy run scoring opportunities. <laughs> that field gives him. Yeah. 
Fuller from Pretorius defended to mid on. That was uh, one of Atkinson's half centuries last season. Here at the Oval, he was in partnership with Dan Worrell. He started sweeping the seamers and he was sweeping them for six. I remember interviewing him afterwards and kind of asking when, he'd, when had he started playing that shot and he said he'd never played it before. He just thought it was worth a go. Dan Worrell he knew he was going to try and get out the other end. Kind of learnt a new skill out in the middle. Oof. Short again from Pretorius. Atkinson pulls, doesn't get hold of it. Just evade the man at mid wicket. He picks up a single. Sorry, move on to 401 for 8. And at the one hour point this morning, we've got a substitution in the commentary box. I'll be making way for Adam Collins. Atkinson and Overton added 22 together for the ninth wicket. Atkinson on 10, 11 off 17 deliveries. Overton on 15 off 30. Overton's show of aggression against Bashir's meant Somerset giving you a bit more respect. I don't know if respect's quite the right word there. They're spreading the field nonetheless. Whilst Atkinson will be at the other end playing his own shots. He's on strike against Bashir here. Leeds moved from 73 to 116 in the first hour of play. And as you two were talking about before, the, these two tend to bat a certain way, which suits the circumstances of the game as it sits right now, trying to move it along as quickly as they can. So Atkinson will be hitting with the spin, so protection, although they haven't put long on all the way back, nor deep mid-wicket. That's the longer boundary, but trying to tempt Atkinson to go big. That game we did together last year where Atkinson teed off and made a brisk 50. Absolutely. Just about hit one into the Tennyson school, didn't he? One of those sweep shots. They were, I, it was a, the bowl was Michael Hogan. Yeah, that's, that's right. who was bowling. I enjoyed just a, a player learning a new school, innovating in the face of what they deemed was necessity mm. because they didn't trust their mate down the other end to, uh, to not do something silly. Big gap at deep point as well. No sweeper on that side of the ground. As we talked about earlier with, with the prospect of rain tomorrow, if Surrey can move quickly here and put some scoreboard pressure on through the middle of the day, that might be their best route to victory. And the other part with Atkinson and his batting, which can sometimes get a little bit lost when a player moves to the national team, is the, the, the quality of training he'd be getting now as a, a nationally contracted player. He's up against the, the first choice bowlers in the nets and that kind of thing. Spent a lot of time overseas during the winter, mainly in India. Good from Bashir, saving one there at least. I'm pretty sure he was the, um, with Brook missing the India Test Series for personal reasons. Atkinson was the only England player to do all of the World Cup, the West Indies White Ball Tour and the India Test Tour. Mm. And then Johnny Bairstow, I think, is the only person who's gone triple India, done World Cup, Test Tour and IPL. Mm. Atkinson was away from home for a very long time over the winter months. His first game since, I think it must have been T20 in Barbados, kind of in this, back in December. Four and a half months without an... Uh, Game in anger. Score another maiden over from Sherbyshire there. That, where that's taxing it, when you talk to players who, who've been a lot in India is that they're put up in extraordinary hotels right there. Sure. It's, it's a lovely place to tour on that basis, but they don't actually do anything other than being in the hotels. So that's, the, that's the practice when you're playing in India these days is that the degree of celebrity around the players and and wider considerations. So it's ground to hotel, ground to hotel, and, th and that rhythm can can take its toll in different ways. I think that's why um, one of the many reasons players and punters and media all love going to Durham Shala so much. Yeah. Durham Shala, the England players did get out a little bit. They were kind of stomping the hills of the Himalayas, going on runs together, finding kind of picturesque mountain creeks to have a dip in. Jimmy Anderson was putting topless photos on Instagram. It was all, <laughs> everyone was getting a lot out of it. 
Yeah, that's good for business from Jimmy. So deep third drops back. Oh, is that an inside edge? Bit of interest from the cordon, and the finger stays down from umpire Saggers. As Andrew Sampson's reminded us, the uh, England team went to meet the Dalai Lama as oh well. Yeah, yeah. Final test. That's become a bit of a thing when a test match is played in Durham Shala. Watch this back. Yes, it was a flap of the pad, perhaps the noise that was of interest behind the wicket with James Rue. I went there in 2017 during the Border Gavaskar series and the Australian team all went up to the Dalai Lama's joint for a, for a cup of tea and a sandwich or something like that. <laughs> But David Warner was a big part of that. That, that was when Warner was um, in his, uh, and I suppose he still is to an extent, but when he was really emphasising that he uh, was practising mindfulness and meditating every day and, and that kind of thing. And that trip to visit the Dalai Lama was perfectly in keeping with how Warner was presenting publicly through 2017. Remember they were calling him the Reverend. He made 100 of at course. the MCG in a yes. one-day game and he, he got the bat, instead of waving the bat, he got the bat out and pretended to use it as a microphone to preach. That was his 100, 100 celebration, very David Warner. Atkinson's turn again. I don't know if that's the best celebration, because you have to explain that afterwards. <laughs> oh, look, he didn't mind explaining it. Um, he, he says what he thinks and means what he says, I've, I've, Warner. I've, I've still never fully believed or been sure if, if, if it's true the whole David Warner's kind of trademark celebration was just the direct result of the Toyota sponsorship. Is that, is that, is that true? <laughs> Look, it, it could be. It's, <laughs> you could never really know um, with him. There was definitely a correlation, though. Oh, what a feeling and all that kind of thing. I, 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 I don't think I'm making this up. I, when him and Smith were serving their bands after the kind of sandpaper scandal and we went back to grade cricket, I'm pretty sure Warner scored a century for Rand, Randwick Peterson, the Rand, Randy Peets, and kind of whipped it out. And it was like, <laughs> it's probably not quite... <laughs> I'm surprised you have the same feeling of exuberance. So we're going to send you down at Coogee Oval. I'm, I know my Sydney grade cricket now. Adam. Good from you. That's very, very, very good from you. Don't worry. I'm, I'm probably know more about it than I do. A lot of dots here. So we've had one run scored in the 11 balls since I jumped on, which wasn't what I was anticipating. There's a good story about when Matthew Hayden was playing for Australia, and you might remember he used to cross himself um, as a... Yes. As a as a Christian when he would reach three figures and um, he was playing a shield game and he, he didn't um, cross himself and, and the sledge went what God doesn't watch the Sheffield Shield <laughs> so just one run from the over from Pretorius he had to take a wicket sort for the short sleeves today Pretorius threw me early on just going to grab some highlights from the first hour between overs here. So a lovely shot from Cluck to get going down the ground. That was in the first over of play, third ball. It gave the impression of what might be to come. However, as we see here, Aldridge just on that angle he gets with the front on action, glanced into the gloves of Root. First of a couple of wickets to fall. We're seeing here with Cam Steele. He was trying to keep the game moving along, but sharp chance taken by Lamanby at point. At that point, it was 378 for eight. And this pair have put on a subsequent 24. A couple of boundaries in that. Overton 16 from 32 so far. And that was the shot of the morning. High and handsome into the seats. Beneath us in the JM Finn stand. So I said, just. Gone for a change of bowling here, obviously on for Bashir. I completely understand why they've made that change. And from a personal level, I'm slightly disappointed for Bashir that he's not able to pick up a couple of cheapies, having been, well, the final two wickets having bowled mm. so well throughout the innings. So back to Overton versus Overton. Full to start, won't take long before he goes short. We were talking before that, the searing bouncer. It was only 73 mile an hour, so not quite the pace we saw with that first delivery that, that Craig bowled to Jamie, a bouncer that he managed to get get out the way of with both feet off the ground and the history the the twins share with Jamie concussing Craig a couple of seasons ago with a bouncer. Must have I'd forgotten that. So what have we got here? Three back on the leg side. 
and two back on the offside, so sort of a T20 field. Here's the short one, playing a miss. So fine leg, deep square, deep mid wicket on the onside, deep point, and deep backward point to the short boundary on the offside. No catching men behind the wicket. Although in, in modern cricket, they, they, they feel like catching men when they're set sure. back. We see a version of this field set so often now in test cricket when things are, are drifting a little bit for a fielding team. They'll, they'll pull that lever and have five men back. Awkward. Not far away from running into the leg stump as well. It feels like every test I do now, there's at least a couple of passages of play where the fielding captain... It's not quite Jardine, clap, clap, but, you know, it's a version of that. The modern version of that where you'll often see a fly slip, uh, three back on the leg side, but one just in front of square, so not to have three behind the square leg umpire. Making room and slapping and just getting it through. I say just getting it through, about five metres straight of mid-off, who was up inside that fielding circle, so to speak, over to, into the 20s. Lead moves on to 121, I think, as the bug leaves the bottom of the screen. I'll have that confirmed in a sec. It's a kind of sporadic displays of aggression from Surrey here. I think mm. Craig had a few words for Jamie after that ball just beat mid off. Making room, no contact. So it's not a fly slip, it's a deep backward point. So you can see why he's trying to lift it up over the invisible slip cordon. Yeah, the, the, the bowling short, very short at tail enders, you, you're, you're more into the, the analytical stuff than I am. It, it, it's reasonable to conclude that, that they do it because it doesn't look good when it doesn't work, but on balance, bowling at tail enders' helmets is more effective than bowling at their stumps. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I've, all, I've often found this interesting as whether the players know as well. Another swing and a miss. I think they're told that end of the over, just the boundary from it. 406 for 8, lead 121. The, the analysts and those who crunch the numbers, they go, yeah, you're going to have a day where Boomer will take 35 off an over, yeah. as he did with Stuart Broad. That will happen from time to time. But wider... Um, mapping of it, longer lens or wider lens if you like, is that you will see more wickets fall that way than if you bowl at the stumps of tail enders. Now, you know, I know that's contested space, but that's just what the numbers say, which is why we're seeing more of it at the top level when you've got those extra fast bowlers. We were also discussing this yesterday at the conclusion of Somerset's innings, what the kind of modern day strategy is of set batter in, everyone out on the boundary, Kind of, then you bowl two at number eleven. Yeah, the final two balls the over. And I remember asking, I remember asking some statisticians and analysts, saying, "Is there a way you can work out with the kind of the average number of runs for like wickets eight, nine, ten, kind of with this strategy versus others?" And I was kind of, I was told to get a life, to be honest. So it was, um, <laughs> didn't quite go as, as planned. I like it when one team's playing that game and the other team isn't. So you'll have a, a fielding team that's trying to do the umbrella thing and the batting side just don't mind. They're just trying to hit every ball for six at that point. And it kind of renders it irrelevant. Pretorius approaching his own three figures here. He'll be desperate to get off the mark. There's some, for, for, for what's been a very solid bowling effort, there's been some quite unkind bowling figures. I think he's bowled pretty well. He stuck with it, but just bowled without luck. Beat the edge a lot yesterday. Did so again with the second new ball during the final session, but just hasn't broken his way. The man on Somerset debut this week. Now into the 131st over. There'll be some tired boys out there. They bowled twice last week as well, Somerset, with Kent doing really well on the final day, making 300-odd for three. Although, in, in saying that, they, they did make considerable changes to their bowling lineup with Ball and Davy and Leonard all omitted this week. Just with the field to Overton again, we have a fly slip, a very deep first slip, second slip. I, I, <laughs> I can't say I've actually often seen a fly slip that fine before. We also have Shrebbishy out on the deep third boundary. Three fielders out on the leg side boundary. Four fielders out on the leg side boundary. I beg your pardon. Long on is out as well. I think they're kind of 
testing and teasing and asking Jamie Overton to go for it. It's definitely a catching position. And to him here, albeit along the ground. A smile from Lewis Gregory is there as I mean Sod's Law the ball kind of goes through where a traditional slip would be. It doesn't mean that the slip should have been there, of course. It's just an event. An isolated event, Adam. Mm. So mid off and mid on up. Will they give him something in the arc and tempt him? That slip comes back to regulation yeah. for Atkinson as well. No, but short takes it on and it won't quite carry to Matthew Renshaw, who was busy out there yesterday. Got a lot of touches in front of the crowd. Renshaw, you asked me to find out what they were sledging him about. At one oh, stage, yes, of course. At one stage, there was a bit of back and forth about what football team he follows. Nice. To which he said, I follow Newcastle United. And there was some, uh, and he goes, oh, I only really follow them since the Saudis got involved. So just straight into it. He didn't miss a beat, <laughs> Renshaw. Of course, that's not true. He's been a, a lifelong fan of Newcastle. And his cousin, uh, Paul Woolston, uh, was uh, on the books at Newcastle as one of their goalkeepers. Oh, brilliant. Until a couple of years ago. Very sadly, Paul had to retire early from football with a, with a hip injury that, that ended things for him in his early 20s. Short again, gets more of this. But Renshaw safe on the rope. They only get the single. But yes, the... Uh, the time there where there was a, an international cricketer knocking around for Australia and a, a goalkeeper who went, he's a Sunderland boy, Paul, very much a Sunderland boy. I've been to the football with him before, but played for Newcastle and uh, eventually ended up with Manchester United and before making his retirement, but a you know, very, very uh, talented family from the North East. No, I did, I'm, I'm familiar with Paul Wilson. I was not familiar with the fact him and Matt Renshaw were of yeah. the, same, the same family. He's a lovely kid. Great family. Over to, to continue from the Vauxhall end. Still five back. Which means there are easy singles to be had. So over to just the one wicket when he rearranged Jamie Smith's off stump. Just after the second new ball was taken, the third over of that, just after tea yesterday, Smith looked a million bucks on his way to 51. It was an innings of two halves from Smith yesterday. It was 30 off 30. Mm. Somerset did well to slow him down. I think Somerset just having a fiddle with the field here. I don't know if they really... I was going to say, could they be a bit more proactive, but I feel like Surrey's kind of odd displays of aggression could be in luck. Help down for one. Odd being occasional as opposed to bizarre there. Mm -hmm. So in a bit of a holding pattern here. Somerset, they've stuck to their task well. They've never really dropped their bundle. They had that passage of play yesterday after lunch where they picked up wickets on 167, 192 and 214 and opened the day up for themselves. It's placed that beautifully, Overton. Not a lot of room to work with with two men set back to the short boundary, but bisected them, moves to 27. Overton's been looking for that shot over the last couple of overs. He gets this one away. So he just backs away and cuts what's really not, it really isn't much width from that delivery. It's just potentially back of a length. He gets it back behind Renshaw at the, on the point boundary. Third boundary. Flex man at deep third. Went a bit finer between deliveries. I'm not 100% sure what Overton's plan is to Overton here. There's some sets plan to Overton. It doesn't look like it's not as if they're kind of bowling straight at him and then trying to get him to hit the ball out to these fielders in the deep on the leg side. But with those two fielders back on the offside, it is kind of allowing Overton to have that protection and bowl kind of both sides of the wicket. 
feels like the plan is just hoping they hit one up in the air, which again is where we yeah, get, get to with the with the five men back. That's the plan. When does when does the top edge come and can you grasp the opportunity when it arrives? Hoping they hit one up in the air is a, is a tactic as old as time. It's where he's done very well <laughs> for centuries. Speaking of, when's your club season start, Cam? Oh, good question. Uh, it's, it feels like it starts a week later this year, mid mid May. May the eleventh is the first league game. Okay. Got a couple of friendlies in the Saturdays before that. Fully doesn't make the most of it. Eight runs coming. I think you're jumping out. I am indeed. We'll I'm making later. way for Katya. Excellent. So four eighteen for eight partnership. It's moved to forty. They've not been galloping, as I thought they might, but. Smattering of boundaries. Two for Atkinson, two fours for Overton, plus the six. The lead was 73 when we got here this morning. It's up to 133 now with 40 minutes left until lunch on this third day. Catch you, Whitney, from wisdom.com. But are you jumping in for the first time today as well? Good morning to you. Still the morning? No, good afternoon to you. Just about the afternoon. You've just popped your glasses. I'm on. having a massive issue uh, this morning with my glasses. I, 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 as I've seen, I've just had, I did a double take. <laughs> There's an arm missing on one of your glasses. I have lost my one good pair of glasses and I <laughs> tore my house apart this morning looking for them and subsequently was quite late to the ground. And this is the only way I have of actually seeing what we were looking at. <laughs> yeah, there was quite a lot of stress before I left the house actually. That must have happened to a professional cricketer who needs to wear glasses to bat at some point where they've misplaced their specs and they're in a world of pain. I don't know whether someone like Chris Rogers lost his glasses on a, on a playing day or something like that. There'll be others. <laughs> I used to, when I, when I was, before I had to wear glasses full time, I used to be really confused as to why most cricketers you need to wear glasses didn't wear contact lenses. And mm. then I tried to bat in contact lenses and I just could not do it. All oh, right. What, what, what was the, what, what is, I mean, as somebody who doesn't wear glasses, the, the difference when facing up? I couldn't really put my finger on it. I just couldn't see properly out of the contact lenses. Your eyes get itchy. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I constantly was going to push my glasses up, so oh, it was right. just a massive distraction. Muscle.
on his way. Surrey's number 11, of course, didn't bat last week because there wasn't a lot of batting to be done at Old Trafford. In fact, uh, this might be a, a timely moment for me to jump out. Catch you, Whitney. It'll stay with you then. Yaz Rana's going to take you through to lunch. Breakthrough for Somerset. Atkinson and Overton looking very comfortable at the crease. Lots of run scoring options out there. Katty, what do you make of conditions so far this morning? Because Somerset started very well. Sorry, struggled to really find any rhythm in the bat in the first 45 minutes or so. But that last 45 minutes was, was all sorry, really. Yeah, and Somerset looked quite demoralised. I was just looking at um, at Jamie Overton's reaction, uh, Craig Overton's reaction to taking that wicket. He looked completely relieved. <laughs> and I'm sure he'd be very relieved to get his bowling boots off soon and put mm. his feet up for a bit. Yeah, it's been hard work for Somerset over the last day or so, but what you'd say is there hasn't really been any time in this Surrey innings where Surrey with this star-studded top seven and the tail end includes Jamie Overton who averages 30 odd for Surrey in the last couple of years from the bat. Never really gotten away from Somerset in terms of the scoring rate. You're doing well to keep this Surrey lineup scoring at just a smidge over three runs and over. You mentioned Jamie Overton, even Gus Atkinson. Gus Atkinson is mm. not a mug with the badge. Looked up his first class average. He averages 26.64 in first class cricket. To have someone like Gus Atkinson batting so low down is is such a useful useful part of Surrey's lineup. And he didn't need to attack that short ball like he did. He could have just stayed in with, with Jamie Overton and, as I said, kept batting and batting and batting and really put the put the blinks on the game. Yeah, I think a huge part of Surrey's success is out of their bowlers. It's a bowling attack that complements each other. Even when they play five seamers, they're five different types of seamers. But also those seamers genuinely are very capable with the bat. You know, I think Gus Atkinson would bat eight for most county sides. I think Jamie Overton, the way he's gone the last couple of years, and you know, he's on the fringes of the England squad in, in T20 cricket at the moment, and that is more in his batting than his bowling. He's obviously got that 97 on test debut a couple of years ago as well. I think I think he'd be batting six or seven for a lot of counties. Tom Laws, who's highly rated as a, as an all-rounder at Surrey, if you speak to people around Surrey, he generally bats ten in the championship. Craig Overton to his twin brother Jamie. Defended into the onside. Vast spaces for Overton to utilise. He's fine with giving the strike to Kimar Roach. She picks up a single, sorry, 419 for nine now. You mentioned Tom Lord. I spoke to him about his batting before the start of the season, actually, and he really wants to, to work on his batting and, and move up the Surrey order, but he just said, there's no space for me. There's no space for me to move up the order. In, in 2022, he had a couple of couple of half centuries in the, in the T20 blast. He's not a mug at all with the bat, and for most counties, he would be batting higher up the order than he gets an opportunity to do here at Surrey. Mm. Even someone like Dan Worrell, who... Is very much not an all-rounder. You, there, there are times last season where you, you could see that this is a guy capable of batting slightly higher up the order, and it bailed them out. You know, Alex Stewart described their championship win last year as good, not great. Roach gets off strike, and a big part of that was that several top-order batters, sorry, had decent but not outstanding years. And a big part of their success was lower order runs from the likes of Jamie Oates and Jordan Clark bailed them out on a couple of occasions. He had an outstanding year. So the runs of Sibley and Burns yesterday is a great sign for Surrey in this new season. Short and Jamie Oates and gets something on it and that will fly to the boundary. Umpire signals four runs off the bat. Jamie Overton moves to 33. 
Craig. Not shy in using the short ball to his twin brother, Jamie. Yeah, plenty of run scoring opportunities for Jamie if he chooses to use them. Just two fielders in the ring. Short again, pulled again. Fourth delivery of the over. Jamie Overton once more very happy to take the single. Exposing Kimar Roach for a maximum of two deliveries. As a bowler who relies on, on movement, whether that be through the air or, or off the pitch, and he doesn't have that extra yard of pace, Craig Overton not quite as quick as, as, quick as his twin brother. It must be so demoralising to have come back this morning and to have these lower order partnerships and these runs piled on the board with an old kookaburra ball. Full and confidently defended by Roach, who gets everything behind that one. No, it's a good point. I thought when Overton and Aldridge started this morning, they were very tight. They gave very little away. And there are a couple of occasions where there were genuine edges um, played with hardish hands that didn't come close to carrying to the slip cordon. And that, that, you know, that's how Craig Overton has so much of his success. And we shouldn't underestimate the physical challenge as well. This is... Craig's first first class game since July missed the back end of the season with that back injury opted to have surgery on it in the off season this is his first game back didn't play in the first round of fixtures so to get 26 overs under his belt is no mean feat I bet he's thrilled when he had the cooker barrel going to use for his first game back in kind of takes out that margin for error as well you have to be so on it with with a with a kookaburra ball as a seamer who doesn't have that extra yard of pace because anything that you do bowl that's slightly off is going to be punished no 100 percent taunton as a grounds had a reputation for being several different things over the years and i actually think one of the reasons why craig is the bowler that he is today is that in his early years in particular that was one of the best if not the best pitches for batting in the country Oh, nearly chopped on. Pretorius head in hands. Still unmoved. Can't believe that's Mr. Stumps. His replay over and gives himself some room and that so nearly chopped onto the stumps. Ball bouncing just in front of the off stump really and then bouncing over it. Overton looking to pierce that gap behind square on the offside. Everyone is back on the offside. Everyone is back on the leg side as well. The closest fielder is a, a sort of fly slip. Pretorius bangs it in short. Overton takes it on. A reminder to viewers at home that boundary on the leg side is significantly shorter than the one on the offside. The pitch that we're using today may be about five, four or five strips away from the ones usually used for test matches here. Not as far across to the gasometer side of the ground as it occasionally is in the county championship, but still, that is the shorter side. Short again, and Overton, slightly late on that pull shot, picks up one. Notable that in his innings so far, he's been very, very content with handing the strike to his lower order partners, first Gus Atkinson, but even number 11, Keemore Roach. Very happy to give deliveries to him. You'll see now the field changes for Roach. All the fielders in front of square come in. So a more conventional ring field. Slip. Moves from fly slip to conventional slip. Back of a length in Roach. Comfortably defends that. I guess for Roach now, Katia, the game plan's pretty straightforward. Just get behind it and make sure Jamie Overton gets as much support as possible. Yeah, block it, get that lead up to 150, have some lunch, have a bowl. Mm. Simple stuff. It's a simple game, really. It's 
see Patois really working on that ball. Slightly fuller and Roach gets in behind it again. Thank you. We haven't seen Lewis Gregory this morning, have we? No. It's a good point. I guess with the way that Aldridge and Overton began the day, you wanted to give them both longish spells. They were really frustrating, sorry. And Bashir bowled well as well. So I, I think Somerset have actually bowled pretty well today. I think they've done well to con over the back half of, of day two and opening stages of day three to really plug away. Keep sorry within arm length. Fuller and driven nicely through the extra cover region. Roach will pick up a couple. Slightly fuller from Batorius. And Roach timed that one well and he picks up two. Sorry, move up to 428 for nine. Just a quick look around the grounds this morning. Essex have picked up a few early wickets on day three at Chelmsford against Kent. But Ben Compton remains unmoved. 122 not out off 295 deliveries. Down at Hampshire. Another opener, another left-handed opener. Who is still there is Keaton Jennings. 140 not out of 249 deliveries. Lancashire 311 for four in response to Hampshire's 367. Jennings was dropped early-ish in his innings by Nick Gubbins. Relatively straightforward chance of a backward point. For Trent Bridge, Worcestershire 302 for eight in response to Knotts' 399. Slower ball from Aldridge, who's into the attack. And then in the run fest at Edgebaston, remember Durham are responding to a mammoth 698 for three. They are 282 for four, which is obviously good stuff. They're going well. Short and chopped on. Jamie Overton can't believe it, but Casey Aldridge picks up five it's his fifth wicket he finishes five for 64 he's congratulated by his teammates an outstanding effort from the England Lions youngster sorry bowled out for 428 it's a lead of 143 it's a significant lead but maybe not as significant as it threatened to look at Sages on day two in particular so we have a look at the replay another short ball wide of off stump over to looks to pull towards the longer side of the ground. Under edges it. Oh, that's unlucky. Ricochets off his left shin. Back onto the stumps. Somerset will argue he got away with one a couple of overs ago. So that sort of evens things out. Yeah, he's had a couple of close calls, Jamie Overton. That one that would have gone to first slip. There was one, I don't know how it missed the stumps a few overs, a couple of balls before. Didn't look completely comfortable. Looked like he was just trying to have a whack and fair play. Um, mm. But that is a significant lead. Yep, sorry, 428. All out. Rory Byrne, 75. Dom Sibley, his first century. Back at the Keir Oval since joining, rejoining, sorry, at the start of the 2023 season. Half centuries for Jamie Smith and England's Ben Folks. Important low order runs from Cam Steele and Jamie Overton. Jamie Overton, who is well supported by Gus Atkinson and then Kemar Roach. We've given Surrey this 143 run lead. We found wicket taking hard throughout this game. But at the same time, probably with the exception of that Lambie Renshaw partnership on day one, the scoring rate has always been relatively contained. Reminder that of that five wicket haul from Casey Aldridge, five for 64, really, really impressive. Gave very little away. Bowled with good control, but good stamina as well. Bowled for the majority of this first morning. First, a lengthy spell from the pavilion end. Bashir 
bowled manfully 36 overs just to one wicket but kept things tight going at just over two runs and over Lewis Goldsworthy picking up one as well Katia, how do you see this game from here? We've got what, five and a bit sessions left. Somerset will come out in just under 10 minutes. Really fiddly little session. One of those sessions where as the batting side, you have little, you have almost nothing to gain in that 10 minute period. Yeah, it's one of those where you lose a wicket and suddenly the game is completely against you. You just want to hold out for those 10 minutes. I'm sure that uh, Matt Renshaw and uh, Matt Renshaw and And um, Dixon wouldn't have wanted to come out for those 10 minutes. Um, but they've just got to get through them, get in behind it and and make it through to lunch. But Somerset, I think, will have had... When they were, when they were getting those wickets yesterday afternoon, I think they would have had hopes of keeping that lead to maybe within the three-figure marks. But 143 seems really significant on this pitch. Um, and I think they're going to be up against it, to be honest. Mm. Well, sorry, we'll get two bites of the cherry with that new ball. We'll be taking a very short break. But do rejoin us in five or six minutes' time for the resumption of the Somerset second innings. A reminder, sorry, bowled out for 428. They lead by 143.
Surrey players return to the field and they're greeted by a warm applause from the members in the pavilion. Another healthy crowd here at the Kier Oval on this glorious Sunday afternoon. And a really tricky spell here for Somerset. Just 12 minutes until the lunch break. And Katia, just saying off air, nothing good can really happen for Somerset in this 12 minute spell. Yeah, I was literally just thinking that. It's one of those awful ones where the only outcomes that can happen are bad. Mm. If anything happens, you just want nothing to happen. You'd be happy to go in at naught for naught if it meant you didn't have any wicket, if wickets down. Yeah, it's not quite long enough to leave a significant dent on that Surrey lead. It looks like Jordan Clark will start from the Mickey Stewart members pavilion end. He'll open up to Matt Renshaw, who looked really impressive, I thought, in the Somerset first innings. And it wasn't a Surrey bowler who got him out. It was He was run out. Lamanby on 99, looking for a quick single to get him to three figures. Even though Lamanby was running to the danger's end, Renshaw was run out the other end. A brilliant direct hit from Jordan Clark. Worms up with just two slips in play. Full left alone. Good start from Clark. Interesting that sorry, starting just with two slips and three men in sort of ring positions on the offside. I think we've seen new ball bowlers bowling with four slips at various points in this game. Two pretty narrow slips from the angle that we're at. Very close into the keeper. Decent carry early on from Clark. Ball flying through. Ben Folks taking it around about chest height. Matt Renshaw's really been really impressive in county cricket in the in the two seasons he's played for before for Somerset. Maybe that has something to do with, as you said, Somerset, Taunton, good batting wicket. As an overseas batter you'd like to you'd like to come to a county that has a track like that. Again, left alone. Good area from Clark early on. Early change in the field already from Rory Burns. The man who's just in front of square at square leg has dropped back a good 25 metres onto the boundary. Perhaps an early suggestion that Surrey are going to use the short ball early, even with the new ball. from Clark but no run yeah on Renshaw Renshaw is one of those players who I think is is almost your perfect overseas he's not someone who picks up franchise gigs he's not someone who's currently involved in the Australia white ball setup and I don't think he's someone who, who ever really will sort of on the fringes of the test setup I imagine he'll play more test cricket in a year or two's time the Australia top order pretty old at the moment Kawaja and Smith up top Labashain he feels like one of the younger players but even he is 29-30 Cam Green at four only player under the age of 28 in that top six yeah we were speaking about this with Renshaw the other day obviously missed out on that Cricket Australia central contract list that was announced a couple of weeks ago had a decent but not explosive Sheffield Shield season one just gone but you kind of feel like if he can really kick on for Somerset Fuller, but Renshaw doesn't quite time it as he'd have wished. It's another dot ball, Jordan Clark opens up with a maiden. I think if you speak to a lot of directors of cricket around the grounds, they will say that one of the hardest things in recruiting overseas players is getting players who have, who are actually available for large chunks of the season. 
one of the reasons why Lancashire was so disappointed with the news that Nathan Lyon is now only available for seven county championship games was it wasn't just that they got such a high profile player a player with 500 test wickets they, they had got someone who was down to play all three formats for the entire season mm, obviously having lost Phil Salt last minute to, to the IPL as well out of Lancashire that's not ideal if you're planning going into the county season it makes it very difficult to plan if you've got players that get last minute gigs in overseas franchise leagues whether that be the IPL or other leagues as well. That's part of the stuff that we're talking about with Major League Cricket coming in. Will will last minute deals to go and play a couple of weeks in America, will that stop counties or like hamper pl counties' plans in mm. a way? Very interesting from sorry. They are opening up with Dan Lawrence, the off spin of Dan Lawrence. Kimo Roach not being used with the new ball. Lawrence to bowl to Sean Dixon. One slip and a forward short leg in place. Lawrence obviously took those four wickets last week up at Old Trafford. Makes sense to give him an early bowl here, I think. Try something different. And he picks up a wicket with his second ball. I don't think that's the way he'd have imagined it. Slightly short, down the leg side, and Dixon gets a little tickle on it, and Ben Folks. Takes a very smart catch behind the stumps. Surrey with an early breakthrough. Inspirational decision, really, from Rory Burns. Kimar Roach, 250 plus test wickets for the West Indies. Always opens the bowling for Surrey. Doesn't on this occasion. Gives the new ball to Dan Lawrence. And Surrey have that early breakthrough they so desired. As we take a look at the replay here, Lawrence, with that brilliant action. To be fair to him, that's a. That has turned quite a long way. It's down the leg side. Started middle and off, quite short, keeps quite low. Starts outside off stump, really. Good take from Ben Folks. Very good take from Ben Folks. I don't think Dixon is overly impressed with the decision. So we take a look at Ben Folks' work from side on. Yes, one of the worst things that could have happened for Somerset. Don't get out to the seamer, get out to the spinner. First two balls, lose a wicket. Five, ten minutes to go before lunch. It's possibly one of the worst ones to have happened in that short session. 100%. And Tom Lamby, Centurion in the first innings, comes out at number three. No runs on the board so far in the Somerset second innings. I think there, you, you see why people have rated Dan Lawrence's offspin more than the number of overs he bowled at Essex really suggested his offspin to be at. He gets side spin on the ball. And with that hard new Kookaburra ball, he gets one to turn. Sure, it was a bit short, but induces the full shot. And sorry, have an early breakthrough. Lawrence again. Very tidy into Lambie. It's a very interesting field. Just the one slip in play, Lawrence as an off-spinner to the left-hander, will be spinning the ball away from the left-hander. We've got a man at short, forward short leg, catching man at shortish mid-wicket. Full and driven to the man at short cover. So we've got four men in front of the square on the leg side, one just behind, backward square leg, just the one slip, no one out on the fence. Full again, driven for no run. One thing we can think about with Dan Lawrence and if he does continue to have this increased role with the ball, uh, for Surrey, what that might mean for Will, for, um, uh, Will Jacks coming back into the side as well um, and what, what that might do for him. We saw Dan Lawrence coming down the order yesterday and see, and we can see how that might play out as the season goes forward and Will Jacks comes back in. Mm. 
we're just having a look at Jordan Clark's first over. Um, it was a maiden over. Generally bowling the ball across the left-hander, Matt Renshaw. As we said, just two slips into, into play, bowling a relatively straight line. Really challenging both edges of the bat. Clark continues again. Yeah, I think with the, the field that we had in place for that Dan Lawrence over with no one back, sorry, sort of playing with the batters really, you know, we're talking about there's nothing really to gain for someone set. Are they are they willing to take the risks they probably ordinarily would do against a spinner? Normally you'd think when, when Lawrence is bowling, you'd have some sort of protection deep. But Roy Burns really inviting the Somerset players to take a risk. Do they are, are they willing to go over the top against Lawrence's off spin early? We saw on the on the first evening Dom Sibley going aerial, I think off Bashir's third last ball of the day. Really tidy start here from Jordan Clark, giving absolutely nothing away, honing in on that off stump area. The odd ball pushing across Renshaw, the other slightly straighter. Just hoping for a bit of nibble either way, a bit of natural variation. Brings both LBW and the slips into play. First runs of the Somerset, second innings. Renshaw flicks it into the leg side, picks up a couple, he gets off the mark. Somerset, two for one. This should be the last over of the session. Left alone by Renshaw. It's another change in the field with this the last ball of the day. Ollie Pope has moved across from the offside from a sort of cover position to a leg gully. Still got that man at deep square leg. Jordan Clark makes a change himself. He's going to come around the wicket. Telegraphing the short ball. Is it a bluff? What does Clark do? Oh, it was a bluff. It's a good length. Renshaw tentatively prods at it. The ball flies past the outside edge. If you take a look at the replay here, Perhaps keeping a little low, but Renshaw gets to the break unscathed. Somerset two for one. We said there was nothing really to gain for Somerset in that mini session. Just 12 minutes at the start of their second innings. They reach the interval at two for one, still trailing Surrey by 141 runs. Katia, what's your assessment of that session? Well, as you said, we said before that there was nothing really to gain for Somerset from that session and, and they could only lose and they did with, with that wicket that fell to Dan Lawrence. Um, yeah, and it's really put them behind with an opener back in the hutch already. You've got to think that Surrey will be going in very, very happy with their morning's work, with those runs from the lower order. Inspired decision by Rory Burns to, to put Dan Lawrence on and picking up the wicket and getting his rewards. So, completely dominant session for Surrey. Absolutely. A reminder that in a couple of minutes' time, we'll have uh, a live interview here from the Keir Oval, where Dan Norcross will be interviewing 
Ben Bloom and the Surrey president, Trish Garrard. Ben's just written an excellent book, Batting for Time, that sort of looks at where the English game currently is at. Before we hand over to them, we'll quickly run through what's happening elsewhere in the country. So at Chelmsford, sorry, at Kent, sorry, uh, 303 for six in response to Essex's 530. Still a fair bit of work to do to avoid the follow-on. Ben Compton is still there, 126 not out of 300 deliveries. Over at Hampshire, Lancashire are 329 for four in response to Hampshire's 367. Keaton Jennings, another left-hander who is still there, 151 not out of 266 deliveries. Lancashire going well there. At Trent Bridge, Worcestershire are 331 for eight in response to Knotts' 399 all out. Nathan Smith, the New Zealander, one of their overseas signings this season. He's unbeaten on 57. And in the run fest at Edgebaston, Alex Lees is finally out for 145. Will Rhodes with the breakthrough there. Durham going well at 305 for five, but they still trail Warwickshire by 393 runs. Still nearly 250 more runs to be scored for Durham to avoid the follow-on. Very briefly in Division 2, uh, Glamorgan 166 for six. Alex Thompson with 11 wickets in the game. The off-spin of Alex Thompson doing the bulk of the work for Derbyshire. Glamorgan, though, still lead by 205. That game is evenly po poised. Yorkshire, 194 for one in their second innings. Adam Lyde's got 100 there. Finley Bean, early dismissed for 73. They're well on top against Gloucestershire at Bristol. Sussex are 500, 415 for six against Leicestershire, leading by 77. And Middlesex are 206 for two, still trailing North Ants by 346 runs at Wantage Road. I will hand over to Dan Norcross, who will lead you through the lunch interval. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, a lot of runs being scored, not an awful lot of wickets, which is not what we think of in April, but perhaps it's time we did, especially with a Kookaburra ball. But for Surrey, an unusual session. Wasn't quite expecting it to pan out quite that way. Surrey made sure they got themselves that good lead of 143, and then the bonus wicket just before lunch. Puts them in a strong position. There is weather forecast, unfortunately, for uh, tomorrow. Oh, well, there's always weather forecast, isn't there? But the, the weather that is forecast is not ideal. So Surrey would love to get ahead of the game in the remaining two sessions of today and get the, the bulk of those Somerset wickets if they can. Now then, I am absolutely delighted to say that we have got some moderate technical issues, but they're about to be, they're about to be fixed. Um, because we have, I'm just going to make sure that that's in the just the right place. We are very honoured because we have Madam President in the building. What is the right way to address the Madam President, Madam President? I don't know, it's Madam President or Lady President or just Trish. It's up to you, Trish. It's up to you, <laughs> it's up to you President Trish. <laughs> we are honoured to have you with us. And we also have the author of a book that's come out just about now, hasn't it? A couple, couple of weeks ago. A couple yeah. of weeks ago. Ben Bloom is the author of Batting for Time subtitled The Fight to Keep English Cricket Alive, which is something that I feel we end up talking about almost all the time, all the don't time. we? But it, it's a book that's very germane. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a kicking off point because we've got a really good story to tell here at Surrey, not least because of Lady Madam President Trish, <laughs> who's <laughs> alongside us. Um, and right at the, the front of the book, right in the introduction, Ben, you highlight Trish and how she got into cricket and how what what cricket means for her uh, Trish do you want to give us a sort of give us a potted history of how you come to be sitting here as our as our leader is a, yeah that's a, a, a strange one um no I, I I had a boyfriend at the time in 1985 and we were both into live sport and we thought it'd be quite a nice idea to have a day at the Oval day at Twickenham day at Wimbledon whatever and I managed to thankfully get two tickets for the 1985, first day of the 85 um, Ashes test. Um, and in those days, because we only had one division, the fixture list was out by the time the test match came round. And Surrey very cleverly used that as a means of marketing to buy a membership. 
So as I was walking around, it so happened they were selling this membership. And whilst it's all relative, it was £45 for, a season, for the rest of the 85 season, uh, the 86 season, and five days at the next test match. Good grief. £45, pounds, yeah. Well, I was a junior member then, because I, I was at that game as well. Yeah. We were, our paths would have crossed. Sitting I was out where the Peter May is now. <laughs> well, I, I got my junior membership, I think it was 20 quid, and you mm. got a little red card. Little red one. one. Yep, 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 got it. And that let me come to every day of the test match. Yeah. It was unbelievable value. It was great value, great value. But I, I obviously bought that in the at the test match, and um, come the following April, the boyfriend had left me, and all I had was membership of Surrey County Cricket Club. Much better. I yeah, much. Yeah. If only he knew what a favour he did me. <laughs> so I, you know, I came along. I walked into an AGM in '86, and people were so friendly here. It was unbelievable. I just walked in as a lady, um, walked in and got greeted, and never looked back really. Um, You've also managed to pick up two husbands from Surrey's uh, membership yeah, as well, have, which is pretty good going. Yeah, I have done that. And, and the first husband actually introduced me, to, uh, the second husband actually introduced me to the first husband and was, in fact, best man at our wedding. But, you know, things didn't quite work out how we wanted them to, so the best man came back in and said, well, my turn. <laughs> but it's a family affair as well because is. your daughter Becca is well known to people here at Surrey. Mm. Um, the youngest committee member? Is the youngest right? ever committee oh, member, yep. She, she'd been a member here, as had my other daughter since they were babies. Um, and she'd grown up round here and she always loved it round here and felt she could play a part as a youngster, um, giving a younger person's point of view on the committee. Um, and she stood for committee and, in fact, that year she topped the poll. So, yeah, I was very proud of her. Now, she's... She's with our arch rivals, Yorkshire, at the she moment, isn't is. she? Now, of course, Surrey will remain firmly in her Oh, heart, she's still a Surrey member. Yeah. How's still she getting on at Yorkshire? Is she having fun? Yep, yep, yep. It's um, obviously completely different to being um, at Surrey, where she absolutely knows a lot of the members as well. But, yeah, she's she's in, enjoying it as best she can and and uh, covering the team and hoping for su some success this year, I think. Well, we want them back in the first division, don't we? Because we that's do. the only way we can beat them. So don't get to <laughs> yeah. play them otherwise. So, well, we've got know. them in the 50 overs here, so that'll be interesting. In, yes, it in, will, won't it? Yeah, end of July. Uh, well, we're going to keep you on because this conversation will range <laughs> around various topics, but it's about county cricket, obviously. And, Ben, uh, you were telling me off-air before that um, you are made redundant. You decided you were going to write a book. Cricket is your passion, so it seemed obvious. What was your sort of jumping-off point for choosing county cricket in particular why, why did why did you zero in on that um so i worked for the telegraph for um just over a decade and my now former colleague nick holt who's the um chief cricket correspondent there he wrote an article off the back of the ecb high performance review or the strauss review as it's better known um and it was all about the the member uprising um within county cricket pushing back on those um those measures that Strauss suggested should be implemented. Um, and I thought, this is really interesting, and, and so much is changing currently within global cricket um, and domestic cricket in England. There's re real scope to, to look into this and, and mark this moment in time, because in, in 10 years, um, who knows what things are going to look like. It'll be, quite, it'll be really interesting to look back on this book in a decade's time and, and see what actually has played out. Um, so yeah, so I thought let's let's build on Nick's article. So I sort of have him to thank, really. Well, let's start from the outset because not everybody will be aware of how cricket clubs are structured around the country. And 15 of them are member run, three not. That's Durham, Northants, and Hampshire. Hampshire, Hampshire that's right. Um, what are the strengths, do you think, of of the system? For those, well, certainly for those 15 counties that are member run, what is it that characterises each of those and gives them their strength? Uh, I think the main strength comes from a real sense of community. And Trish will, I'm sure, um, back this up. Um, these these clubs are member; they're member owned. They're member assets. They the social side of them is as important, if not more important, than what actually happens on the pitch. Um, and when clubs become private entities, and I'm not necessarily thinking about cricket here, but I'm thinking about football and rugby and other sports where private ownership is the norm, um, 
I don't think that relationship is is the same. Um, you have season ticket holders, and um, the focus is what happens on the pitch, pretty much solely. Um, the season ticket holders are seen as customers, as clients. And in county cricket, certainly at those 15 of the 18, they're not customers or clients. They are at the core. Um, and I think that's really why those members do not want private investment in their counties. E even though it has worked at these three that aren't member-owned, um, they fear becoming um, or being seen as customers rather than owners and, and part of the operation. Now you've delved into the numbers and um, you've come up with a figure of 69,000 members, Crick County Cricket members across the country. Staggeringly, Trish, Surrey has 18,000. We've got about 18,000 currently at the moment, 18,000. I mean, not all of them, like we said, <laughs> not all of them come every day, obviously, otherwise we uh, might be in a bit of bother. Yes, we, bother yeah. <laughs> we might have to open a few extra bars, but yeah, w we have got 18,000 here. And, and as I said, we've had a couple of great crowds the last couple of days, about 4,200 the first day, pretty much the same yesterday, and even today it's a reasonable crowd. But what we said was gratifying was how, what the demographic was here yesterday. There were a lot of young people here yesterday between the ages of 20 and 30. And in fact, the last statistic I saw was that of those members, over 2,000 of them are in that 21 to 25 category, which is brilliant. Well, I mean, that is actually, we, if you delve down into those figures, that's quite amazing. If you think that people might be active members or full members from mm. the age of 18, let's say, to an average death age of around 80, don't want to get too mm. morbid, but that means that every five year dollop, there would be, how many was that? There'd be 12 of those yeah. there. So if 2,000 of your members are, are that coming from group? that demographic, then that's sort of, it's overrepresented, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to keep them, oh, I don't know what the statistic is, jumping from 25 to the full membership, because it's another, I don't know, 50 pound a year or something. But the hope is that we can encourage them doing things like this, being out, out on the outfield and feeling part of a club. And that's what we want to, that's what we've always tri strived to do at Surrey. It sounds like a bit of a cliche, the Surrey family, but it very much is that. We, you know, walking in the ground this morning, I get a cuddle from the steward, I get somebody says hello, whatever, and it's, and it's a family. Although it's a big ground, 28,000 people, a lot of people know each other to say hello. And I, I, and I think that's what, like Ben says, that's what cricket is about. It's a community. And it, it's particularly poignant to this time of year, isn't it? Because people feel bereft mm. when you go through October to March. <laughs> um, and you know, as John Surtees was saying to me off air, he's saying, you know, loads of these people won't actually see each other or speak to each other no. for six months. And I, I found this when I ran a cricket club. Um, I would say goodbye to my team at the end of September. Then we'd turn up for nets in usually March because we were quite lazy. And it was as if no time had passed yeah. at all. And that is sort of one of the many, but a really significant joy, isn't it, of being yeah. a member of a cricket club? Yeah. I mean, we have, um, we do have the, once a month, there's a, a group of about, it's grown about 30 or 40 people that meet in a pub in Wimbledon once a month during the winter to say hello and get together and say keep contact and make sure people are all right sometimes if somebody's been taken ill or been poorly or whatever somebody say well i'll give you a lift to the hospital you know things little simple things like that that keep that community going but there must be challenges because and you would have seen it from administering a, a club like this mm. a behemoth of a club with 18,000 members that sense of ownership that perhaps you don't get if you're a season ticket holder at Arsenal or something, mm. because ultimately you're powerless because of the, member the, the ownership structure. Here, a lot of people are empowered by the fact that they're members. So yeah. that, must, that must be a strength, but it also must present challenges for yeah. you guys in the committee. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't please all the people all the time, whatever, whatever's going on. But, you know, with, with the new suggestions that are going on at the moment, Surrey have held two forums which members were, you know, invited to come along and have their say and have their feelings felt. And one was on live stream as well. And we'll keep them, as we hear, we will keep them in line with what's happening. Some will be happy, many more won't be happy perhaps. But, you know, we want them to be heard and, and hope that their input 
will be heard by the wider cricket community. Well, I'm bound to say this because, as I am biased, but but I think it's also true. I mean, we saw at the Champions Dinner, um, oh. an extraordinary event, really, mm. where everybody who, who works at Surrey, as well as members and all sorts of people, were invited to it. Yeah. And there was this great sense of sort of egalitarianism and togetherness, and how mm. the success of the players on the pitch is the success of the members as well, which yeah. is a, a truly marvellous thing. So people feel deeply invested in it but it does present issues perhaps all the way through the cricketing hierarchy and you sort of sense it a little bit in some of the responses that um, perhaps some administrators give to the fact that members ha have a voice and they want to have that voice and Ben you'll have uncovered this many times over I imagine because people who are administrating the game at the highest level feel a bit of a disconnect from the actual members themselves and what the members themselves want, as Trish has been brilliantly elucidating, articulating, is that sense of fellowship, community, and this thing that they value so highly. That may not be valued as much. The sort of the further away you get from the actual members, would that be fair to say? Yeah, it, it's hard for chief execs because they have to look at the finances um, and where uh, Trish and all her family and friends see this as a community club the person that actually has to look at the finances that they've got to make it viable mm -hmm. now a, a place like this um, is, is viable 10 times over because it's um, it's run so brilliantly and there's there's so much going on but some of the smaller counties um, are really really struggling um, and and so the people at the the people in charge of um, holding the purse strings might um, look disparagingly up upon members who they would argue um, potentially hold hold the game or the club back. Now the members, very very rightly, um, would say, "Well, no, we're we're the ones that give you the money every single year. We're the ones that turn up, and we contribute more than anyone. So um, why why it shouldn't seems, we?" Seems there are two sort of phrases here that spring to mind immediately, which is to understand the cost of everything, but not the value, the value of nothing, if you like. And also, Gideon Haig's brilliant aphorism, which was. Does cricket exist to make money, or does it make money to exist? Mm. And the reason that, that question is important is because how do you value something as, as profound and poignant, as I say, as the fellowship of community, which is what is amply demonstrated here, but it's replicated in counties across the country. And Trish, you in your capacity as Madam Lady President <laughs> have been all around the country. You, do, you, don't, you don't just sit in the committee room eating yeah, sandwiches here you you have to go all yeah. around the place you're an ambassador for yeah. this great county we we um did 81 days last year and that covered home and away games so you know a couple of the ladies games as well and the disability game down at Chobham, which was a fantastic day out i i would say to people please do go along and watch the skills that these guys guys and girls have got it's brilliant um, so, yeah, so it, it was quite busy <laughs> going around the counties. And, you know, again, we've made friends with people around the counties. Um, I, d I do appreciate what Ben's saying. You have to make some money somewhere. You can't just go along and watch the cricket. And, and I think sometimes people do th think they don't appreciate where things come from. Like the guys here, we're, we're privileged that they can go out on the outfield because we can afford probably three or four extra stewards to make sure that that's all going right. Whereas perhaps some of the other counties think, oh, that means employing another steward for four or five hundred pounds a day, which they haven't got. And, and I think we have to sympathise with that. We are very lucky at Surrey. I, don't, I hope people don't take it for granted how lucky we are. Um, and I think I, I try to impress upon um, members at other counties, make sure you do go along and support. If you want to keep weekend cricket and, and county cricket, you must go. You can't just keep going on social media and saying, oh, what's happening? You've got to attend and go and try and help the club. Buy a pint inside the ground, buy your sandwich. Just the little simple things in life that will keep these clubs going because you have to spend some money there. Now obviously the challenges that face Surrey are very different ones from the ones that face say Leicestershire and there's a chapter in your book all about Sean Jarvis and Leicestershire and what they're trying to achieve there now I haven't delved into it as much but I've always found Sean a very impressive guy and what Leicestershire are trying to achieve is something that's beyond survival isn't it that they're actually they're not trying to exist to survive they're trying to exist 
to go places. What, what's what did you get from your chat with Sean? Yeah, well, a lot of it comes down to what you were just talking about: is what is the purpose of uh, of counties? Like, what what are they here for? Um, and a lot of people would argue they're here to feed uh, the international side. So they're here to produce players um, for England, or they're here to other people would argue they're here for um, community purposes, uh, or they're here to win. They're here to win win uh, trophies. Now. Leicestershire are a small county and Sean knows that and they don't have a hundred team attached to them and they don't host um, men's international cricket um, and they they can't just build a 20,000 seater stadium so they can't operate on a Surrey-esque scale so Sean then thinks well how else can we provide purpose um, and he's come up with this phrase the academy of cricket um, and on on the uh, the field he sees that as giving players a route into the game um, so players like Stuart Broad um, and Luke Wright um, who come through at Leicestershire and then if they then go off to another county, invariably Nottinghamshire, um, but it could be anywhere else. Um, it would be welcome here if they're good enough. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, then, then Sean and the other people at Leicestershire are, are perfectly content with that because then Leicestershire has, has done its job and they, they are the academy of cricket. Now Sean sort of grand vision the second stage of this academy of cricket is to take it off the field and he wants to create um uh, a qualification so you can go to um university he's had conversations with loughborough university to have some sort of qualification into cricket administration mm. um so that not only would leicestershire be producing uh, cricketers but they would be producing the people that make cricket happen um, and so there you have the Academy of Cricket on the field, you have the Academy of Cricket off the field, and Leicestershire would, in theory, be providing something that no other county is providing. And that is purpose for mm. Little Leicestershire. Little Leicestershire, who realistically are, are almost certainly not going to win a county title. Um, but they're still their place in the ecosystem is just as important, if not more important, than, than many others. Although, mm. fairness, we must point out, they did win the Metro Bank last year in they did. thrilling and brilliant fashion. Brilliant. Yeah, and, um, fantastic. One of the most eye-catching players I saw last year. I was, I, so was yeah, Josh they thrashed Carl, us. They, yeah, they thrashed us at Guildford. Absolutely <laughs> thrashed us. They did. They did. We didn't take a wicket. No, I was commentating it. <laughs> I remember it well. <laughs> and fair play to them because, you know, I saw Josh Hull, mm. and he's a guy I could easily see playing at. Mm. I was going to say at a higher level. It's, it doesn't have to be that. If, if Leicestershire, mm. as they are now doing, are, com are competitive enough. There's no reason they couldn't get promoted. And mm. this is another thing I want to come to you here is, is the, the two divisional county structure. Trish mentioned that when she first joined Surrey, we had one division. So you played everybody, basically. And everybody could start the season with the hope of being the county champions. Um, with a two divisional structure, you don't. But you do get, get something else with it, don't you? And I think you get a real quality in the first division that perhaps was lacking and you have slightly less cricket which I know not all members are happy about but in so doing you get an improved quality don't you Trish when we were younger we were watching poor cricketers play seven days a week yeah. sometimes yeah well funny enough that little red book that we were talking about earlier on when I looked at that the other day so the 1986 one I think there was something like 24 championship games being played three and in between there there was a the be Benson Hedges there was the Nat West and there was you know the Bain Doors competition mm -hmm. and the whatever so okay. it was it absolutely packed this little booklet every Sunday I mean so yeah. had seven, 16 it would have been then wouldn't it 16 yeah. John Player League games yeah together with your zonal games if you went far in the Gillette Cup and you talked to players at that time and you you talked to Angus Fraser in the book don't you and he he has a slightly um ambiguous attitude to it doesn't it because he's sort of like a one at the same time thinks well if we're paying you to play you mm. can't moan about about the amount of cricket you play when i was doing it we had to go left right and center and you know graham fowler will tell stories of li literally going from old trafford on the saturday of a county championship game down to southampton for a john mm. player league game the following day to then go back to old trafford to finish yeah. county championship game so you know it was a terrible muddle in yeah. those days this feels like we've actually got something that's sustainable and is working isn't it yeah well yeah angus fraser talks very interestingly i, I, I like you saying it. it is quite ambiguous because um 
he does he does look at back at his career and he goes well look what I had to do um, but then he he does accept that that wasn't sustainable um, and certainly not in a in a modern era really in this era of um, acknowledging not only physical health but also mental health and and all the other things mm. that go with it and and the almost professionalization of the game that has happened in the last 20 or 30 years um, the focus is so much um, more now than it used to be um, it used to be it was it was professional not year round but it was professional for for a portion of the year when they played um but it was sort of it operated on a sort of amateur plane whereas now things are professional um and so that has to be taken into account there aren't going to be 24 um <laughs> count, county championship <laughs> no, games in here no and, and of course in those days you, you were perfectly happy for your uh, players to play for england because you felt a great sense of pride still do of course but once they play for England now, they're taken away from us. They're snatched from our grasp. So yeah. there's, a, there's a little bit, dare I say it, when we go, oh, it's a shame he's not been picked for England, but it means we get to have him. <laughs> Which yeah, a probably, little bit of that. Yeah, it probably shouldn't happen, but, yeah. it, but it does. Now, yep. um, I was taken by the title of one of your chapters, because it, it's not often you see this in a, in a cricket book. Are the Arctic monkeys ruining <laughs> county cricket? <laughs> I mean, it's a question I hadn't thought to ask before, but Ben, <laughs> what's, what's behind that chapter? Um, so what's behind that chapter? That chapter looks about off-field um, income uh, because across the 18 counties, um, cricket doesn't really make money. Um, it's probably different here at Surrey, but um, broadly speaking, across the 18, cricket doesn't. So the, the cricket, you mean the, the spectacle of the game itself put, isn't driving the revenue putting, to pay for the game? Putting on county cricket doesn't make money um, so counties make money through other revenue streams and and the the oval is probably the, the best example of that I think that thousands of uh, private events are hosted at the oval every single year um, and you know counties have uh, they have hotels attached to them they have conferences and uh, all sorts of different things um, they host concerts that's where the Arctic Monkeys came into it. So Derbyshire, for example, Derbyshire's highest earning day last year was when the Who played at the ground. Um, Hampshire had the Arctic Monkeys play down there. And um, actually, they were then docked points for a poor pitch uh, a couple of weeks later. And one of the sort of mitigating circumstances that the groundsman suggested was that they hadn't had enough time to turn it around after the Arctic Monkeys played and then there was really bad weather afterwards. Um, so it's sort of looking at how the, count the counties have to look at off-field matters to bring in money, but there is a risk associated with that. Now, slightly alarmingly though, at the start of your book, I think it's Ashley Giles is quoted as saying that county cricket, he feels, faces a particularly fragile moment. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, I know that that's true conceptually, but we are privileged here. It, county cricket doesn't feel like that when you come to the Oval. It feels like it's thriving. It feels like it's a great community of people coming together, the excitement of it happening. Obviously, it helps that on-pitch performances for Surrey have been really good of late. But that isn't a picture that's everywhere. Why, why is Ashley Giles so concerned? Why is now a more fragile moment than, say, the 1960s when attendances plummeted after a particularly stodgy period and you know indeed either side of the first world war where counties were in danger of going bust uh, why is now particularly problematic uh sim simply speaking it's the spread of franchise leagues really and what that's done to the whole cricketing ecosystem global cricket has completely changed um obviously the ipl has been around for we're approaching 20 years now but things have moved on rapidly in the last five years there were there were i think three new major um t20 leagues that launched last year alone um and the effect that that's having on uh, on cricket globally on cricket in england the effect it has on players so player aspirations um the effect it has on the ecb because the ecb then create the hundred well, they created the 100 to try and combat that so that England has their own competition. Um, uh, and then the 100 is then associated with less than half of the counties. So then you have some counties that benefit from it and some counties that don't benefit from it. Um, and with 
what we think is going to be private investment into um, into those hundred franchises and uh, host counties seemingly are going to be given a stake in those uh, those franchises to then sell um, it means that those counties that aren't involved in that suddenly they're they're sort of cast aside and and um, they're so in it's, so it's an existential fragility for the for the very survival of, of particular entities yes mm -hmm. not not for not for Surrey because no. Su Surrey Surrey doesn't have to to worry about these types of things but clubs like Ashley Giles at Worcestershire yes and, and there are all sorts of problems that he has with with flooding yes <laughs> there's, 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 there's other other problems down there. yeah isn't it and it, I don't know what the solution to that it is, is heartbreaking then, yeah you've Just been down to Worcester oh many, many a time times. that's where Phil and I became then husband and wife sort of Worcester fond memories with Duncan Fernley and what have you Worcester it has got a very special place in our heart and we've already booked to go there in at the end of June but to see that water mm -hmm. come in I mean they're fantastic the ground staff there it must be so disheartening yeah. to see that happen and I think it's now it's happened again I think in this last week yeah, and that's the ninth time since October and you know that'll cause them all sorts of bother how do you put on how do you stage matches can you change fixture lists so that you can play the bulk of your say T20 games away while yeah. the, the ground gets better but this is an issue that'll happen over and yeah. over again. And I'm so assuming with water in the ground, that's what they're the only ground yeah. without floodlights, so they can't. Yeah. That doesn't help. And I presume that's because of the water situation and electric. So yeah. <laughs> I presume that's why they don't have the floodlights there. So they've got all sorts of problems for what is a lovely, welcoming county, like we say, and and, and a great ground and people. It's it's sad to see, really. But can cricket come together to help? in this way because when you think about the way some sports are, are arranged especially in America American sports seem to be very conscious of the need for competition and, mm -hmm. to, and to maintain those entities don't they um, it's why they have a draft system so in theory no one side becomes incredibly mm -hmm. dominant in England we've got a bit of a sink or swim if you pardon the pun that's <laughs> what we're talking about <laughs> sink or swim attitude to how sport should work so there's a sort of sense of the cutthroat ben, in something that is feels so collegiate as county cricket and that's a kind of odd paradox isn't it yeah yeah it is um i think um the american system has always been that way the english system has always not been that way and so it would be very hard to suddenly shift over to that system now you know if we were to say to trish well yeah you guys are going to have to give three quarters of your money to a, to another yeah. county we'd say no we've worked really hard yeah. <laughs> to build everything that we built here um i spoke to paul farbrace he's quoted in the book um he gave a brilliant quote saying that um trying to get everyone to agree on a uniform approach is impossible it's like going to get harrods to agree with um your local corner shop um or your local news agent because they are they just operate on totally different scales yeah. um and it's not as vast, but we're, we're, we're at the Harrods here, really, as with Surrey and Worcestershire are the local news agent. And it, Steve, um, Steve Elworthy, yeah, Steve, Steve, Elworthy. Steve Elworthy and Ashley Giles cannot operate in the same way. Um, they have to see things differently. And so th I'm sure they share a united spirit, but they have to run their uh, operations very differently. Now, one of the great strengths of your book is that you have gone in search of all those different perspectives you, you spoke to over 100 people i did yes um from as you pointed out from counties as diverse as worcestershire and surrey and whatnot uh, without coming to a kind of blueprint for change or having an opinion i mean you, you say at the front of the book that the only time you're going to use the first person is in this introduction you don't say i anywhere else so you're laying out for us a situation from which I suppose we all draw our conclusions. But of those people that you've spoken to, um, who were the ones that sort of captivated you most or informed you most or surprised you most? <laughs> Trish. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, say why. Well, there's, oh dear. There, well, no, there's, only, uh, there's only one family that forms the entire prologue to the book, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's the Garrard family, because as soon as I spoke to Trish and her daughter, Becca, I realised that they, they encapsulate so much. Um, so much more than 
I could write about. They're the living embodiment of county cricket. I think I describe you as something like that in the book. Yeah, um, very kind. So, so yeah, yeah. These guys. As soon as I came across them, I I thought these guys have to be the first thing that I talk about in the book because um, you can write tens of thousands of words, um, but it won't be as meaningful as actually saying, "Look at this family." Well, the players will be coming out shortly. So before we leave, I want to finish on you, Trish. Um, we just take it for granted that you're our president. It's pretty remarkable. How, how have you found it? Um, obviously, an incredible honour. Um, there's a lot said. I'm the second lady president. The late, great Betty Surridge was the first one. But I think what I'm more proud of is the fact that I'm probably the first person off of the terraces that's become president of the club. It's been a fantastic honour, and I'll be back on the terraces next year. But in the meantime... I've met some fantastic people around the counties, more people even in the ground as well that stop me and say, oh, you're the president. And, yes, hello, thank you. And it's, it's lovely. What, I'm so what, honoured. Has anything surprised you about the role? And, and you know, Because I, mean, I wouldn't know where to start if I was president. I mean, aside from getting myself a retinue of servants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you must have... There must be quite a learning curve in discovering things on, on, on your way. Yeah, I suppose I've been quite lucky because um, I was the first lady committee member here in 1992. So I have been lucky to meet people going round the round the counties and saying hello to them. I mean, there's a great uh, couple that the, the Parsons family and their friend Beryl that are here from Somerset. They follow their county round all year. And we're great friends. When they arrived yesterday morning, big hugs because we're so pleased to see. So I have been lucky to meet a lot of people around the counties and and most people have been very kind and gracious and we always give a warm welcome here as best we can and so it's been it's been lovely met some great people and it's a two year two year, two year. this is my second year yeah and so who's who replaces you in um there's a chap called lord tony grabbiner casey Lord Tony, well, he's, Tony got big, he's got very big shoes to fill, Trish. I <laughs> hope he's aware he's, of this. He's, yeah, well, I'm going to train him. I'll tra train him up. <laughs> Trish, I'm going to let you go because the players are on yeah. their way up. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us. We pleasure. are genuinely honoured to have you as our president. Thank you very much. This book here, Batting for Time, Ben B Bloom. Very good. I highly recommend it. I dare say it may appear in shortlists for awards, book yeah. awards coming up next year. Um, congratulations on the book Thank and you. publication. And Trish, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Right, players are indeed making their way out with Surrey in a... Is that one? That they did, Daniel, and I'm going to put my FX mic back on here. We're going to have that in a moment. And so we just reconfigure all the cables in the commentary box. So we've had a little bit of cricket before lunch where Somerset have started their second innings, some 143 runs in arrears. There we go. Now we're back. We can hear the crowd. We've got Taha Hashim jumping in as well. Two for one. Dixon the man to go. The session begins here. Lamanby yet to score. Does so here. First run out to deep point. Made 100 even in the first innings. Good afternoon to you, Taha. Afternoon, Adam. It's good to be on the stream for the first time this summer. Oh, I didn't realise you hadn't been on on either of the first two days. No, it's my We've baby. missed you. We've missed you. You're a big part of what we did on here last year. It's great to have your office across the way. Well, your old office. Your old office. I know you don't work at wisdom.com anymore. Recently recruited to the Guardian. Renshaw. Better well on day one. Lovely clip. It's the cover off at the deep square for one. So Renshaw and Lamanby, their partnership that was worth 178, making 87 and 100 respectively. Bit of a mix-up that saw Renshaw run out, then Lamanby trapped leg before on an even 100 both by the arm of Clark who bowled the first over of this innings as well and Roach coming on first change after the Lawrence intervention 
Lawrence picking up Dixon, caught behind down the leg side just before lunch. Dixon dismissed for naught. That was one for none at that stage. That gets us back to where we are. So 139 they trail by at the moment, Taha. And we, we know rain is going to be a factor tomorrow. There's half a chance it might be today as well, whisper it. But with that in mind, this is the best opportunity for Surrey to win this game. This session to apply as much scoreboard pressure as possible while Somerset are in the red. Yeah, and sort of a rare thing, you know, for us to have kind of seen last year, you got used to the sight of Surrey's quicks doing kind of the, the bulk of the work. Um, you know, you'd see a bit of spin, but really it was the Surrey quicks who did all the work. Kimar Roach, Jordan Clark, Dan Worrell, Tom Laws, Gus Atkinson. And now we've had the first week from Dan Lawrence. And there was... You know, it wasn't a great, you know, it was, wasn't a great piece of cricket, but there was a bit of turn there for Lawrence. Happened last week too, didn't it? With Lawrence very effective, pretty much taking out the top order of lengths and, and still the bottom half. Yeah, and so Rory Burns, you know, as someone who's already had, you know, you know, plenty of riches to call upon, he, he must be feeling pretty sort of extra happy this summer, I think, with yeah. the fact that he's got kind of a sort of a budding all-rounder in Lawrence and then Steele who just sort of <laughs> in a way come out of nowhere and doesn't really bowl any bad balls in behind it to finish Renshaw three off five for one the score trail by 138 the visitors yeah, it's a it's a classic good problem to have for Surrey that Steele's bowling so well to start the season when he was outside of the first 11 for much of 2023 their configuration of being able to draw on Will Jacks to bowl a lot of overs, well, obviously not not around at the moment elsewhere. But you know, in the absence of Dan Worrell at the moment with that neck injury, it does mean that that Steele has a strike bowler taking lots of wickets. I wonder where he'll fit through the middle of the year when they're all fit and firing when Abbott arrives as well. It's going to be Clark from the pavilion end. He bowled quickly on day one and effectively. Figures of two for 59 plus the run out. Well played by Lamanby, but just for one. Ends up where that, where that tent was during the winter. The indoor butterfly, butterfly enclosure where they, they do their their spring training, sorry. How have you found a new gig? How long have you been with the Guardian formally now? Uh, just a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Good start? <laughs> yeah, very much. Well, what else are you going to say, I suppose? You're on, you're on the public airways. That's been a dreadful start, actually, Colo. <laughs> having a terrible time. I'm glad it's going well. No, manning the county championship blog yesterday. Ah. So keeping an eye on action around the grounds. We might go around the grounds <laughs> soon. Good running from Renshaw. Or straight away. <laughs> I do love that, that Guardian County blog. Did you keep the comments open below the line? Yeah. Yep. And um, actually, it was quite heartwarming to see. Um, someone mentioned that their partner was running in a marathon, uh, raising money for charity, and then you got quite a lot of people below the line um, uh, donating as well. Ah, exactly what you want. Maybe that's where I should advertise that I'm doing a run for the Lord's Taverners with 50 other runners up at Edinburgh in a couple of weeks. Why not? Lord's Taverners have been in operation for 74 years. Young people, disadvantaged and uh, disabled young kids, and that's they, they cricket's a massive part of, of the, the lives of these young people due to the Lord's Taverners and the bridge they provide. And we've got 50 people going up to Edinburgh for the half marathon as part of the Final Word podcast. So if you want to chuck in a a quid or two. We're trying to raise £30,000 as part of our collective efforts. You'll be able to find that in all the usual final word places. How are you going at the moment? I'm okay. I'm pretty relaxed about running a half marathon. I did one last year, but I don't quite have the ticker to sign up for the full 42 kilometres yet. I'm all meant the uh, funds raised, but oh, good, fund good to know about your physical condition. Yeah, well. okay, okay. Uh, Misread that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yep, all right, I'll cop that. I think we're, we're somewhere in the fives, five, yeah. five, five, so some way to go, but these things tend to... You can 
put a lot of pressure on people the closer you are to the run I found in the past. But your your ankle's holding up well. And yeah, all all the various body parts that are not not great for me are all vaguely okay. Had an interesting lunch just then, actually downstairs. Great company. Oh, beaten, yeah, good. Clark just on the angle in and seaming it away. Not rapid, so 77 mile an hour, but it hit the gloves hard, that's for sure. And Lamanby, he was faultless on day one until the point where he was dismissed. Wasn't far away from feathering that. Yeah, and it'll be the same tactic uh, that Kimar Roach is employing at the other end. Seeing it on the reverse angle here. He's got big on him. Two left-handers at the crease, so they're both going around the wicket at the moment, just trying to get a bit of movement away, bring those two slips into play. Man round the corner at a deepish leg gully as well. Better. Great timing from the balls of his feet out to the rope. His first boundary. The first boundary of Somerset's second innings, 11 for one. That completes the over. They trail by 132. Right on top of the bounce there and classy shot well put away. Especially given he was beating the ball before Taha. Yeah, and this is about Lamanby is, you know, he finds himself in the interesting dilemma of quite a long, quite a lot of young batters of having to try and play a sort of very different way in, in the white ball game. You, you know, here he's looking nice and organised, as he did in the first innings with his 100. And yet when you watch him t play T20 cricket, he'll be sort of moving around this crease, trying the ramps, just trying to use timing over power. And here he's just, you know, keeping his head still and... The economy of movement there was the thing to watch. Ooh, Roach probing. Had to play off stump line, nice and full. It hasn't missed out this year, Lamanby. 90 odd in the warm up game they played before the university game, another 90 there. And then 100 on, on day one here, and 90 last week at, at, uh, at Canterbury. So a good start to 2024. 24 years of age, so should be coming into the, the best time of his cricketing life as a, as a top order player. Shot for none. Yes, I mentioned my lunch downstairs. We won't talk about the food as such. It's always great here at Surrey. Don't want to be indulgent on that front. My company, as you say, The Guardian's live blog, which is always ma manned by Tanya Aldred, who's, who's an excellent uh, writer on, on the county game, day in, day out through the season. Yasrana, who's sharing lead commentary responsibilities with myself and Daniel Norcross today. And to compliment our, 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 uh, our table of four, Andrew Sampson is at the bench with us now. And the conversation went in various different directions. Existential angst about county cricket, because we have Ben Bloom on the stream and you know the book, and I interviewed him earlier as well. We were talking through all of that. We moved to affairs of state, global politics, and it culminated in Andrew Sampson um, singing a song to us um, about um, about nuclear obliteration. It was that kind of lunch. He didn't write it himself, I, I should add. A protest song from the 60s. What do you think worries you more? Um, the sort of nuclear situation or the demise of county cricket? It's like a hierarchy of needs, isn't it? Mm. We're all worried about the World Test Championship and where yeah. that might go in the future and where Test cricket might get squeezed out. We're all... Got an eye on what's happening in domestic cricket with the 18 counties and keeping things broadly as we'd like them. And then I suppose sitting on top of that is, uh, is global affairs, not to mention climate change it's in the mix as well. That's what Tanya also writes on, on cricket and climate change. That was part of our conversation too. Um, yes, a bit going on. But Samo singing, I, I can recommend it. Might ask him. He, I think he's on later in the session doing a little stint on, on colour. Warm up those vocal cords, Samo. You're going to be called upon. Memorise the... You, you just... Memorise maybe uh, two verses and one chorus. We'll give you 60 seconds to really let rip. Shot. Organised. It's a good player, Tom Lamanby. 
double figures, second boundary since the long break. Five from the over moves them along to 16 for one. They're 127 in arrears. Played a nice shot to cover earlier in the over where he showed that balance, and this time he just managed to find the gap. Mm. Healthy crowd in here today. Maybe not quite as many as yesterday. Sunday afternoon. In hindsight, it feels odd that as recently as I think 2017 or 2018, we weren't playing county cricket on Saturdays. All the rounds were starting on Sunday. So it was a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then we went to a model of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday until last season. But now we're back to starting on Fridays for this part of the season. And I simply say that to note that there were a lot of Sundays where we didn't see cricket because it was day four and, and often the games had been wrapped up in three and we didn't get both days of the weekend later in the season. We've got some games starting Sunday, some starting Monday. But it's best when you can get the full weekend in, ideally. This time of year, people really want it. Especially in the sort of first game back, it's kind of... feels like people have been waiting for... The months and then the sun comes out and yeah the oval was sort of just has a sort of different energy to the rest of London mm. and the rib cage of Lamaby well negotiated for one yeah, the other Rounds around the country, all, all, they all have their own energy, don't they? And you sort of know how it feels when going to a smaller, more intimate ground compared to a test playing venue. I watch a little bit of Sheffield Shield cricket in the winter, not as much as I used to when I lived in Australia, but when I'm back for the test, I'll often drop into a day or two, and it doesn't feel the same as this because the MCG with a thousand people in it, not to say there's a thousand here right now, an awful lot more than that, but often it is at uh, the MCG or the SCG, yeah, something like 500 to 1,000 people. There may as well be nobody there. There's such huge cavernous stadiums. It does echo uh, at, at the G as well, when you, when you can hear the players and their voices reverberate around the ground when they're encouraging the bowlers. Shout across his stumps. Finger stays down. Umpire Kettlebrook officiating at the pavilion end. Renshaw went all the way across, but with Clark on the angle, that's where the benefit of doubt was. We'll see it again, Taha. Yeah, he went quite a long way across here, Matt Renshaw. And it's, it's not a bad shot at all. It was Ooh. full as well. So height, probably not a factor there. Maybe just going down. Just trending. Maybe if we were, you know, overlaying it with a DRS projection, it might be one of those where it was yeah. clipping the leg stump. Just lost the touch of balance there. I did think sort of after lunch with two left-handers at the crease, Rory Burns might have been tempted to just keep down Lawrence on for a couple more overs. See what, what he could do with spinning the ball away from the bat. But <laughs> you can't really argue against going to sort of a try, tried and tested formula of uh, Jordan Clark and Kemar Roach. Especially with Roach to the left-handers. Short to finish, 18 for 1. 125, the deficit for Somerset. Yeah, really keen on this this Lawrence, this emerging Lawrence bowling story this year. I think, I think it has been. And Phil Walker did a good job of explaining this yesterday. The the Dan Lawrence whisperer that uh, yeah, when he actually reaches the point of release, if you ignore everything that comes before it, he looks like a, a conventional finger spinner. It's the five or six paces before where it it looks a certain way, and I think people have arrived at conclusions about his bowling on that basis and they think, oh, he's part-timer. Unusual. But he's always insisted that his bowling is, is serious and it's looked at so far this year. 
approach again. Interesting note yesterday as well, I think during one of the breaks that uh, Lawrence was working with Gareth Batty uh, on his bowling out there in the middle. Um, and Gareth Batty was looking quite animated and I don't know, I don't think I've seen that too much over the last couple years here, dur just during breaks between play when bowlers have been having a bowl. Um, they were just It was just them two, one on one, working together. So it's a real big project in the works. Hmm. And really does feel like the best way back to the England team for Lawrence in, in the short term is that there might be a, a way where that Pakistan series later this year, if they want to go in with a, a whole group of batting all-rounders as they did in 2022 at work then, it'll be the same leadership in place there. Stokes is fitness pending, but, you know, Stokes is bowling himself. I saw on, on Twitter a couple of days ago, he had his full run. So if they get what they want out of out of the captain with the ball, they'll have space for more spinning options in the eleven. Definitely, I mean, uh, I mean, the bowling will be a key part for Lawrence, surely, in in terms of trying to get back into that test team. But maybe must be a touch of frustration in in batting at, at six here at the moment. Um, I mean, that mm. just speaks to the riches of Sarang's batting lineup. And when you know the test summer does start, I'm sure he will, if he is. Uh, if he himself isn't called up, he'll be sort of moving up that order. Mm. Hit well by Lemonby. But Clark to his right. Just uh, going just slightly back to your point regarding playing the Sheffield Shield in front of sort of an MT, MCG. I was just, my mind went back to England Lions over the winter. I think they played India A at the Narendra Modi Stadium, which is obviously <laughs> <laughs> has a capacity of 130,000 people. Oh, I don't think that many people were there. 80,000 um, if there's 80,000 capacity. <laughs> I've been there. It's not 130,000, believe me. And it's great PR from uh, from the powers that be. I think one one end says 110, the other end says 132. Okay. So there's a bit of mayonnaise going on somewhere there. So actually, it's a 250, 60. Yeah, count. you've got it. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there was a. There was a. Uh, I don't know why I couldn't do the numbers there. <laughs> there was. There was the. Um, <laughs> 22. The World Cup final uh, number, where you know it was meant to be the, and, and clearly was the, the hardest ticket to get, in India. I mean. Quicky shingle through to finish. Again, good running from Lamanby. Purposeful since lunch. He's 13, 18, make that 19 for one. Trial by 124. So for all the hype around there, not being a ticket short of, you know, pick your number, how much those those were going for on the um, on the resale market. The, the number of people who were actually reported to be there was still less than the World Cup final of 2015 by about a 1,000. <laughs> so I rest my case. I rest my case. Anyway, you're right. Even at eighty or ninety thousand people, <laughs> having an a, an A game there at the yeah. at the Modi Stadium, that, that would have that would have stood out. Got a nice email that's come in. Uh, might be not a bad time to read that. Sorry, broadcast at gmail.com from Lee in the USA. Helped down to sh fine leg. Just took a moment for for Lawrence to pick up the trajectory but it's there in the end 20 for one single ladder dear Dan Adam Phil Felix Yaz Taha rest of your commentary team he said nice things about us I won't read them out I'm a Surrey supporter living in Philadelphia the heart of cricket country in the 19th and 20th century in America when I'm not watching Surrey I turn up at Philadelphians matches or I visit my sister in Dallas where we watch the Texas Super Kings there you go the super um, straight drive and doesn't quite sneak it through. What's it? Major League Cricket, isn't it? The, the Dallas Super Kings. The Texas Super Kings, sorry. I was introduced to cricket by a West Indian colleague housemate in the 1990s. I started learning the game from the internet and Crick Info, watching one day as my first in-person match was Surrey versus Knotts at Guildford in 2000 on holiday. And that's why they're my team. My love of the game went into overdrive in the summer of 2005 when I lived in Ireland and I hung on every ball of that unforgettable Ashes series. I'm so glad to have your bro broadcast to help me follow Surrey and pick it up and pick up so many nuances of the game that I might have learnt in boyhood 
if I grew up with somewhere cricket was popular or if I was here, say, 150 years ago, where, of course, cricket was a pretty big deal in, in Philadelphia then. Uh, my wife and I go to cheer on the USA against Canada. Are going to, sorry, cheer on the USA against Canada at the T20 World Cup curtain raiser, where I will raise a shine a bock in your general direction for your contribution and love and knowledge of the game. If you feel like it, you can give a shout out to the newly formed St Ignatius School Cricket Club where my son is a charter member and where I share my enthusiasm for the great old game with a bunch of cricket loving kids who only knew baseball previously. All the best, Lee. What a lovely email. Surreybroadcast at gmail.com. For all your correspondence. Shot. Renshaw's turn to play through the onside to the longer boundary, but it doesn't matter. The timing's perfect. Renshaw to double figures with his first four. This pair batted so well together, putting on 178 on day one. They've added 26 here. That's the score, 26 for one. Yeah, this was a shot he was meaning to play a couple of overs ago, where there was the LBW shout, but this time just a touch straight. It only sort of didn't fall over on his head, kept his head still, and clipped lovely through mid-wicket. Rides the bounce. Yes, so that, that World Cup opener, the, uh, the uh, USA-Canada game, on the f it's on the 1st of June uh, in Dallas. I'm going over for that one. I'm doing that game. Quite looking forward. We're, we're sort of flying in for 24 hours in Dallas and leaving again to go to New York for the for the for what I'm sure is going to be absolute chaos <laughs> <laughs> over the following 10, game, 10 days, including India-Pakistan. Which is in New York, but also not in New York. Is I that mean, right? It's kind of near the airport, I think. Nassau County. Leaves alone seven from it. 26 for one trail by 117. So a, a pop-up stadium. Uh, it depends how you want to interpret the distance. But let's say about 90 minutes by car from what you consider to be the, the middle of New York City or something like that. And the stadium is being built. We keep getting these. I don't know if you're getting the media releases demonstrating the progress, like the time-lapse vision and so on. What are we now? Uh, six weeks to go, a lot of work to do. Okay. A lot of work to do, to the naked eye anyway. It's a bit like an Olympic Games where you're kind of watching the stadium get built three days before they walk out. There might be a little bit of that going on there in, in this ground, but um, they've sold a lot of tickets. Certainly that India-Pakistan game will be sold out and they're playing them at 9.30 in the morning to fit in with the Indian TV schedule. So it's going to be early starts for us doing our thing but will mean that we kind of get out of there pretty early and can explore New York and have some fun as well. Yes, yeah, nothing like a T20 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, people are really up for it. Yeah. I did a series in Zimbabwe a few years ago where every game started at 9am each day, 9am in a tri-series. Freezing cold, middle of winter. Really opens up the afternoon though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, enjoyed that week in, in Harare. <laughs> Have you thought about trying to nip over to any of the World Cup? Is that something you pitch to your new bosses? Uh, no, I imagine I'll I'll uh, I'll be in these parts. A few uh, OBOs, a few live blogs. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully that's the case. Nine a.m. makes for a good start here. That's true, actually. What will, what will that be? Uh, nine in the morning in the states. Is that quite quite deep into the night here? It's, a, it's, that it's right? a nice afternoon start here. Afternoon, I've got the wrong way around, have I? Two o'clock, okay. Time, despite how much I travel, time zones aren't my strong suit. Yeah, the... That very dedicated Guardian OBO community. Always emailing in, keeping you on your toes. I'm sure plenty of them are, are listening right now. Some of the most dedicated cricket fans I've ever happened upon have been working on that on that live blog. J 
gentle breeze today, blowing over Roach's right shoulder as he works away from us at the Vauxhall end. What a great career. Think about Kemar Roach coming out here as a young man in 2012 and roughing up a young, jo young Johnny Bairstow. Feels an eternity ago, but the fact that they're still going around a dozen years later. Yeah, and it's pretty quite special watching uh, over the winter when, when the West Indies did beat Australia. And of course, the, the focus was very much on what Shamar Joseph did and mm. sort of a young team and the kind of history they'd made. But I, I couldn't help but, you know, focus on Kemar Roach during those celebrations because he's been the he's been the Red Bull battler for all these years. Of course, mm. you know, there's so much talent in the West Indies that is focused on T twenty cricket and very understandably so and Roach has sort of gone the other way really. He he really cares about Red Bull cricket. You know, he's become a sort of sorry stalwart. Still going strong for West Indies' test side. Again, that's through the onside from Lamanby. Gets it on the hip. He's looked really good since lunch. To 20 with his fourth boundary, 30 for one. They trail by 113. A, a timely moment to take a look at a quick package of the way that Lamanby played in the first innings. We'll see that after the replay of the boundary here. But on day one, Lamanby made it an even 100. And he couldn't have batted much better. Just a touch short there from Kemar Roach. Here we go, back from the first morning. That was early on, wasn't it? Through the offside and used the width of Lawrence there. When I think of the way that he played in 2020 in that Bob Willis Trophy final, I think of that cover drive or those cover drives. There were many of them at Lords. Stand and deliver. You mentioned that T20 game that he's got and those skills that he can make good balls into scoring opportunities and he gives it absolutely everything when you drop short you can see why there's been a lot of interest in Tom Lamanby have that smack it straight back at Clark there pulling down the ground as unusual as that is so Atkinson gets his first opportunity of this second innings picked up three wickets in a hurry on afternoon one during that dramatic collapse of seven for 20. Just back to Lamb and be there mm. for a second. I mean, because what, what just stands out there really is not, not, not a great deal of foot movement. He's just keeping the head still, letting the hands do the work. That final shot there in that highlights package, that bludgeon down the ground was, uh, was pretty special. Just on Roach as well. I think you want a lot of fans over here interested in your perspective on this as well. In the in the pandemic series, when the Windies came out and played three test matches, when it was a pretty tough time to come to the UK, they went through all sorts of rigorous quarantine requirements to just to get out and play cricket, living in sort of a very sterilised environment in hotels. But Roach helped bowl them to victory in that first test down at Southampton, which Stokes was actually captaining. And then I think he picked up his 200th test wicket in the final match as well. And again, what you say there about a player who's prioritised test cricket and red ball cricket more widely, his fourth stint here at Surrey. Something of a household name in these parts. And yeah, the, 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 the affection that's there for him across the cricketing world. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about that series again. I think the West Indies may have been, not, this is beyond cricket, I think they were one of the first sporting sides to just tour a order in the pandemic. Mm. It, was, it was early on, still very much in lockdown. And, and Jason Holder was another person who got a lot of plaudits for his, um, his leadership on that tour. And he's playing cat cricket at the moment as well at Worcestershire. Mm. Um, having actually skipped that West Indies test series against Australia. Oh, squared up to 
didn't have much of a clue where that was going, Lamanby, but does get a boundary for it. We'll see it again. It was a decent clip from Atkinson. Through about fifth slip. And that was the one sort of poor shot we've seen from Lamanby so far. Again, mm. we talk about the stillness over there. That probably didn't help him. He sort of just sort of flung the bat at it a bit. Kind of got away with it. Another edge, but played with soft hands, and it sneaks through as well. And it doesn't quite reach the rope. Diving stop at the last. Back for a couple. That'll complete the over. Some tidy work from Camp Steel. Yeah, Camp Steel beneath us here. Just lost it there in front of our screen. So nine runs from the over. We're going to have a change in commentary. I believe, or maybe we're not. I thought we were going to. I'll crack on. They can work out what's happening um, behind me here. I can tell you that Jason Holder got a duck yesterday. Just had that pop up on my screen. Yeah, interesting, isn't it, that, that Holder didn't want to play against Australia in the Test Series, but is playing four-day cricket still. I took that as a tacit acknowledgement that he was finished as a red ball player full stop and he was just going to have to do his thing on the circuit. But there you go. No, I think he made it clear that he still wanted to be playing test cricket. There's a bit of a commotion here. It's, uh, getting some Matt getting Ranchel. some lids brought out, possibly. Yeah, Ranchel's running off for a, a toilet break. Oh, yeah, so he is. Which reminds me of... Mornay Morkel. Off over the fence. Away he goes, into the... Into the Famously, where Mornay Morkel, when playing a test match here at the Oval, when he was dismissed, walked straight in there into the uh, into the groundsman's hut, as opposed to up the stairs into the bed to stand. He worked it out, of course. Mornay Morkel, legend of Surrey, played in the 2018 winning team. Another e email in here. G'day, Colo. Watching late night Sunday in Melbourne. That's good, aren't it? That, that's nice. I love that about these streams going around the world on YouTube. A <laughs> very disappointing loss by the Hawks against the Suns, but loving the broadcast. I agree. From what I saw of it yesterday, Hawthorne were appalling. But no one wants to hear me complain about the footy. Um, that's from Matt. Hello, Matt. We're a team that's rebuilding at the moment. To a bunch of 18, 19, 20-year-olds playing, and they're, they're not quite there. Okay. Matt Ranch there he is. <laughs> Speaking of... Uh, I think I'm right interest. saying that Matt Renshaw once famously took a toilet break in a test match. Oh, India. yes, he did. We were for at... Which, uh, for which he... Where were we? We were in um, Pune. Pune 2017, his first test away from home. Yeah, and, and he was batting really well. And he received a lot of criticism, right? Alan Border got stuck into it. Yeah, no. So he, he has... As I interviewed Matt about this later. I'll, I'll leave out the colourful language. But he's like, I don't really know what Alan Border was expecting of me. Did he want me to uh, poo myself on an international cricket field? Was that what he was asking of me to do? Um, so he got ill. He retired ill. It is going to be Daniel jumping in for me, um, which we'll do now. I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, he came back later and made 70. All's well that ends well. But, yes, caught some grief at the time. Uh, Daniel, with you after this. I don't think that's a thought I want to be left with. But, uh, thank you very much, Helen. Dan Lawrence now, back into the attack. Having Two lefties. The, uh, Two lefties to bowl up. And this, I, this is why I assumed he'd sort of carry on straight after lunch. Rory Burns has, has waited a while. Well, I guess, as a bit of a hopeful appeal, that I guess he's thinking if this ball's going to do anything for the sw swing and seam bowlers, it'll do it when it's new. But it hasn't really, has it? No, I mean, a touch of movement for, for Roach, I thought. Um, but he was also sort of trying to find his, his length. It's a nice little tickle. There is no one down the fine leg boundary so a fruitless chase in the end nicely played just waiting for the ball play it late there's no short fine leg either it's quite an unusual field really in that respect there are no boundary riders four fielders in the ring on the offside as you can see from that wide angle there's nobody behind square on the leg side so 
all that was needed from Renshaw was just to wait and tickle it fine. Oh, now that looks close. And up goes the finger. So Lawrence has got the extraordinary figures of two for four in nine balls. He's made the breakthrough. He made the initial breakthrough going the right-handed Dixon out down the leg side. This time he traps Renshaw, LBW, went on the sweep, didn't get anything on it, and it looked pretty bang in front from here. We'll see on the replay, no doubt. But the uh, second wicket goes down much earlier in this innings than it did in the first innings for Somerset. So a much-needed breakthrough. And Dan Lawrence has done it again. That's his sixth wicket of the season. As we take a look at this replay, from behind, it's a little bit more tricky to see. When we get the front-on angle, we'll get a slightly better view of it. Folks has barely moved. There was a lot of excitement, as there will be. Good stride in. Yes, but it's not going to go over the top, you wouldn't have thought. And Lawrence didn't turn around. He was that confident. He'd been a bit too leg side ish with those first two deliveries and just got it a few inches to the right with his very next one and I think Renshaw got almost a bit too excited with Lawrence's line <laughs> from those first two deliveries and thought you know I'll cash in here short boundary no men back and so it's, it's worked out pretty well there clever captaincy perhaps I'd say I was thinking why isn't there a short fine leg or even a, a, a deep fine leg but he's encouraging Renshaw to play the sweep isn't he and if you miss and it's straight then you're out we get a really good view from here with the super slow-mo, it pitches in line. Probably hit him in line with off stump. Might be umpire's call on line, but umpires often give on that shot anyway. How many times have you been out? Uh -huh. LBW just because you played the sweep. I mean, I'm not saying that's happened here. That looked pretty out, but... I think I struggle to get down that low, to be honest. Um, really? Yeah. Young fit man like you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> um... Because there's something about it that makes it look more out. You know, if the balls hit the pad exactly the same way, but you're on the front foot playing a forward defence, for some reason, anybody watching gets that out. We all did. We all went up in the box. I sort of feel slightly differently. I kind of think oh. uh, when someone plays a sweep, I think just because there's so much going on, I'm not really thinking about the LBW. Oh, you think it might be a bit of bat, a bit of glove? Just wondering how anyone can get that low. <laughs> But back to Dan Lawrence. So he has six wickets this season. Cameron still has nine. Fifteen wickets to spin. Has that surely already gone past what they produced last season? Seventeen last season. Wow, nine in the last nine in the last innings of last season. So Surrey have taken twenty-two wickets this season, but only twenty-one of them to bowlers. Of course, because there was that run out. 15 have come to spin, 15 out of 21, or five sevenths, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> now, the new bat is Lewis Goldsworthy. Pretty much the remainder of Somerset's batting lineup, with the exception of Lewis Gregory, didn't have a great time of it in the first innings because there was that enormous collapse. Just Renshaw, Lamanby, and Lewis Gregory really impressing. There's a slightly different proposition here for the off spinner bowling to the right hander. This looks like it's going to be Surrey's method, though. Spin at one end. Pace at the other. Atkinson and Overton perhaps pounding in from the pavilion end. Although Cameron still got his wickets from the pavilion end, didn't he, in the, I think, in the first innings? That's a nice bit of work from the skipper a bit off there, sprawling away to his right and managing to keep his hat on. Um, what can you say? A brief goodbye. It's a hard, but you'll be back later, I, t I take it. It was short, but but fun. Yeah, no, that, I will be. I want to see if you can bend down now and tie your shoelaces. No, no, I don't think anyone wants to see that. <laughs> so if you want to get in touch with us, surreybroadcast at gmail.com. That's how to email us, surreybroadcast at gmail.com. With any of your, your thoughts, 
your observations. Anything you'd like to ask Andrew Sampson? He's in the house and he's come up with some corking responses to a variety of um, esoteric questions so far. Yaz Rana has sat down alongside me. Did you see what I meant by the, the rotor? Yes, I yes. did. I did. And then I found this and yes, there was it's some sort of miscommunication somewhere. Yeah, so there's two rotors. The line. Yeah, mm. very confusing. Can't go on like that. Atkinson's continuing. Picked up three wickets in the first innings. And I think that's the template here for Surrey, isn't it? Pace and spin. And that's the template for the Kookaburra ball, generally speaking. Oh, it looks like very much the case. I mean, two huge wickets for, for Lawrence early on in the Somerset second innings. Already exposing that Somerset middle order that does not have Tom Abel in it. And not just no Tom Abel, no Tom Cola Cadmore, who's sitting on the bench in the IPL at the moment for Rajasthan Royals. What is the most Tom heavy squad? Is it Sussex? There's a lot of Toms at Sussex. I can think of two at Sussex Clark and Haynes. Is that not another one? Feels like another one. That feels Tom heavy because they, they bat next to each other. Yeah, that could be it. Tom heavy. <laughs> Tom and top heavy. That's what indeed. I'll take you around the grounds. If you like, Essex against Kent. Big game. Fierce rivals. Ben Compton is still there. 140 not out. And Surrey fans will be willing him to keep going because if Kent can get up to 400 or so. It'll make it difficult for Essex, you would think, to force a result. There's plenty of time left, of course, but the weather that is likely to be around here tomorrow is also likely to be around in and around Chelmsford. So um, a lot of rest on those last three wickets. 3.39 for seven, Kent, in response to 530 for seven. Another good day for members of the Matt Critchley fan club. Three for 78 with oh. a leg spin. Three for and 100. Five for and 100 for leg spinners. <laughs> Andrew Sampson. I suppose Richie Benno might have done it at some point. I suppose there'll be a few. Shade of Freedy. Who, whose first class, whose test record, rather, always surprises me. Averages 36 for the bat Ooh. in test cricket. Higher than you thought? Yeah, higher than, than I thought. I mean, he has been responsible for some of the most brainless dismissals <laughs> I've ever witnessed in my life, but... The worst one was in the test that he captained against Australia yes. at Lords. Caught a deep mid. And he pretty much retired on the spot he after did. that shot. <laughs> oh, now that spat a bit. It's an indication of Atkinson. Well, his high arm as much as anything else. He's got a wonderful trajectory. The speed gun only has it at 78. I, I, it felt a bit quicker than that to me. Mm. I think at times today we've seen signs of bit of inconsistent bounce. That one rising a bit more than Tom Lambie anticipated. A couple of balls that Jamie Overton faced this morning that kept a bit low. Surrey would like to see more and more of that mm. this afternoon. The third day pitch we're on now. Elsewhere in the first division, Hampshire Lancashire. That's a tight old struggle. Hampshire 367, Lancashire 378 for five. Keaton Jennings is gone. Be W to Dawson for 172. He's just fallen in the previous over, so Bell's still there, unbeaten on 68. Hurst has joined him. Lancashire will be looking to bat long there and heavily, you would imagine. And just on Lanks and England and Lancashire related update from the IPL, Phil Sol 83 not out for KKR today. Going very, very well for a KKR side who are second in the table. How many balls was that one? 43. <sighs> Tasty. Now that's turned that one be round a little bit. It indicates a little bit of spin for Lawrence. We'll have his tail up. We've got two for four. Having whipped out both openers. Which is, a, I would suggest, quite a rarity for an off-spinner to have whipped out both openers with the score <laughs> under 50. It will have, again, it will have happened, but it's just one of the curios that we're seeing. I 
we were talking earlier about the difference between show Bashir and a more conventional county finger spinner. We were saying that Bashir is noticeably quicker through the air. Mm. With Lawrence, I think it's notable how much side spin he gets. I don't think at this stage in his bowling career he's as accurate as the top finger spinners. There are quite a few deliveries that are over pitched that I don't think Somerset have punished enough actually. But he asks questions with the with that side spin he gets. And it is such an idiosyncratic action. It you sort of think he's bowling googlies. <laughs> I mean it's off spin, but and googlies are off spinners, but I suppose it's just the amount of moving parts. I would say if you can have a slightly strange action, it gives you a little bit of an advantage for the batter in, in terms of their trigger movement and how they set up. You know, the obvious examples being people like Malinga and Bumra, you know. Oh, I say. Good leave. That is a terrifically good leave. That was very close to off stump. Wouldn't have looked good if it had shaved it, would it? Take a quick look at it again. Bit of turn, kept it away. Mm. He read it well, did Lambie. Has he got the arm ball? Can he beat it back into him now? And on his action, it's not just idiosyncratic. When his arms go up, he almost hides the ball behind mm. his head momentarily. So it's not just that it's unusual. It'd be great if he had some more variations. He yeah. Slightly change the position a bit in his hand. Who was the bowler that used to actually turn the ball round in his hand as he ran in so that it changed the shiny side? You could see the shiny side one minute. Oh, is there anything on that? A little bit of inside edge, maybe drifting down the leg side. So, so asking questions here is Dan Lawrence. Nice little loop. Yep, definitely going on past the leg stump. And that very natural action as well. I, I wonder if part of the reason why he gets so much action and side spin off the ball is because of those arms doing all the leverage. It sort of forces the body to really come through, get those fingers around the ball. You get nice sort of loop, doesn't he? Spitters in April at the Oval since 2014, before the current match. So nine years worth, although no play in 2020 in April. 13 matches. Sixty-five wickets. Not a lot of wickets in a way. Five wickets a game. But at forty-two point nine eight. So it rather speaks actually to the high scoring Aprils that we've discovered that spitters were having to be used, but they weren't penetrative. There have been a total of fifteen fifers in those games but only one by a spinner, Simon Harmer. Took five for 88 in 2019. Cam Steele nearly, and there's four in the first innings. Give us some more scores. We're not finished with the first division yet. Warwickshire against Durham. Oh. Durham are now in a spot of bother, <laughs> which they have been in the entire match, if truth be told. But Warwickshire, you will recall, posted that mammoth, almost high-wateringly ludicrous 698 for three declared. Durham in reply, now 334 for six. Birthday boy Alex Lees went for 145. The other, Ollie Robinson, got 60. Benningham, 49. But Clark's still there on 36. Ben Rain is there on three. He can hold the bat. But after that, it's Potts, Bowl and Parkinson. So you would imagine, with, as they say, weather around, Warwickshire would be looking to enforce the follow-on. You would think, but you never know. They might think, hour and a half, to put your feet up, and then, if that means that's if they get these last four wickets relatively quickly. But, you know, what you, you want, you've got to be bowling at them again today, haven't you, really, mm. either way. So it's a, quite a tricky one. They've balanced the, the overs pretty well there. Chris Washworth's only bowled 14 overs. Craig Miles, similarly. Oh, yeah. Robbie Yates, who has scored a lot of runs, and his part-time off spin bowled 25 overs. So, actually, yeah. those seamers should be pretty well rested. 
Because they've used eight bowlers in total. Which again, I think, speaks to the sort of toothlessness of the Kookaburra ball. And uh, Nottinghamshire Worcestershire. This is a game that could do with a fifth day, you fancy. Nottinghamshire 399, Worcestershire 355, so a slender lead of just 44. Nottinghamshire yet to bat. They'll get out there with half of day three gone, so they'll need to bat till around about lunch. Oh, it's just fallen short, just I think. Fallen short. Yeah, for a moment I thought he might have picked that one up, but it's an authentic edge off the bowling of Atkinson. And instantly, Jamie Overton has gone handed a jumper over. I think he might be I think he might be bowling before too long. It's another one that's and kept a bit low. Yeah. It's only around knee roll height. That was decent length from Atkinson. He's bowled really well, I think, in this short spell so far. Took a while to get into his rhythm in the first innings, but once he got going, was a real thorn in Somerset's side. It's a real test now for the Somerset middle order. The top order got themselves into, into an excellent position for that spectacular collapse on the first day. Lawrence will continue. Question for you, Dan. Do you think the way that Ben Stokes has managed spin will filter down into the championship, you know, just looking at that field that Lawrence had for Lamanby there. There's no one out on the leg side. That's a short boundary, mm -hmm. really enticing the, the batter to, to have a go. There's, there's a fielder back now for the right-hander. There's a deep point, but still no one deep at all on the leg side. No one even deep-ish. Well, I, I mean, a lot of it is about communicating faith, isn't it? And Stokes did that, possibly, to an extreme degree with Tom Hartley on the first day of the series. It worked for him. But we were scratching our heads a bit when he was mm. nine overs for 63, weren't we? And I think if you're not watching that much of it with Stokes, sometimes you look at the figures of the spinners and think, oh, they're not bowling particularly well. But there are times Hartley was bowling just without anyone at mid-on, which is something he would have never done before. And I think, actually, as we saw across the series, particularly in the first innings, Stokes actually became a bit more conventional as the series went on. Well, I think for England captains, it is, it is more difficult than for most. I asked Alistair Cook this question for a podcast for the BBC. And I wasn't surprised by his answer, but it, it was quite an, an insight into the thinking. So I asked him, I said, is it a particular challenge captaining England in India? Because, you know, spin isn't always the most effective in England anyway, but you will play with a spinner, but their role is, is different. When you go to India, you're always playing at least two spinners. So you're always going to have a spinner who's inexperienced, at the very least, because that's just, just, just the arithmetic, folks. So I said to him, did you find that difficult? What, what were you, you were thinking about that? And he said, at the end of the over, I thought, number two, he said, that's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> and I thought, well, it sort of is, but, it, but it's also, I suppose, it is so strange that not very many England captains can get it right. And what's... So illuminating about Stokes is he seems totally unfazed by that challenge. He knows that spinners are going to be important, so he thinks, well, I've got to pump up your tyres. He's hostile. I think that's exactly it. I think Stokes' first day of that series was like, Tom Hartley is going to have to play a role for me this series. So how he goes today is secondary to how he feels at the end of the day. He has to feel like he is valued. And we saw in that first test, obviously the series did not go England's way, but Hartley, after being stumped really on his first evening as a test bowler, wins England that test three days later. 
Now, just want to point out here that the second slip is very, very far advanced. Jamie Overton of first slip. Dominic Sibley is in a pretty conventional first slip standing behind the, the keeper situation or position. But Jamie Overton, after being just too deep for the edge the previous over, you can see there from from that picture just how far ahead he is. That's a lovely shot. Nothing more than a push. It was a little full, but the full face of the bat, body so still. That is a shot, if you don't mind me saying so, of a short batsman. Mm. You, you see that so often. No follow through, no flourish. Take a look at it again. It's a wonderful shot. Sees the gap, knows it's there, puts back to ball. But yeah, getting back to our slip here, Dom Sibley's there, I suppose, for the thin-edged full drive. Whereas Overton's there for the one that's going to take a bit more of the bat. And when, when it does that, it's tended to land a little short on this placid surface. I'm going to do a shout-out. Shout-out. To Tim Stowe, who's in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, what a time to be alive. <laughs> I'll tell you what he says, our correspondent. He says, I'm a Brit based in Atlanta and was interested to hear the email just read out from Philadelphia. I actually played a few times up in Philadelphia where I lived in the 1990s. More generally, the recent development of USA cricket is quite something to get one's head around. <laughs> Always is, actually, the development of, of USA cricket is there's, you know, quite the tome to be written about that. Peter Della Pena could be the man to do it. Come back to the email in a moment. Oh, another hostile ball. Feels slightly bullying, doesn't it, when someone of Atkinson's stature and pace comes at a at Goldsworthy, who's a slightly more diminutive prospect. And he's oh, laid him on the floor. That's really not that high. No, it wasn't that high. We could borrow a little bit fuller and get it quite high, can't you, to the shorter batter. Just to continue from Tim Stowe, it's quite something to get one's head around the development of cricket in uh, the USA. As compared to days gone by, the MLC, Major League Cricket, was certainly impressive. Oh, goodness me. Was certainly... <laughs> I thought we kept that secret. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, my word. That is, again, a great leave. A cake has been brought into the box. If I, you, I don't know how many times I've said, just bring me <laughs> wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind, all of you. You've got a knife. I'm feeling a little peckish, actually. You're going to sing a what? I'm not singing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> At the end of the over, perhaps. I've got to, fin I've got to finish Tim Stowe first. He's making a very interesting point about American cricket. The MLC, Major League Cricket, was certainly impressively put together last year. And now for the T20 World Cup. Not exactly moving the needle compared to the normal US sports, but the sports considerable backers must know something not immediately obvious to others. Oh, my word. That's also nearly got through, showing all the stumps. Lamanby. He goes on to say, it'll be very interesting to see how the T20 World Cup is covered here by the mainstream media, beyond it just being a temporary curiosity. Another interesting thing is going to be the journalists who arrive in America saying they're here to work and being asked, what are you working on? <laughs> the cricket. OK. <laughs> What's the cricket? <laughs> I imagine about 140 years ago that could probably got you deported or put in jail. <laughs> it's probably a crime against America. So, yes, folks, it is my birthday and my lovely colleagues have brought me in a superb cake with the words happy birthday written on it. I don't know where they... And they managed to rustle it up from. Oh, that's nicely played. There is, again, no one at short, fine leg. As Burns is leaving that open, so the perilous sweep can be played. But Lamanby's 
Got enough on that, picked up a couple. Where did you get it from? Tesco. Tesco. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> other, other supermarkets are available. <laughs> oh, I don't have to say that, do I? It's not the BBC. <laughs> Although it is true that there are other, other supermarkets available. Oh, Tim Robinson. This is a good one. We've been talking through the day about height matching innings. So I'm going to leave this one to Adam Collins because he started this whole thing going, basically, have you ever scored your height? We established that Derek Randall did it in the centenary test. Tim Robinson is another option here with his 175 more from Yaz. And then it's going to be Adam Collins as I tuck into my cake. Tom set 56 for two. Tom Lambie continuing his excellent form from the first innings where he was out for around 100. Lewis Goolsworthy just making his way into his innings here. Six off 20. Finished the last over well with a sumptuous on drive off Gus Atkinson as we see a bowling change for Surrey. Cam Steele, who took four wickets in the first innings, coming on to bowl from the Mickey Stewart members pavilion end. Brilliant start to the season so far for Cam Steele. Five for 25 in the first round of games at Old Trafford. Followed up with a four for here. Finished the 2023 season with a four for uh, Hampshire as well. It's not quite the cake they had to give Asker when <laughs> there was the 50th anniversary of his test debut, is it? I mean, we've done OK. Yeah, it looks good. Happy birthday, dear Daniel. Happy birthday to you. Here he is, Cam Steele. Strong name, isn't it? Cam Steele. Could be a boxer. He said he's a leg breaker. Bowling all-rounder. And a man with a hot hand. Here we go, Daniel. Have your cake, mate. Eat it, too. Back goes Goldsworthy. Get a couple to the long boundary. No, just one. Roach sweeping. Feels like yesterday that Daniel turned 50. Evidently it's not. <laughs> I got a message in before, well actually I picked it up off Twitter from a regular correspondent of ours, Jack Rule, who's an absolute ripper of a fella. Does a lot of great work on women's cricket. And he relayed to us that the 14th of April was the day that Abraham Lincoln was shot in 1865. It was the day the Titanic went down in 1912. The day when the first Volvo was made in 1927. <laughs> Sweeping straight to the 45. And in 1969, the year that Daniel Norcross arrived on this planet. Good company to keep there. Well, you know, apart from the assassination of uh, the American president, but you know. At least it's noteworthy as a date. It sort of feels later in the innings than it actually is mm. by what Surrey are doing. Spin from both ends. G Gus Atkinson has already got a short and sharp spell done with. Four overs for 17, but mm. looks threatening. Just that subtle change of approach from Surrey this year. Throwing the ball to spinners earlier. We saw that... Lawrence bowled 10 of the first 30 overs at Old Trafford last week. No one had that on their bingo card. And still making the absolute most of this opportunity. We're talking about American cricket. I, I suppose he's still eligible to play for mm. the USA, Cam Steele, being born there. Before growing up in Australia, two runs taken from his first over, 58 for two. Somerset still 85 in arrears. I think Ollie Pope under the lid moved from short leg, that delivery, to a conventional mid-wicket and not wanting to waste any time kept the lid on for the final delivery of the over looks like Lawrence will continue so spin at both ends yeah I've been really impressed by Lambie this game and I think we're having, we're having a similar conversation about Dom Sibley on day one where because of what he's done at a certain age you sort of forget how old he is mm. He had so much success now four years ago, but he's still only 23. He's pretty much exactly the same age as Jamie Smith, and I think the two of them are, are talked about very differently, partly because of the success that Smith's had recently, but Ambi's still 23, done a lot of good stuff for a 23-year-old. It 
can lot often, of, sorry, you go. I was going to say, just a lot of high quality players on, on both sides in this game, and he's probably looked the most fluent at the crease. Yeah. Against a really high quality attack. Moves his feet well against the spinners. Got plenty of scoring options against the quicks. Looking something to be said for being in form at the right time of year. We've talked a little bit on the coverage across the three days about this being almost the best time to be making runs ahead of the, the test summer. Now the, the difference is that's worked through. I thought that was going to be cut off at mid-wicket but there'll be a single instead. Packed on side field with Lawrence Bowling. He's got two wickets already. Now there, there isn't the spots in the England team that there, there have been in other summers it could be said. Remember in both 2021 and 2022 where there were these eight week blocks of games. It was like well there are there are potentially spots to be won whereas there, there isn't a spot to be won this year just with the way things have broken down. If you go through Oh, where's that? What's that? It's not off bat. Just for a moment, with the body language, I thought it might have ballooned off something problematic for Lamb, but not to be. Whereas the, the only spot that's in in, in, in in flux, you could say, is, well, what are they going to do with Bearstow folks and so on? That wasn't far from the off stump either. But that's not the position that someone like Lamanby can make a run for. I'm mm. not to say for a second that he's in the frame for an England call-up right now, I, I should add, but just that a, a couple of years ago, a run like, you know, a, you know Twin Tons and a, well, Hasip Hamid, for example, oh, got back into the test team on the back of that. 100%. I mean, in, in 2021 in particular, it felt like any sort of run yeah. by any top-order player <laughs> was enough to, 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 to get a run in the, in the test side. I mean, yeah. Hasip Hamid effectively had one semi-decent start to the season. Yep. He was in. Um, he made twin hundreds at the perfect time. It was yeah. like a month before the squad was being announced, and then there was some. There was a vacancy through an injury from memory. But still, the fact that there's no other outside of the IPL. I mean, this is the cricket that's going on right now, right? And and people are watching it, and listening to it, and paying attention in ways that's much harder in the middle of the summer when there's three rounds in and around the blast. It's just more difficult to keep abreast of what's going on around the country. Square drive for four. It was up-ish, and it did go behind point, but Goldsworthy into double figures. 65 for two to end the Lawrence over, trailing by 78. See it again here. Yeah, Gus Atkinson at a backward point was briefly interested Goldsworthy driving away from his body, tossed up by Dan Lawrence, as he so often does. And Lawrence creating opportunities, six overs, two for 16. We're not seeing as, as much swing through the air from the seamers as we ordinarily would at this time of the year. Mm. The Duke's ball, so sorry, have turned to spin. It's got them the two breakthroughs so far. And not that far from a third one there as well. Still will continue. I think on, on your point, in this first block, narratives form much more easily than they do later on in the season. Or it used to work almost in reverse, where if you had a good game in the in the one day cup final to at the back of September you found yourself on an England tour. Mm. Trope in the eighties. Yeah, I agree. If if you you start well in April and May in this long block of four-day cricket. Direct hit will be interesting. No, not there. Let him be through. And in the context of this game as well, I think it's important that Somerset move the game on a bit. You know, really make serious inroads on that sorry lead. And Lambie's going nicely, striking well above 50 runs per 100 balls. Well, Lamaby, Lamaby was the beneficiary of that in 2020. Again, a lot of interest in the Bob Willis Trophy when it was being that, that truncated COVID season where there were, I think it was five group games plus the final, something like that. Not many games. Yeah, it must have been five because Lamaby hit three tons in six matches and one of those coming in a Lord's final that was on Sky and, you know, all the other bits and bobs that go with that against the high-quality Essex attack. 
doing that at 20. Like, okay, this is a guy worth paying attention to. Ooh. That might have been the wrong, and we're behind Steel at, or behind uh, Goldsworthy, I should say, at our end, but just on the, the way that he played it. And, and more your areas of expertise in mind, but sort of at the start of um, streaming really getting to the place where it is now so the county championship was a little bit more accessible players wouldn't ju sorry fans wouldn't just be reading the scores or reading about the scores they were watching it with their own eyes yeah 2020 was the first time that we really had more than the locked off cameras so i mean there was some streaming going on with the bbc commentary overlaid and that still is the case in some counties pre-pandemic but when suddenly it was like, well, the only way we can follow these games is via streams. Spectators weren't able to come in until fairly deep into 2021. I reckon, I reckon maybe the, the first eight weeks might have been all behind closed doors in, in 21, over complete single from it, 66 for two, trail by 77. Mm. That partnership's up to 23. That's where there was a, a good bit of competitive tension between the counties, something of an arms race when more cameras were being added in-house stream teams like what we're doing here where it's more a television style commentary as opposed to radio which is more in keeping with how you want to take in cricket when you've got the pictures there already you don't need to describe every single bit as you would on radio when you're watching and now it's just standard I think there's another day that stands out in my mind when streaming had to go to the next level. It was the day when Darren, Steven, Darren Stevens hit 190 um, against Glamorgan down at Canterbury and they just had the locked off cameras. So Steve O's pinging balls left, right and centre. Uh, and we didn't really, I mean, it, the, the, the streaming numbers were extraordinary. It felt like the whole world was watching what was happening in a Division 2 game, you know, down at Canterbury as Steve O was unleashing. But the inability to sort of completely capture it, I think that was a, a reminder to counties that this is actually a worthwhile product to invest in. And, and now we are a couple of years on from that. And I'd be surprised if any clubs are still running just the two camera operation now. I think stylistically as well, Lambie was a sort of player who'd always benefit from people actually watching how yes. he scores his runs. Yes, good point. Very easy on the eye. Um, and I guess the context was he, he scored those runs around the same time that Zach Crawley got in the England team was doing well. You had an Ashes tour 18 months away from that. And it wasn't outrageous at the time to think that, you know, if, hang on, if Lambie does this again. Mm, mm. Diminishing returns over the last few years, but clearly a player of class, as we've seen at the start of this new campaign. Speaking of Lambie, an email in from Robin Orkney. I like this. Very much enjoying the coverage. I note in the first innings that Lamanby scored his seventh first-class century, but has a highest score of 116. Is that the lowest highest score for someone with that many first-class tons or more? Not sure if Andrew Sampson is with you today. Be you better believe he is. He was singing at lunch. Are we, we hearing that later on? Well, I'm, I'm still keen. I've got, I've got a, I've got a little uh, WhatsApp in my um, phone that I, I might dig out later. We'll see. Um, not uh, if he is, if Samo is, which he is. I'm sure he'll have 30 examples off the top of his head. I don't know. Um, over to you, Andrew. Let us know whether with seven hundreds, if 116 is the lowest highest score. I'm getting, I'm getting kind of a. Get, oh, it's coming up now. Database calibrating. <laughs> That's just. That's just his brain ticking over, whirring, his onboard computer. Last ball here. Fraction short. Gap round the corner. Happy with the single, so the man in question, Lamanby, gets to 40, retains the strike. 69 for two. <laughs> yep, Andrew, hard at work. I think I know a Robin Orkney. I wonder whether it's the same one. I don't know. We'll see. You can get all your correspondence into surreybroadcast at gmail.com. Speaking of Samson, after you, Yaz, I think he's coming on for a spot of summarising. Oh, nice. A bit of colour, which we do once a day. We just, we, we just uh, 
give him a little little gallop. And that's the time to get... This is the time, actually. Your rarities and oddities, all the questions that you want answered, start firing them through. Surrey broadcast at gmail.com and we'll churn through a few with Andrew Sampson and Daniel Norcross when he jumps on. Good ball to start there from Steele, above the eye line. That, that dip and drift that we saw a lot last week at Old Trafford from him. He wasn't relying on jagging wrongans back through the gate as he did to Colin Cadmore and Ben Mike here a couple of years ago. More conventional league spinner wickets. Getting it up and down. Good response from Lamanby. Yeah, I think there's a point to be made with the structure of the Surrey attack. Their seam attack is so strong that the role of the spinner is slightly different to that of a conventional spinner in that you don't really need at Surrey for, th for the spinner to bowl particularly long spells. They are wicket-taking options, primarily wicket-taking options. Quite a lot of the time in county cricket, you feel like the spinner is almost there as a filler, mm. someone to keep an end tight. Bold again, really good. But good. sorry, sorry, so reliable are the many different bowling options. You don't, you don't have to bowl the spinners for that long if you don't need to. Mm -hmm. They are there to take wickets there and then. He's started exceptionally well here still. The dip on that previous delivery, getting heaps of work on the ball. Does so again here. I wouldn't call him a massive turner of it, but just enough, and consistent enough. That interesting story via, I mentioned born in America, via Australia, grew up in West Australia, played 17s over there in Durham. Bit of time in the second team at Middlesex and eventually to Surrey. I think the word you just used, consistent, is the key one for Steele because for a leg spinner, he feels very, very few bad balls. A bit more cover for him compared to what Dan Lawrence has got, but that's partly because Steele is bowling with a short, shorter leg side boundary. Touch shorter here. We've got protection at deep point. But straight enough that there'll be two for Goldsworthy. In the direction of the Bedsa stand, it completes the over. Three off, 72 for two, trail by 71. So they're more than halfway of knocking off their first innings def deficit of 143. I think it's lost sometimes when watching leg spinners bowl just how difficult it is to be as consistent as what everyone would want. But that, that's Shane Warne's fault, isn't it? <laughs> you know, Warne just came on and landed it on a hanky mm. for... 15 years and that became the new norm when forever it was more about leg spinners having the ability to bowl the unplayable balls and spinning it further than finger spinners but typically giving quite a few boundary balls along the way. So someone like Stuart McGill, the contemporary of Warren, he was more like that. He would be a, you know, yeah, there'd be there wouldn't be loads of boundary balls, but there'd be one every over or two. A half tracker or a full toss, but he'd, he'd spin it square. He had all the tricks. A tremendous test record. Whereas if you're an off-spinner and you're giving away a boundary ball and over, you're not doing much bowling. We have an answer, by the way, to the question from Rob in Orkney. Didn't take Sampson long. Unfortunately, the dock has crashed. We'll be back, though. We'll, we'll, we'll have this in a sec. In behind it once more. So the lowest highest score isn't Tom Lamanby. It's Ken James, whose highest score was 109 not out. Yorks him there. Bit of extra pace from Lawrence on the angle. So Lamanby slots in at third. So James played 11 test matches for New Zealand as a keeper in the 1930s. David Nash, who played for Middlesex not that long ago, made 114 as his highest out of his seven. I assume seven. And now Lamanby won 16. So he'd want to set that straight. He'd want to make this 42, say 142, and get, it, get out of that statistical category. And... That have been twin tons for the first time as well. Could turn the game. Bit of news at 
Chelmsford. Kent have avoided the follow-on, which is a serious effort. Ben Compton is still there. Ooh. 347 balls for his 153. Not out. Another 150 in this round. There have been so many 150 plus. Samo might be able to tell us how many there have been in this round compared to other heavy scoring rounds over time. And as I mentioned to Dan earlier, another good day for the Matt Critchley fan club. Oh, yeah. What? Four for 96. Yes, Critchers. Four of the eight. Come on. To go with a 150 in the first innings. 150 not out as well for Critchers. End of the over. 70 is the deficit now. One run from Lawrence. Two for 20 from eight. His analysis. Both the wickets to fall. He picked up Dixon. Caught down the leg side by Folks for a duck before lunch. And Renshaw trapped him leg before for 16 after lunch. And more Critchley propaganda for you, Adam. Um, four wickets. Simon Harmer's bowled 45 overs and he's not picked up one yet. So There you go. That's proof. Very good day, very good game. Proof of what Christian. I've been saying all along. <laughs> this started probably, oh, I don't know, four years ago when he was playing at Derbyshire. That we just we just decided that he should be playing for England, Daniel and I. So interesting you say that. You mentioned Stuart McGill earlier. Mm. Critchley worked with Stuart McGill, mm. and Stuart McGill did an interview during lockdown when Critchley was still at Derbyshire, and he was very confidently proclaimed Matt Critchley will play for England one day as a leg spinner and although he's, a he's actually got a very good region record with the ball he averaged 20 odd with the ball last year for Essex bowling in Armour's slipstream but it's probably more notable now for his work with the bat mm. pretty handy at six he arrived at Essex moved, made that move from Division 2 with Derbyshire to Division 1 at Essex his first game made 100 at the new club two seasons ago then he had diminishing returns for a time, but had a pretty good 2023 all told. Has started really well this year. So I spoke to um, Anthony McGrath, the, the head coach at Essex before the season started. And Matt Critchley was the only Essex player to be there for the whole winter. So Critchley wasn't picked up in any of the franchise leagues, nor was he called up by England Lions, which was a little bit of a surprise actually, mm. given how well he did uh, with the ball last year and how well he's done with about over a number of years now. Um, so he had a quiet winter at Chelmsford. Fully. That's what we were talking about last over and put away. Rightly so. All the way, 4-6. Short boundary in the direction of the Galadari stand. Didn't need to overhit it. Goldsworthy, 21. 80 for 2. Hard and flat. I'm not, I, sh I should say, I'm not entirely sure where Critchley fits at the moment in the England team. You'd probably have to get ahead of about four other spinners, but, you know, spin. Well bowled. Great response from Steele after being hit for six. I think that's going to be you done for the time being. Yes, we'll hear from you after the tea break, which is 12 overs away. Andrew Sampson is going to jump in with me for a bit, and Daniel Norcross will have his fun with Sampson after that. It was two for one when they went to lunch so 78 runs and one wicket across 85 minutes since the lunch break Somerset still 63 runs in arrears but going at a pretty decent rate so far batting with a bit of purpose and with Lamanby, they've got something to build from here as well. 43 not out after 100 the first time around. 90 last week, 97 the week before that in the university game. So clearly the man in form. It's going to be a change for Surrey with Jamie Overton, 88 on his back. Take up the attack. Replacing Lawrence from our Vauxhall end. Just one slip for Lamanby. Deep third man for protection. Threads the needle three point. Just placed it in that direction. Didn't need to overhit it to get a couple. Two back for the short ball on the leg side as well. That's the short boundary. One at deep backward square and right, one right on square leg. So it won't be long before we see that deployed. Hello, Samo. Hello, Colin. All right. That was supposed to be a good day. I don't think I said the good day properly. <laughs> good eye. There you go. Better. That's it. There's another 150. I'm just trying to collate all the 150s. Just been another one, John Simpson. Now with Sussex. Yeah, Sussex skipper. 
Same direction, just one. Good stop over there at point. It's Cam Steele is bowling at the other end, saving at least one over to his left. It, it, it might be difficult to tot up where there have been more 150s in a single round because sometimes how you define a round of county championship is a bit quirky with yep. the game starting on different days. But that, that's the task for you. When have there been how many this round and when have there been more? Of course, two of them have gone on to be 250s, Emilio Gay and Alex Davies. Yep. Threw away triple tons, you ask me. <laughs> oh, straight, nice. He's in the air from Goldsworthy. Just backed his swing, gets another boundary. Just past the stumps. Goldsworthy to 25. He's now down the rope on. Let's check how many boundaries he's got here. Uh, that'll be his third four plus a six, so mostly doing it out and over the rope. I've got eight for this round so far, unless I'm missing one or two. I don't think so. Davies and Gay, the 250s, as you said. Yates, 191. Rhodes, 178, not out. Jennings, 172. Through again. Goldsworthy. Shifting gears in the last couple of overs. Hit a six off steel. Now two falls off Overton, new to the attack. One dead straight, and that clipped away. Perfect timing. He's 29, 91 for two. Yeah, gaining confidence. Yeah, he was um, put, put on his backside by a bouncer by who was it Atkinson earlier, fairly early on in his innings, which looked a bit uncomfortable. But, uh, what are the others? 150, Compton 153 not out. Crutchley 151 not out. And Simpson currently in 150 not out. What's the game situation with Sussex? Can uh, Simpson go on from there, would you say, to reach 200? 200? You're looking for another 300, are you? I am, just, 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 just quietly. Just 200 yeah. enough. Well, 551 for 7 in reply to 338. Yeah, no. So, well, I mean, I suppose that could be an argument. You might as well just bet Keep on. Keep going, yeah. Keep going. I suppose, yeah, I mean, if you, you'd want to get them in at some point, but you know, you can probably still bet for quite a bit of today and then see if you can bowl them out in the last hour or so today and tomorrow. Mm. Well, there was a chance for him to get to 200, you'd think. It, it's often said about heavy scoring in, in championship cricket that 1990 is the outlier yep. due to the readers' ball, isn't it? The, the different Yeah, there was a very off, thin seam. Which meant that there was a hyperinflation of scoring. Yep. Last ball of an expensive over. Oh. They'll get a quick single, so Goldsworthy gets to 30, retains the strike, 12 from it. 92 for two. They only trailed by 51 now. If, if he, statistically, have you got a, an analysis on just what that meant? Um, yes, I've picked a couple of interesting numbers on that, or coincidences as well, but 39.68 was the average runs per wicket in first class cricket in England that season. Mm -hmm. and the next highest in the season, I think, is just around about 36. Okay. Uh, so it's comfortably the highest scoring season in the history of first class cricket in England. Um, I remember that season specifically because of old Fani de Villiers had his one season of county cricket for Kent and his bowling average for the season. He took 25 wickets at 39.68. <laughs> and here's a bit more fun. The first round of this year's county championship, 39.68. Oh, Samo, stop it. <laughs> Because, I mean, I was, you know, we've been noticing the high scoring, so I did a, you know, did a check after the first round so all, all for the season, and it's 39.68. All, all to 100th. Yeah, it's probably, ex I suspect it might be higher than that after this round. Yeah. But it'll come down at some point. These things tend to revert to the mean at some point. Something about cricket where the same numbers just <laughs> repeat. Even that, and as we, we see, they now trail by 50, and it's a partnership with 50 as well for the third wicket. They've... Yep. Reached it in just 89 balls, this pair. So nothing outlandish, but in the last couple of overs, we're seeing a, an effort to try and put a bit of pressure back onto Surrey, field more spread. And four more as well. Too short, Lamanby hammers it away and records another half century. Just a subtle acknowledgement. Knows there is so much more work to do for the visiting team, but... He's been the man in form so far in season 2024, 20, Tom Lamanby. Back at the peak of his powers, 97 for two. Yep, 90 and 100 plus the 92, I think it was against Exeter in the yep. university game earlier. So he's um, going all right so far.
Great start. Yes, so we, we said the other day that 99.94 came up again in reference to Pope here at the Oval before right, the 21-22 yeah. <laughs> Ashes. And yeah, who would have thought a number that high to that decimal point? But that's, yep. that's the way the cricket gods work sometimes. 39.68, was it? Was that your other number? 39.68, 30, the 1990. I'll, I'll remember that. I wonder what test players have averaged 39.68. <laughs> you can find that very <laughs> easily. Or maybe first-class players have finished with that as a career average. There'll be someone. I'm certain there'll be someone that will I'm actually just going to first have a look at Michael Atherton's bowling average in that season. Okay. Because of the early days, he was still bowling, bowling quite a bit of yeah. leg spin, and he had a good season. Catches the call, but it snuck through past the catching cover by Goldsworthy. Another single out to the deep. Atherton, who his first pick for Test cricket, bowled. Yep. He was bowling as much as he was batting. Anyway. Pretty much. I mean, in that season, he got 45 first-class wickets. He might have still had a bit, bit of it for Cambridge to start with, I think. I can't remember offhand, but 45 wickets at 31 in a mm. season where the average runs per wicket was 39.68. There you go. Thirty-nine point six. I'm putting that number down. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be someone they'll, they'll, it'll either be a well, you can do this you've got the database in front I'm of you a quick look yeah so for Overton the music returns must be a, a subsequent church service in the afternoon mm. to our right bumper to start the over Always a nice part of being at the cricket on a Sunday morning at the Oval. The music from mm. the church service next door. Yeah, I noticed that as I walked past the. Yeah. This, well, the sign, I noticed the sign saying this church service was on. I've got bad news. I'm not in test cricket. 39.68. Oh. Betting, anyway. Could look at bowling, but it doesn't seem. Yeah, maybe first good. class. Well, let's go, let's go one level deeper. First class batting average, yeah. career. Short again, and Goldsworthy sensed it. He was into position across his stumps, waiting for it, and gets the single. Steele cuts it off, and the warm applause over to our left, where the Somerset fans have been congregated all week, is to recognise the 100 being raised. 100 for two. So given where they were early on at none for one or one for none, depending on when you went to school, and then 43 for two. This has been a punchy recovery to get within striking distance of parity again. Had a bit of a statistical bone to pick with the editor of the Wisdom Cricketers Almanac uh -huh. a couple of years ago. And of course I lost this the lost this <laughs> argument. It was to do with the, the bowling average of Jeff Thompson. Test average, yes. bang on 28, 28.00. But I took a look at it. I'm like, hang on a yeah. second. How, how does it? How does that <laughs> work? 200 wickets. Yeah. But he conceded it. I've got it in front of me here. But an odd number of 5,601. And one. I'm like, yeah. hang on. Can't be. Can't be bang on. It, it's 28.01 if you round <laughs> with the third decimal. To which I was told, no, 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 youngster. <laughs> wisdom, wisdom, don't do, wisdom, don't do rounding to the, yeah. you, you get to the number or you don't get to the number. So, uh, yes, well, and I'll explain how I, yep. So it was, his bowling average was 28.005. Yep. Conventionally, you round up the third decimal yep. to apply to the second decimal, right? You know, five goes up, below five goes down. But no. Even if it was 28.009, which I think it'd be impossible, but even if it had been yeah. that, it still would be 28.00 for the purpose of the almanac. Yep. It's been Do you know the origin of that? I don't, it's, but it is a convention that's kind of, it was obviously partly, I suspect, because of the almanac that, that um, cricket statisticians have always followed, even though pretty much the rest of the world doesn't. 
I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with it because <laughs> we are out of touch with the rest of the world. <laughs> what cricket? <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. Just another example of <laughs> out of touch with the rest of the world. One but run uh, from Overton second over, yeah. 100 for two. The score trailing by 43. Lawrence can't be that much older than you. He can't call you a youngster, surely. Um, I might be putting some mayonnaise on that. <laughs> he's uh, he's older than me. Yeah. But it's not, maybe not quite. Not by much, I wouldn't think. Uh, we've, we've also got, we've got a, we might look at the wickets that have fallen so far. There we go. Two of them. One before lunch, one after. Or oh, no, we won't. I thought we were able to do that, but we'll, uh, we'll give that a crack later on. Oh, da da look, who, look who we've got here. Daniel Norcross. We've got some nine overs remaining until tea, and he'll do all of them with you, Andrew Sampson. That's really good. I'll have to say happy birthday to him again. Bad news, um, Adam, as you leave. I can't find a 39.68 in first class cricket either. OK, what's going on? What's going on? What numbers are we crunching here well, now? We were talking about the 1990 season, as you'll, you'll recall. Many, many runs. Seasons, many, many, many runs with the, f the thin seams and whatever on the balls. Is which ball was that? That wasn't Tiflex, was it? Was it Reader? Was it Reader? I Reader, yeah. Yeah, we just, yeah I, think it, I think that's right. Adam said Reader, I think he's right. Um, the average runs per wicket that season was 39.68. Highest ever. So teams averaging basically 397 runs in innings. But the, the fun stat that goes with that was the first round of matches this season. The average was 39.68. Hello. It's 1990 all over again, Dan. I'm not sure we want oh. that. Well, <laughs> no, there were two, three test series as well, weren't there, that year? New Zealand and India? Yep. So that was the year Gooch got his 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Gooch got his 3-3-3 three, three, three and he's won 2-3 in the second innings, yeah. See, isn't it strange that that record, 456, in a test match, we don't really pay anything like as much attention to as, you know, yeah. 400 or... As an individual innings, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's never been a stat, really, in cricket runs in a match. I mean, it is, but it's not yeah. a major one at all. We don't, yeah, we don't really use it. Oh, now then, that looks tight. And he's given him. Lamanby goes, Steele makes the breakthrough. Dropping forward, didn't get a massive stride in. The ball turning back into the pads. It looked pretty straight to me. And Surrey got that third breakthrough. They're chipping away here. And it's spin that's done it again. All three wickets yeah. forward to spin. Cameron Steele has got his 10th wicket of the season. And we're not even finished the second, <laughs> second <laughs> round. It's amazing. We're still relatively early. Hard to see from that behind. But, um, this will give us a better angle. Oh, that looks very out to me. This, there was a little yeah. bit of bat on there, which I didn't see from there. That's hit him in line with middle and off. I don't think it's going over the top. We'll see from the side on camera the height. This is a pretty big stride, but you know it's back in front. Yep. Just, just turned a little, didn't it? Well, well. I don't think. Anyone was predicting this at the start of the season. In fact, much of the time, if Surrey are berated for anything, yep. it is that they haven't had you know, taken a lot of wickets with spin. But um, that's been the story Ooh. of the season so far. In game two, and um, we just won behind the whole of last season. Is that right? 16. Six. Last season was 17 wickets with spin. As of, and as we keep mentioning, nine of those, the last innings of last yeah, season. Yeah, last innings. Now we have some more emails from North America. Let's take a little look at the scorecard there. I'm going to be the man out just now. A half century, the two openers removed by Dan Lawrence. One before lunch, Dixon caught down the leg side neatly by folks. And then Renshaw, LBW, on the sweep on that occasion. Brings Tom Banton to the crease. But uh, we have some emails from North America. Yet another American here who loves the cricket. We are few and far between, but we do exist. Lived in London in the ooze, the 2000s. Fell in love with all English sport and now up very early in the spring and summer to watch Surrey. So grateful for the streams on YouTube since 2020. Well, it's lovely to have you on board. One of the most famous 
and influential cricket writers of the last 50 years was an American who came to London, sat in the pavilion at Lord's and suddenly fell in love with the game. Mike Markazi. War Without the Fighting, is that what his book was called? Or yeah, and Anyone But England was one. Oh, sorry, Anyone But England, England, that's right. Yeah. But there's something about the, the war without the fighting India-Pakistan yeah. relationship, I think that comes from that as well, doesn't it? Anyone But England, that's right, that was the name of the book. It was... Uh, He's a controversial fellow, mm. Mike. A Marxist. I was, I was about to say, I presume you knew him quite well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't actually. I didn't know him well enough. A bit, because, a bit um, early for you. Sadly, he was taken away from us yeah. um, a few years back. Yeah. But I know, I know many people who knew him and said he was terrific company, very good writer. Strangely spelt M A R Q U S E E, if you're after his works. Now then, how's the ball gone there? No wonder our cameraman was looking at the, the wrong place. I was looking at the wrong place too. As the ball was short, banged in, everyone was looking to the leg side. It's come off the toe end of the bat, I think, and rolled out into the offside. Hopefully we can get another look at that and see exactly what happened. He's examining his Goldsworthy at the bottom of his bat, so... A bit of a Q-tip on that. So this method is very much been the method of Surrey in this game. Spin and pace in tandem. Quite hostile pace, not been shy of using the short ball. Overton and Gus Atkinson. And further, further emails coming in from America. I haven't heard a single thing about the T20 World Cup here, not even in the local New York City media. No one outside of the South Asian community knows it's happening, sadly. I don't expect cricket or rugby, for that matter, to take off here the way football has. There's a lot of sense in that. I mean, I do think I'm, it's quite tricky to break into America as a sport because it's a very sophisticated sporting market, oh and yeah. baseball is, is a pretty good game. It is know? a good game, yeah. You love it, don't you? I baseball. Enjoy baseball, yeah. Why wouldn't you? Someone's exactly. hurling a ball at someone who's got a bat and they're hitting it. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I, personally, and because you're brought up on cricket here, yeah. I'd be very frustrated that when you do something right in baseball with the bat, you then don't get another ball. That's it. <laughs> You've hit the ball properly, you've got to run. Yes. I mean, I would be inclined just to keep on hitting it through sort of the equivalent yeah. of points, so I kept on, <laughs> kept on batting. <laughs> <laughs> Another short ball. There's fielders out there now. There's a deep square leg and a deep backward square leg as well as quite a fine, fine leg. And Kimar Roach. Norcross is 27th. Oh, I'm going Australian, sorry. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't do accents. Norcross is 27th foul ball. <laughs> He's well, he another he record. Himself. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Get right in behind it. Just Push it down. Just behind back your point. That's all you need. Yeah. Angled, yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the anomalies, of course, is that you have to run even when you hit it out the park in baseball. You're still going to run around yeah. bases. Well, but I don't suppose, in cricket. But that is a kind of, I suppose, a sort of a lap of honour, isn't it? It's it's a bit, you're yeah, just it is. You're taking in the applause of the crowd. Yeah. Yes, I rather like baseball. I mean, obviously, it isn't test cricket. There's yeah. no creation on earth <laughs> as truly magnificent as test cricket. So it's, I think it's a bit unfair to compare baseball with the greatest thing that humankind has ever created. Well, it's a bit unfair to come anything to test cricket. Huh? It is, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Shakespeare, no, mm. sorry, son. <laughs> you might get in the top ten, maybe, but, you know. Yeah, ten. Well, I mean, Number two is way below. I'm not sure who does get the, how many test matches have we now had. 2,537. So you might get in the top 2,547, then. <laughs> <laughs> well... I suspect there's one or two of the test matches that wouldn't get in the top 2,500. <laughs> with the 60s, might, yeah, yeah, and the 50s for that matter. But anyway. You, you make a strong point. <laughs> End of the over, 102 for three. So Cameron Steele will be bowling to Lewis Goldsworthy, but he will be at the start of the next over, having just taken his first wicket of the innings. Another email from America. You're, they're pouring in from America. This is great news. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got names attributed to these, so 
Um, what should we call you, Brad? I may... Oops. Oh, no, we do. There is one there, Alex. Alex Chamberlain, New Jersey. I myself may try and catch the India versus Pakistan match, he says. Just because it's sure to be such a sight. I much prefer red ball cricket, but if T20 is all we'll we'll get locally, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I mean, I don't wish to sound churlish, but I think you've got to count yourself lucky you're getting T20 World Cup in, in America. I think the mm. chances of a five-match test series coming to America is, is pretty slim. Personally, I've always been rather surprised by cricket's fixation with getting back into America. And I think mm. part of it is because it's sort of like the, the fallen angel, the prodigal son or whatever, because it used to be so it popular. It used to be, yep. Bart King. Good old Bart King, yeah. He always comes up, doesn't he? Oh, it's a beauty. <laughs> Absolute beauty. Genuine turn from Cameron Steele. He's, he's landed it really well in this match. Mm. When he gets it there, oh. That's the kind of classic uh, leg spin. Just a bit of dip and a bit of bounce. Oh. And it beats the outside edge. Dot ball. <laughs> Beautiful sight, that's beautiful. it. All it is, a little dot in the score, but... Yep. but uh, yeah, I've always been quite surprised that cricket so fixates with America. When you've got mm. China there... Well, exactly. With over, well over a billion people. Yeah. And, you know, you've only kind of got to get it to the government. Yeah. <laughs> but you've only yeah. got to go to one place, really, and then it, yeah. then it all works. Yeah. Whereas in America... You've got such a sophisticated sporting market, it's quite difficult, really, yep. with market forces to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. Much as we would all, I would love cricket to be played everywhere in the world, of course. That's a nice shot. It's got a packed offside field, but he's managed to thread that through the infield. Kimar Roach, though, is stationed about 15, 20 yards in the boundary, sweeping on the offside. Nigel has emailed in. He's enjoying the commentary and feeling obliged to check in from Ohio. Mm. Born and raised in Surrey, so that's my team. Trying to interest my son in the game, but little success. Well, it's tough. Again, you, you sort of probably need to go to games. It's not easy to get to them, I would have thought, in Ohio. Yeah. I mean, given by American standards, I don't think there's a lot of cricket in Ohio. Doesn't feel like a hotbed. Doesn't feel like a hotbed. No, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the hotbed, yeah. Bed, yeah. That, is that, that was Bart King's gap, Bart King, it? yeah. One of the best days I ever spent when, in, my, in my old days of doing travelling was in Philadelphia. Really? Mm. I saw a Phillies game in Philadelphia. Oh. It was in 1994-5, and they yeah. were... Didn't they win the World Series around about that time? Uh, 94 was the strike year. 95? 95, we won the World Series in 95. I used to know these things. The Yankees and I don't know if they were a bit of a cult team. No, I don't think the Remember. Phillies did then. No, I think there right. was quite a gap from '81 to 2008 or something. But they were very colourful. Something. They, they mm. were. They, they, let's put it this way: they were slightly reminiscent of Northamptonshire's T20 winning sides <laughs> from a year, a few years ago, where you know the likes of Rory Kleinfeld would appear. Mm. And they were sort of known for being hard drinking and hard living, and they perhaps didn't prioritise fitness over. The basics of baseball, which is to throw it hard and hit it hard and catch it. And they were sort of everybody's favourite second team, I think, the Phillies. I had a great time watching mm. them in their stadium. Uh, 80, 1980 they won. Yeah. And they didn't win again until 2008, yeah. There was some, some distress in the crowd, though, as I recall, when... Um, one fella forgot to take his hat off during the national anthem. <laughs> and I discovered, it wasn't me, mm. but I discovered that this is seen as an almost her heretical behaviour. You, like you live and learn. You live and learn, yeah. 2005. Yeah, we were in Philadelphia. Yeah. Spent the morning doing all the independent stuff, you know, seeing the Liberty Bell and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Spent the afternoon going around the cricket grounds of Philadelphia. There was a guy who showed me all around. So, Marion Cricket Club, Germantown. Um. Oh, that's not far away from short leg. Philadelphia Cricket Club and Harvard, Harvard College, which houses the biggest cricket library in North America. The C.C. Morris Library. It's actually quite a good library. Score books with 
games of WG Grace played in and things like that amongst all the other memorabilia. Well worth seeing if you want to do that. Didn't Glenn that? Close used to take a team to America as well, I'm imagining that. Could be, yeah. So I think they, they had one of the fun the tours. Yeah, America, I, think, and I think there's still quite a lot of that that goes on in Philadelphia. Quite sociable, let's say. Lakeside didn't quite catch up with that. Dangerous though, those we've seen a few strangles down the lakeside. You don't want to get it be getting out that way. And then I spent the evening in a Phillies game. That's Andrew Look Sampson living his very best life. Pretty I would much, say. yeah. <laughs> um, apart from the fact there was no actual cricket to watch. <laughs> no. No, you could sort of imagine it. You could, you're breathing you the same air as you the could. mighty bark. It's a little bit difficult because most of those clubs had the, um, the the grass was set up as lawn tennis courts at the time when we were there, but. That, that does seem like a waste. You still play a bit of cricket there, yeah? Yeah, lawn tennis is a waste of a good cricket ground. <laughs> Although I'm not as fanatically opposed to lawn tennis as to certain other pursuits. <laughs> no, we're not going to go back to golf. No, we're not. No, 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 and we've got you away from golf. <laughs> <laughs> now, then, I'm not going to leave American yeah. cricket, though, just yet, because this is true, isn't it, that the first cricket international yep. was the USA against Canada? 1844, yeah. Do we have a scorecard of that? Is that, mm. that survived? Mm. How well kept was it? And, and, and did he, was, was score books, how did score books work back in the 1840s? Mm. Were they very different kind of beasts? Not that different, but a lot more rudimentary. Um, so it's basically just the. It's carved well. Just be the single though, because Kimonga Roach is out there, at deep backward point. Basically, Mountain is underway. Sorry, oh, Mountain's in the way. Good. Um, yeah, it'll be fairly rudimentary. I mean, you don't have balls and minutes and fours and sixes and all that kind of stuff recorded, um, but you'd have the scoring shots. Right, and the guy oh, and scored the in between. Is it? And in 1844, it might not even have um, told you who took a catch or that sort of thing. 1844 is fairly early days for bowling figures as well. Ah, I see. Uh, fall of wickets you wouldn't have had. Um, no. Well, so, so with the purpose of the scoreboard was just to keep yeah the um, team total, but they but they still kept the individual totals yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, individual scores. So here's the scorecard of America versus Canada. Right. It's St. George's Club Ground in New York, it says, yeah, which is... Tossed up again, just a little too full. Anyway, Canada won, just as well. <laughs> <laughs> Canada made 82, uh, with a top score of extras, 15. Bowling figures, groom. 16 overs, which are oddly, oh, so they've kept oddly, yeah. 16 overs. Maidens, question mark. Runs, question mark. Wickets, three. Uh -huh. And that's the same as the bowling figures for the rest of the... Um, so they recount the, the number of overs, but not the number of runs yeah. scored on each bowler. Another over ticks by. We've got another four to go until the tea break. Tea, obviously, with 32 overs left to be bowled. Sorry, I'd love to pick up another one. <laughs> well, Somerset is still behind. The, the rest of the match, there's no overs either. But oddly, in um, Canada's second innings, Groom, who took another five wickets, bowled seven wides, which is recorded. Hmm. It seems rather capricious what they choose to record yeah. and what they don't. So was this a single so innings match? No, no. 82. America 64. Canada 63. This is tight. It is tight. And then um, America all of 58 all out. Still, it's quite a humdinger. With, with one, with one, with one absent. Wheatcroft was absent in the second inning for some reason. Injury. Well, I imagine the pitches might be a little bit spicy. You never know. There's not much in the way of protective gear. It's kind of, yeah, it would have been not all that. The scorecard, not all that different to the famous 1882. 
The yes. Ashes test that gave rise to the Ashes. Low scoring. Is that one of the games that if you had a time machine you'd go back to? I often think, if I had a time machine, mm. where am I going? Yeah, no, that would definitely be right up near the other top right of the list. right up there, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I did think that what I would do if I had a time machine <laughs> would be to distract the war parents on the night that they conceived <laughs> Steve and Mark War, because I think it might have given England a better chance in the ashes through the 90s and I mean, you'd have the ooze. <laughs> you have a point there, yes. I mean, I could wipe out about 17,500 test match runs. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like Australians, do you? <laughs> no, it's not. I'd actually, I do rather like them, but... <laughs> yeah. But um, wh when you're brought up on a seemingly endless diet of being thrashed by them, which, of course, mm. is just the luck of the draw, isn't mm. it? If you're my age, then from 1980... Yeah, I'm just trying to work it out now from... From 1989 to 2005... Been a teenager when England won in Australia in 86. 86, seven, yes, 86 seven, seven, 17 then. So 17, 17, 17, 17 and, oh well, England won in 85, but then there was, of course, the long gap to 2005. Oh, yes, between 1977 and 1987, I had a pretty good time. Yeah, you did have a fairly good run. Yeah, a good time. Yeah, yeah. But it was the crushing nature of the yes. next 16 years yes. that uh, it would have destroyed a lesser man. <laughs> and yet here you are. And yet here, here I am. Which is, you know, a testament to stickability, stoicism. But I saw a lot of Steve Waugh. Yes, oh, he would have done, yes. Mm. And it, it wasn't awfully pretty. I mean, I think it, if there, there, the batters that I would be happy not to recall in my life, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, yes. would be Gary Kirsten, yes. Graham Smith oh. and Steve Waugh. South Africa has a tradition of... It's oh, a modern we? tradition of ugly left-handed <laughs> openers because there's Kepler Vessels and uh, yes. Dean Elgar as well. Well, we've had a, a fair That's share so of ugly ones. I mustn't be too parochial about it, but yes, yeah. yeah, South Africa has specialised in, in nuggety, nuggety left-handers. But parochialism aside, I'm sure you would have enjoyed watching Steve's brother there. Now I did, yes. <laughs> I enjoyed watching him and Damien Martin I yeah, enjoyed. Yeah. In fact, there was a whole slew of very attractive... Australian batters who didn't get into the team because of Steve Waugh. <laughs> <Well, laughs> yes. At that time, there was a brilliant player, Stuart That's Law. Right. And Stuart Law without the test batting average, even though he did play a test match. Yeah. He was one of the lucky ones. There were other players who should have done and didn't get the chance because of the quality of the batting lineup. Now, we've had an email from James at the end of. 34th over the innings, three to go till tea. Talking about cricket being played in the US, which indeed we are, James, yes. I used to play a few games for a club in Long Island in New York City back in 2010 to 2012 while working overseas. It would be either on a rolled up artificial wicket and even plastic wickets more than once. Played on old baseball pitches in parks, which was a first for me. Well, there's a, a book out called From Lords to the Fjords which details the rise of Icelandic cricket, and they've had to do, have to do it a very similar kind of way. And indeed, mm. I think we were talking, where was I talking about this? Probably the Final Word podcast now I mentioned it. Um, about the match at Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest oh, yes. recorded cricket match, and they had to lug an artificial pitch all the way up Mount Kilimanjaro and lay it out. in order for the game to be deemed an actual game. And of course, one of the great, and there aren't very many, it has to be said, great novels, fictional works about cricket mm. set in New York City, isn't it? Yep. Neverland. Neverland, yep. Terrific book, very well worth the read. That came out at a similar sort of time as possibly my favorite, which is Chinaman by Karuna Tilika. It's an absolutely brilliant mm. book. It's a Sri Lankan novel. Yeah. That imagines. Well, it refers to the exploits of a, of a player called Pradeep Matthew, who didn't exist. Yes. But the. Uh, I 
I suppose the artifice of the book is that he did exist, but there's no record, can't find him anywhere. Oh, wow. So it's in search of this mysterious, very effective bowler, mystery spinner. But that is an absolutely marvellous work. Though a, lo a lot of fictional work in cricket mm. probably doesn't stand too much of the test of time. Ian Botham, Lord Botham as now, mm. was responsible for a book that is best read with a few drinks by a pool. <laughs> yes. Not, not, the, not the very best. No, okay. Although no, I, wasn't, I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of Lord Burson being involved in fictional cricket books. Yes, I did check one out. Okay. Check him out. It's, it's, I'll a, about it. it's quite the thing. Um, some lovely children's books, of course. So yes, cricket, yeah. Glory Gardens books. They're great fun. It's that famous, what's that? England, their England book, A.G. Eh? MacDonald is a cricket yep. chapter. But they did a bit good. more of that in the past, didn't mm. they? Uh, but I was, I was handed a book, actually, by, I think he might have been a Surrey member. And it's a bit of a mystery. It's a mystery thriller mm. about a Surrey player and former captain or captain. I read it last year. That was quite a wheeze. Oh, totally good. I wish I could remember the name of it right now, but I, I do <laughs> do this to myself. I, mm. <laughs> I bring well, up the subject of something and then can't remember how to finish it off. But I know the feeling. I might, it's on my bookshelf. I might bring it in tomorrow for people to see. Now, what are you showing me Where here? do you think this park is with all these cricket pictures? On, on Google Maps, in case you're wondering what we're waffling on about. It's huge enough to be like a Maidan, isn't it? It is, isn't it? But are you going to tell me that this is the United States? It is in New York. Van Cortland Park. Ah. During which I presume on like weekends and things, it's in summer they're quite busy with lots of cricket games going on. And it says cricket pitch on it. Yep. Which must confuse many an American who's looking <laughs> at the satellite images of New York. There you go. That's a big old space you're showing me. It is. It's yeah. uh, probably not quite the Calcutta or Mumbai Maidan size, but it's pretty impressive. Hmm. It'll be fascinating to watch that T20 World Cup. Now then, I'm going to trail for you what's happening at tea. During Black History Month last year, the ACE program director, Chevy Green, put on tours of the Kia Oval, focusing on the ground's proud history of performances by black, black players. He gave one of these tours for us, so stick around at tea time and you'll hear from Chevy. And actually the very first black player to play for England Roland Butcher is two boxes down from us doing the radio. Doing the radio, that's right. Still going strong. Is he still selecting the West Indies team as well? I think he was involved with that quite recently. Is he? I think. A little uppercut there, but there is a fielder down. It's a sort of wide, deep third. Jordan Clark pings in the throw. So, listen out for Chevy at T. He's always. A great speaker, it's great fun having him on the on the live stream. And uh, I saw many pictures of him with our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who was down here oh, to okay. announce Jolly good. £35 million pounds worth of investment, I believe. In Jolly good. Ace programme, Lords Towners yeah. and good effort, Charles that. the Shine. It is, isn't it? Mm. Stephen Finn was there as well. I, uh, I noted his presence. I said, ah, interesting, interesting to see you there. Mm -hmm. You're standing, standing at short leg. Yes. I said, yeah, well, Jimmy was bowling. I told him to drop a short one in the <laughs> ribs. <laughs> Get him caught round the corner. <laughs> fast bowlers, they'll have a plan for anybody, you see. All, all fast bowlers will have a plan. No, oh, I, th I, th I or, think that they think we... about nothing but plans. Mm. Oh, now then, it's an intriguing attempt mm. to the uppercut. That's the white ball Banton there, who was almost fatefully drawn to that ball like a moth to a flame. Mm. There's only one over after this till T, and he's gone for a very white ball shot here. Unfortunately, Ollie Pope slightly obscuring our vision of that, but you can get. You get the idea. Yeah, it's kind of the whole the modern player, the, exactly the kind of issue that guys like him will have, because he's got two of 17 balls before that. Mm. You know, playing 
properly, as you and I would call it. Properly, and yes. Then, and then he, he gets the ball like that, and instinctively, he plays the 2020 shot. And tries to. Well, that's the last ball that Gus Atkinson's going to bowl before T. 108 for three. We've got one over left, so just time for me to sneak in an email from Nicholas in Ottawa, who has been in contact, not strictly speaking, the United States, but better than that. The winners of the first ever international game of cricket, Canada. He says, Surrey broadcast team. Not dear or high. Surrey broadcast team. <laughs> Probably just as well. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It is an absolute pleasure to wake up to your broadcast at 0600 EST in Ottawa, Canada. Ottawa's place which has a sort of replica Big Ben and House of Parliament, doesn't it? From memory. Yeah, so it's like a miniature they've one. Got a very, they've got a cricket ground at the Not Houses miniature. of Parliament as well. Have they? Rid Rideau, Rideau, Call or something? I can't remember what Get back in touch with us, Nicholas, and, and, and put us put us straight. And when I say miniature, it's not miniature miniature. It, 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 it's fully functioning in size. But I went to it, and it does look suspiciously like House of Parliament. He says, uh, he enjoys the commentary through a languid Sunday morning. I'm learning about the game while also winning brownie points with my wife for volunteering to take the early shift with our five-week-old daughter. Cricket's very good for that, I find. <laughs> yes. Certainly in winter. In England, there's a lot of people who earn a lot of brownie points that way. And why not? You have a five-week-old daughter. Her coordination at this point matches Dan Lauren's effective pre-release motion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but how many wickets has she got? <laughs> <laughs> Give her time. Nicely played out of the deep for another single. I can't speak for those who were raised with the game from birth, but for us converts, the county YouTube streams are magic. Thank you for it all. P.S. Tell Yaz, Phil and Katia that their podcast is a decent listen to as well. Hmm. Well, if we're going to be plugging podcasts, <laughs> <laughs> can I recommend Zero Ducks Given with Stephen Finn and me? <laughs> oh, and Toby And Toby. Well. Toby. <laughs> and Toby. We mustn't forget Toby. But we like to. Uh, PPS, he says, if you can name the single Canadian who has played first class cricket for Surrey, I will fly to London and pay you £100 myself. We're on it. <laughs> Note, 19th century and an emigrant stroke immigrant to my fair land. 19th century. Not offhand, I can't, I'm afraid. Not offhand. Jack Crawford didn't pop in for a while, did he, at any point? That's Nicholas in Ottawa. Well, you've got a scrambling now because we're we're all grifting a living here, Nicholas, and a hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're very happy for that. Or indeed, well, why don't we open this out to tender? The single Canadian who has played first class cricket for Surrey. A 19th century and an emigrant stroke immigrant to my fair land. So I'm assuming that he began life in England and then moved to Canada that way round. I'm hoping that's correct. That was the last ball before T. And um, on his even in that session, Somerset began it one down, two yep. for one. They've got through to 110 for three. Three wickets to fall. The two openers to Dan Lawrence, one before lunch. That was Sean Dixon. And then Matt Renshaw on the sweep. And then Cameron Steele got the first inning centurion. Tom Lamonby out, propping forward LBW trap bang in front that was the last week to forward score was 101 since then Goldsworthy has 40 of 83 Tom Banton playing very much within himself to the odd flash of impetuosity he's three from 21 32 overs remain in the day Surrey still ahead by 33 runs Somerset three wickets down it's been difficult prizing wickets out of this relatively unresponsive surface with a not particularly responsive ball but Surrey have stuck at their task, Somerset have stuck at their task, been good, honest toil, Andrew Sampson. Where does the game stand, in your opinion? Well, obviously, Surrey's still the favourite. Um, you know, Somerset are almost at parity with three wickets down. Need a couple of good partnerships to bring themselves back in the game, plus also what are the, the weather factor tomorrow going to come into play. So. Who knows, it's supposed to rain a bit, apparently. I don't know what the latest forecast is. We obviously hope Keep it Keep our fingers crossed, but, always. you know... Um, We'll see. The forecasts, especially this time of year, can be a, bit, a little bit 
deceiving. You see something that says it's going to rain, but it's also going to be sunny and it's going to be blowy. So we might get lucky. Showers yep. will be here, there, and everywhere. The players are making their way. Uh, the, the fans are making their way out. And um, over the tea break, we're going to be hearing from Chevy Green. Welcome to the Kia Oval. In Black History Month, the ACE programme and Surrey County Cricket Club, in partnership, celebrated some Black History Month tours. On those tours, we spoke about some of the most iconic matches that took place and some of the greatest players that represented the West Indies and Surrey. Come and check it out with me. South London is special to me, it's special to the Kia Oval and it's got a fond history of supporting black cricket over the years. Many of the Windrush generation ended up in South London. A lot ended up in Brixton, just down the road, capturing that history and over the years them coming out to support West Indies and having a sense of belief and belonging is huge. Here we have 1963, the raucous West Indian fans. For me, what this shows is a time potentially of struggle and hardship for the local black community and the fans coming out to support their heroes, the people that inspire them, that give them hope, that show that they too can be equal and have success. One of my favorite stories about the Kia Oval is actually about my dad. My dad is one of my true inspirations who got me into cricket. He couldn't afford the ticket to get into the ground at the time, but he was able to sneak in with a friend. He also got to sneak into the change rooms by impersonating the Voice newspaper. It's one of the most iconic black newspapers in the UK. Surrey has honored a few of their legends over the years, none other than Sylvester Clark being given the Sylvester Clark bar. How fitting it is, that is one place that he loved to be. So it's a true honor that he celebrated here amongst other many other Surrey legends. And I think this quote by his colleague, Pat Polcock sums it up nicely. Viv Richards says he didn't wear a helmet. He did, he wore one twice against Surrey when Sylvester Clark was playing. Big boss, Ebony Rainford Brent. Ebony is from the heart of Lambeth, Herne Hill, Brixton, just down the road. So she's a local girl that came through these doors when she was very young. So she's gone through the whole ranks from playing in the county age groups to captain in the women's side to playing on the boys' academy. The first black woman to play cricket for England. And if it wasn't for her, there would be no ace program. Thanks for everything, boss. Let's go see some other players. There he is. That's the big bro Tudes. Alex Tudor, what a player, what an inspiration to me. Grew up at the same cricket club. He played cricket with my dad. Um, a true hero um, for many young people growing up in South London. He went from playing just like many of us at the local ground to reaching the highest level playing for England. And someone that I look up to and have always looked up to. So that's the big bro and happy to have him an ambassador for ACE and helping us do everything more to create the next Alex Tudors of the world. Welcome to the museum. What a place that captures so much history. And for Black History Month, we have a special display. We have Sylvester Clark's jumper. It's been in a vault for over 20 years. Moving on to the 1939 West Indies vs England scorecard. Not only do we have that, we have the bat from the game signed by all the players. So Garfield Solbers, personalized signed bottle of rum. I bet people can't wait to taste that. Our current T20 captain, Chris Jordan, donated a signed top. And to cap it all off, we have my favorite player, the Master Blaster, Sir Vivian Richards, signed MCC magazine of the amazing portrait that was taken. I have to show you this. What a team, the 1984 West Indies team, led by the Greek Sir Clive Lloyd. So famously, the term of winning um, a series 5-0 was named Whitewash. Now, as West Indies don't have any white players, it was famously coined 
Blackwash. It's no easy task winning a series 5-0, and this team is very special to be able to do it. It would have meant a lot to them. It also would have meant a lot to the fans that came out in their droves to see West Indies here at the Oval. The West Indies room. One of my favorite rooms in the whole of the Kia Oval. This room celebrates some fantastic history, some of the most iconic matches that West Indies have played here, and some of the most decorated and celebrated West Indian players of all time. Sir Vivian Richards. What an inspirational man he was, a true trailblazer in the game. Big hero for not just the local community around the ground, but for all of the West Indian fans across the country um, to have someone like Viv dominating the bowlers uh, and with so much style. You know, look at the wristband, look at the Nike trainers. That's unheard of in cricket back those days. We've celebrated black history. We've gone on a journey. We spoke about some of the old, and now it's time to take you on a journey to know about the new. Sophia Dunkley, the first black woman to play test cricket for England. Sophia Dunkley has come on and solidified her position, and she is doing some amazing things in terms of her progress and where she wants to take her career. Chris Jordan, that's another big bro. One of England's all-time greatest deaf bowlers and fielders. He too is going to inspire many others to come. And that's what's seen him going around the world representing in all the big T20 competitions. It's amazing to see the impact that Ace is having on young players, particularly Davina Perrin. And she is inspiring not only the girls, but the boys too of seeing where you can get to. So we're hoping many others will follow in her footsteps to get to the next level. Ace may have started at Surrey, but it's impacting so many other counties now too. Our young academy players are blessed to have the opportunity to train at all first-class grounds. They get to train and play amongst where their heroes do it. It's highly aspirational and inspirational for them to get to the next level. And we're pleased that so many of the young players on our program are now getting into county pathways. We just want to create more opportunities for more young people to play the game of cricket and do it the ace way. Thank you for joining me on the tour. You've heard about some of my favorite players, but I want to hear about yours. Send them in using the hashtag raising the game. I look forward to seeing if they can match up to some of my heroes.
Welcome back to the Kia Oval for the third session on day three between Surrey and Somerset in this early season fixture. An even second session. Somerset lost a wicket early in their second innings. Dan Lawrence striking in his first over, opening the bowling in the second innings. And it's been all spin so far. Dan Lawrence has two wickets. Cam still has the other, the LBW of Tom Lambie, who's looked at an excellent touch so far early this season. Here are those wickets to fall. This is the second one. Lawrence getting the overseas batter, Matt Renshaw, and here's the wicket that Steele got of Lambie. Important wicket of Lambie. Steele continuing his outstanding start to the 2024 summer. I'm Yaz and with me for the start of the third session is Cameron Ponsonby. Thank you very much, Yaz. Yes, Cameron still continuing the trait we said talked about earlier on today, the greatest player to ever be play in April, basically. If he extends it across the year, he'd be a historic cricketer. I think I'd love to say that this is we're approaching a session where you know, the game's going to turn or it's the most crucial session of the match. I think that this match is basically playing out at the rate it should be at the moment. Sorry, neither team really needs to force the issue in any given way. Such as Surrey's leads, they're still, they're still 30 runs ahead. That, in effect, we're basically going to have a session of cricket where Somerset are looking to bat for as long as possible throughout the session without kind of suffering too many, losing too many more wickets. And they'll look to build bat and bat for as long as possible into tomorrow. But sorry, the game is very simply, how can we take seven wickets as quickly as possible? Yep, absolutely. Um, I thought there are times in the second session just Jordan Clark opens up proceedings. Slightly full ball. Shout for LBW, but that looked a little bit leg side, and the umpire dismisses that appeal quite quickly. I think there were points in the in the second session where it sort of felt like we were further on in the innings than we actually were. Surrey were more imaginative about how they'd go about taking wickets than you'd ordin ordinarily see. 10 to 15 overs into innings as we have a look at that LBW shout again. Yeah, it looks a little bit leg side. Clark opening up with the Yorker to Tom Banton, who's three off 22. Another very full delivery from Jordan Clark and well dug out by Lewis Goldsworthy. Goldsworthy is an interesting player, someone who I've um, been interested in for a while. So I was at the 2020 Under-19 World Cup and Goldsworthy was part of the England team for that tournament, as was Casey Aldridge, actually. Um, and Goldsworthy, that tournament, um, probably caught the eye more with his bowling than it was his batting. He was England's uh, lead spinner alongside Hammond and Kadri. And Goldsworthy arguably had a better tournament than Kadri did with the ball. Flick towards deep fine leg for a single. But over the last couple of years, you'd probably say that he's made a name for himself in county cricket, more so with the bat. He got runs here against Surrey in a one-day cup game a couple of years ago and now in the absence of Abel and Carla Cadmore he's, he's batting four it's a re real opportunity for him to stake a permanent claim for selection George Bartlett leaving Somerset in the off-season to Northampton as well that's a delightful shot from Tom Banton full and straight from Clark and worked well through mid-wicket for four. He picks up his first boundary. He moves on to seven. Somerset, 116 for three. And Clark's had quite a bit of joy early on in this over, getting some shape into the right hand, and I think he's continued along that line. Actually, this time, Banton picks away, picks off the leg side, kind of line of Clark, away through the onside for a boundary. I don't think we've seen too much movement, too much shape, especially in from the right hander into the right hander with this Kookaburra ball. But Clark looks to be finding it or attempting to find it at the moment. Straight again, Banton knocks it into the leg side for a single. It's a really good shot for Banton, but I don't think Clark will be that unhappy uh, with yeah. that delivery. If you look at the field that he's got, only one slip, a lot of protection in front of square, and the second catcher is a man at short mid wicket, and Banton kept that one on the ground pierce the gap between short mid wicket and mid on but it's clearly a plan as you say Cam 
angling it in. Absolutely. Towards we, mid and leg. And we saw that with the first ball of the session where he's gone for the York or gone for a very full length that had the LBW appeal. Lewis Goldworth, see, very quickly on Crick Info, his nickname's listed as Messi. Messi as in Lionel as opposed to untidy. Definitely spelt M E S S I. Definitely, as long as long as I my reading is not failing me. Um, if any Somerset fans or anyone any friends of Lewis having a watch if, if it is possible to let us know why that is I hope I hope I hope that it's because he's a fantastic fielder you can let us know at sorrybroadcast at gmail.com mm. or get in contact via the relevant Twitter channels it's funny you say that I genuinely didn't know that about Goldsworthy and I was going to independently mention that this morning I was watching the Somerset warm up and they were playing football oh, well no we've and, set this and, up and, haven't we and Goldsworthy was the most accomplished ball player <laughs> There were other very effective footballers, but Goldsworthy was the one who looked like he had most most Le time with the ball. Lionel esque, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, you had Shoei Bashir playing sort of right centre back role. You know, Somerset's equivalent of Ben White, I guess. Maybe Goldsworthy gets a, a big move to Major League cricket <laughs> this summer. Playing for the San Francisco Unicorns, taking launching the sport over in North America. Well, it's Spin that's done the business so far for Surrey in the second innings, and Cam Steele will continue from the Mickey Stewart members' pavilion end. I don't think anyone would have really predicted. I know, and I know we keep on talking about it, the Kookaburra ball, etc., and how it's there to kind of promote the use of Spin. But I don't think anyone would have expected it to play such a big role for Surrey across these opening two fixtures. Left alone by Banton. You know, we were talking about it downstairs during the interval. Um, Steele has forced Surrey into a really interesting selection conundrum going forward because Tom Laws has been left out of the, the side this week. He's been brilliant over the last couple of seasons for, for Surrey, performing a really important job bowling first and second change, uh, able to, to move that Duke's ball 20 to 40 overs into the innings. And you've also got Dan Worrell, who's been arguably the star of the show with the ball over the last couple of years oh, player missed from Todd Banton probably slightly too full and straight to cut neat take from Ben, ben Folks behind the stumps yeah, I think the uh, it wasn't so much Steele's initial performance last week but probably as soon as you double up and you go again for a second week in a row then you really force the coach's hands to keep you in the team as opposed to just performing well once for a one-off that's a bit of a drag down but Banton cuts it straight to the man at extra cover I think the seam the seam rotation will slightly work itself out Atkinson will probably only play roughly I don't know three in, ahead of the test summer And I guess what also comes into consideration is the batting of some of those bowlers. Um, Jordan Clark's got a lot of important runs for Surrey last year. Jamie Overton, you know, mentioned it a few times already today, but he's on the cusp of an England call-up. He's thinking T20 cricket more on account of his batting than his bowling. Hmm. And he averages 30-odd for, for Surrey in the last couple of years with the bat. It will, because we, we're talking about... Dan Royal, Sean Abbott will arrive at some point in the future as well. It is a real luxury of riches as ever, especially in the seam bowling department that Surrey have here. They may look such as the kind of the quality on show. I don't think it's the, the harshest drop in the world if you say, Cam, thanks very much. Well played for two games. We don't need you anymore. And then that's they make the shift when that Duke's ball comes back. That's just the reality, probably of probably written somewhere in Steele's contract that it's kind of like. Can you play really well from us when you need you? And then you're going to have to set out for a little bit. You know, it's quite interesting comparing Surrey to some of the teams around them in the table over the last couple of years. So if you compare Surrey, who have a lot of England call-ups, a lot of IPL players, etc. They use so many more players than someone like Essex or Hampshire. I think Hampshire in 2022, I think, used 14 players all year. They pretty much use the same 11 they're very canny with the group of players they have are generally players who are available for the entirety of the summer with Surrey aren't able to do that obviously they're a very well resourced club but they've, they've been very very smart in getting in quality cover 
Clark continuing with that ploy to bowl straight at Banton. That slip has moved out, so there's no one to accompany Ben Folks behind the stumps at the moment. There are two short mid wickets in play with some boundary cover at deep square leg as well. We're just having some more movement as well. Dom Sibley is now going to a kind of catching mid on, mm. a short mid on, where you would be kind of backing up as the non-striker. It's also the sort of field cam where I think it says something about how Surrey perceived the pace of the pitch as well. Generally, when you have more men in front of the wicket than behind it, generally there's a little bit less pace in it. You're almost looking for a ball that stops a little bit, that a player plays early. Absolutely. We saw there Overton at the, the catching wicket with Dom Sibley, who's moved from slip. They were both kind of going through their shadow batting. The ways they, the way they were predicting or hoping for a leading edge to come, and the plan is um, being telegraphed rather. Calls where he dabs that into the offside and picks up one. Oh, we have an answer. I'm very excited. You can take it, yes. Well, so an email has, has come in about Lewis Goldsworthy from Will Martin, uh, the Somerset social media admin, important, with, with some uh, important information about Lewis Goldsworthy. He says, Lewis is a top class footballer, the best in the side for sure played in the Plymouth Argyle youth system. So that is where Wonderful. the nickname comes from. That'll do it. And more importantly, I'm pleased that my eye for a football. Exactly, actually, you're, you are. I think you've won out of this story the most, <laughs> to be honest. It was a famous football scout's name. That should be your nickname. <laughs> My weird football cricket story is I once coached Scotland bowler Mark Watt in a football match. <laughs> Coach is a very loose term there, but how did it go? Did you bring out the best in him? I think we lost. We initially started at three at the back, and Mark played as a deep line forward. Did a very good. Oh, very job, nice. That's, that's an interesting strategy as well. Yeah. Did uh, he take throw-ins from really far behind the line? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just try and mix things up. He did not. He did not. Um, but anyway, Somerset 121 for three after 40 overs. Banton moving into his innings here. Started slowly. Played a really nice shot off his legs through Clark for four. I'd love to know what the process is. I know I'm going a bit too much on this Lewis Goldsworthy <laughs> nickname here. But what the process is to get Crick Info to list that for you. Yeah, it's a That's really That's fantastic PR for him. <laughs> to go around, what, what you know as, I'm known as the greatest footballer of all time. And I'm a professional cricketer. Stealing again. And it's another wicket for Cam Steele. Banton doesn't get a cut shot away and he spooned a really straightforward chance to Dan Lawrence at backward point. Surrey have their fourth wicket. It's another wicket to spin. No, spin continues to dominate. All four wickets of this innings have fallen to spin. It's the two spinners that have combined here. Banton looking to cut. A slightly shortest delivery from Steele. Gets a top edge and it's the simplest of catches from Dan, for Dan Lawrence. We'll see here. Balloons up. And it's a round of applause all round for Surrey as the fourth wicket falls, 121 for four. Tom Banton gone for 11. Well, we were talking just in the previous over about balls potentially getting stuck in the pitch a little bit. We're talking about that off the seam of Jordan Clark, but this one popping up a little bit on Tom Banton and he provides a very, very straightforward chance for Dan Lawrence. A great stat in from Andrew Sampson who says that Surrey now have 17 wickets through spin in 2024 which is the same number of wickets they got through spin over the course of the entirety of their victorious 2023 campaign. That is a very good statistic. So they are capable of adapting to what is put in front of them. A really really important wicket. Somerset 121 for four. Still trailing Surrey by 22 runs. James Root, who obviously had that outstanding campaign in 2023, five centuries as a teenager, got on an England Lions tour as a result. He comes in at number six. A lot of work to do for Somerset here. 
I think you were. If you want to kind of continue to put, put praise on Cameron Steele, you just watch the replay here. It's not the most, it's not the shortest delivery in the world, but it probably speaks to the action he's putting on the ball. That he's got that extra bounce. A ball that's just slightly got a bit more topspin on it than side spin. The left-handed Rue comes on, comes into bats, and now, given such a spin-dominated innings, wouldn't be surprised to see Dan Lawrence come back into the attack. Yeah, it's a really good point. Steel into Rue, who defends. To mid on. But yeah, it's a really good point on, on Steel. We saw a ball in the previous over that looked a bit straight and full to cut from Banton, and he played and missed at it. And it was a similar sort of delivery there. It's not particularly short, yet he still attempted that cut shot. And, you know, we've praised Steele throughout this game for not bowling many bad deliveries for a leg spinner. And it's that sort of consistency that forces batters to try something different in order to score. tidy start here to, to Rue who's scoreless after three deliveries you know I, I'm as impressed by Steele conceding 27 runs off 11.4 overs as I am from those two wickets really as Rue nudges one into the offside to get off the mark oh, I know he's not quite the man of the moment currently They're focusing on Cameron Steele but I can't imagine Dan Lawrence would have been expecting to be Surrey's opening bowler batting at six when he arrived from Essex over the winter. But it's been a very successful, well, very successful with the ball. He's yet to really get going with the bats. He's only had one innings. It'll be fascinating to see how his season plays out. It's a very good finish to the over from Cam Steele. Two for 28 off 12 overs. Surrey spinners doing all the work today end of the 41st over 122 for four Somerset they still tra trail by 21 Jordan Clark will continue from the Vauxhall end and all of a sudden having said only a matter of minutes ago how this session could be a quiet one it could just kind of play through slightly on autopilot Sarah will be sensing a real opportunity here. If you have a couple of quick wickets, then all of a sudden we get into effectively territory and Somerset close the gap. And you go, oh, Somerset effectively scores a level, but then one for five. I'm um, sensing from that tone you don't like effectively chat. I don't know, but there's no other word for it. It's a bit like baseball. You go, well, what, else, what else do you want me to call it? I, uh, there's only so many words in the, in the dictionary that are appropriate in this, in this instance. Clark to continue. Starts with a bumper. More conventional field in place for the new bat. James Rue. There's a slip in play. I don't think we made enough of Somerset's lineup in the first inning. They, they really do bat deep. Um, got Craig Overton in at nine and Pretorius at number ten, uh, who's not played a lot of county cricket. If you look at his overall first-class career numbers, he averages 28 with the bat, and he's coming in at number 10. And Andrew informed us that Joe Bashir is the only Somerset player in this game to not have a first-class 100. And we saw in the first innings that he is more than capable of hanging around. It's interesting, because it's, it's a bit of a contradiction of Somerset's batting line is that bats incredibly deep with kind of experience down the bottom with Pretorius at number 10 I think he got 90 in his last match in South Africa but it's a very young middle and top order so you go Lamanby 23 Goldsworthy 23 Banton 25 Rue just turned 20 and so there is that kind of contradiction in terms where Yes, you have this kind of strength and depth, but you also have the inexperience at that top of or, or at the upper end of the order. Middle order, I believe, mm. is the phrase. It's a real opportunity for, for Goldsworthy now with, with those two high-profile high players unavailable at the moment. 
He's looked really composed so far, very organised player. Obviously good with his feet. Sorry's plan to James Rue here. Kind of following the logic that was presented when Clark's ball into the right hander. They're pushing that ball, angling it into the right hander, trying to get them caught on the leg side. Rue, the left handed batter, now slips in place. It's kind of a backward point, deep third. You'll see there Clark's trying to angle the ball across him. Still with protection on the leg side. There's still four fielders out on that leg side boundary. Well, out on the leg side. A mid wicket, a mid on, deep square leg and fine leg. Allowing them to attempt the short ball. It's been a bit of a theme of the match, actually. Rather than trying to hide away from that short boundary, both teams have seen fit to put two fielders out on the boundary to give themselves that protection, but use the short ball often in an attempt to kind of lure them into a false shot. Just another short delivery. The Rue comfortably ducks under. It's the end of a maiden over. Somerset 122 for four. Rue is done by a really good piece of bowling in the first innings by Gus Atkinson. Um, bowling from that same angle that Clark was deploying over the wicket to the left hander, just pushing the ball across him. And he was drawn into a drive, a slightly fuller and slightly wider delivery, and ended up nicking it behind. And that looks to be the way Surrey will try to dismiss him second time round as well. I, I like your point about the, the shorter boundary. I think at times. Um, the boundary is not as short as it sometimes is, but I think teams away sides in particular can get too preoccupied mm. with thinking about that shorter boundary. Like I think there was a game last season where Knotts played here and Knotts bowled their leg spinner, Calvin Harrison, with a fair bit of success actually with the short boundary on the leg side. I think in general, one of the obviously, if you're used to coming to the marquee fixtures, international fixtures, you'll see kind of matches in the middle of the square, kind of so it lines up the TV cameras. I think sometimes the best times to come down and watch cricket live is county cricket, is if a team's playing right over at one side of the wicket, because you're so close in the stand, you can perch yourself up at Cal Corner and really get an appreciation of the speed of the game, whilst also effectively being at kind of deep backward point. Yeah, I was. Um, I had a, my, my housemate actually came to watch the final session on day one, free entry off the tee, folks, um, and he was watching it from basically just left of the sight screen, quite close to the front row, maybe row three or four. And it almost felt like we were in the boundary of a club game in Absolutely. terms of how close we were to the action. And yeah, that's it. It's a good point. You get. You can get up close in a way you can't quite in a test match because of, because test match pitches are bang in the middle of the square. I remember coming here with a few friends a couple of years ago. It's when Tim David had a spell here at Surrey. It was in the One Day Cup and he scored an outrageous century. And just seeing the power of it, he was routinely hitting sixes into the road over the stand to our left-hand side by the gasometer. Just such a rare occasion where you get to see elite athletes kind of at, the work, at their work in such close quarters. It's the end of the 43rd over, I believe. End of the 42nd, actually. 43 overs have gone. Whichever way that makes it makes sense. 122 for four. Got Lewis Goldsworthy on 42 off 95. James Rue, one off 10. Steele completes another maiden over. His figures are two for 28 off 13. Just going along at two runs and over. We see here just the difference in the fields for the right hand versus the left hander no slip for Goldsworthy on 42 not out just one catching mid wicket and that man at silly mid on who's pretty much where the, where the non striker is standing straight again defended to mid off we had uh, Ben Bloom the author Ben Bloom on at lunch and there's a lot of chatter at the moment around his book and the, around the future of English cricket um, and county cricket in particular I think one of the strengths of our system is, is just how much cricket young players can play even before properly establishing themselves so 
Um, Lewis Goldsworthy is 23 years old. He's not fully been in Somerset's first choice Red Bull team. You know, he's it's his 24th first class game, 21 list A games, 25 T20 games. Talking about Tom Lambie earlier, he's the same age, played something like 100 professional games, if not more. And he's 23 years old. It surprised me looking at Lewis Goldsworthy's cricket archive. He only played only played two first class fixtures last year. He's in his second first class fixture of this season, mm. having that opportunity at number four. I remember it happening with Sam Curran all the time. He, um, an old boss of mine, a couple of years ago, was like, "Oh, he's quite an experienced Sam Curran." I mean, he's played about three hundred games. He's just he's twenty three. Just started playing when he was seventeen. Hey, obviously, there are, there are pros and cons about having a, a bigger first class system where there's less talent concentration. I remember, um, go back to the 2021 summer, Henry Nichols and, and Dan Lawrence, I want to say, are about five years apart in age, maybe maybe even more. And, and, La and Lawrence had played more first-class cricket at that point in his career than Henry Nichols. Lawrence, another one who sort of made a name for himself as a teenager. He scored 100 here when he was just 17 years old. I think it's something there. Beginning to talk about in football, there's more of a train of thought where you, you don't really judge a player by their age. You play them judge them by their number of playing years. So I think it really came to account with Deli Ali, the former England player who was obviously at Tottenham for so long. And people say, well, he's kind of stopped really playing that top-level football in his kind of late twenties, early thirties. People say, well, isn't that sad and that disappointment, waste of talent? You could say all of these things. And someone said, well, actually, no, he had, he had about 12 years at the top. And if, mm. someone, if someone does that from 24 to 36 or 23 to 35, that's a perfectly respectable career. It's just they were so superb at one end. Clark Fuller again, and that's driven crisply by James Rue. He will pick up four. That's his first boundary. Slightly full from Jordan Clark, looking to push the ball away from James Rue. Doesn't quite get it right, and Rue punishes him. Uh, this is Surrey's, the downside of Surrey's plan, which is natural with any kind of tactic to try and get someone out. They're trying to slide that ball across and trying to induce that drive from James Rue. On the flip side, as Jordan Clark just got a little bit too full, Rue drove very nicely down the ground. He's immediately changing the angle, mm. coming round the wicket. I'll be interested to know if that is as binary a swap as it's presented as that Clark has had been driven once and gone, no, don't fancy this. bit more stump to stump you feel from around the wicket it is a bit more stump to stump as Clark finishes his over it's 128 for four but you could make the counterpoint that if Clark as he is is getting that natural kind of shape away from the left hand into the right hander if you can translate that to around the wicket when the angle is a bit more extreme and be able to challenge the stumps and the outside edge all in one well that sounds kind of the perfect combination that's why what Kemar Roach and Stuart Broad have done so well over the years to left handers some more correspondence from our viewers. This one's from Matt in Peckham. Good afternoon, sorry broadcasters. As a West Country lad transplanted to South London, I went along to the Keir Oval to catch the final sessions on Friday and Saturday. For reasons not related to cricket, I am now nursing a hangover of epic proportions, but your coverage is getting me through summoning the strength to start cooking a roast let's hope somerset can muster a fight back while i'll peel the spuds fantastic work from you all keep it up well best of luck matt that sounds like a tough afternoon <laughs> i'm going to peck them later might me up the full toss from steel but rue can't get that away he'll be frustrated with himself there. there's an enormous gap between mid-off and the fielder on the offside boundary. He finds it at this time, of a much better delivery, pushes it into that gap for just a single.
Cameron still continues his very accurate spell, especially to the right hand as he settled in fabulously well. Goldsworthy on 45, approaching a half century. Another full toss, and this one's whipped into leg side. And once more, the Somerset batter can't take full advantage of the full toss served up to him. Just one for Goldsworthy. He moves to 46 off 98. Also a reverse sweep from James Root. He finds a man at a backward point. Somerset 131 for four. Goldsworthy looking solid on 46, not out. Root new to the crease, six not out. Struck a beautiful drive down the ground for four off the previous Jordan Clark. Oh, we've got a double substitution in the commentary box. Cam has already vacated his seat. Adam Collins will take over from him, and Dan Norcross will take over from me. Beautiful technique on the double change there, Yaz. Loved it. Looking forward to hearing from you later in the day. Looking forward to seeing Goldsworthy push on here as well. Starved of opportunities last couple of years, making the most of it here at the Oval. Batting well. Over to Daniel. Ooh, it's flown through nice and quick from Jordan Clark. We've had a lot of emails today, many of them coming from North America. We've had a North American themed mm. day today. So you keep them coming. Surrey Cricket? Surrey Broadcast. Surrey Broadcast. At gmail.com. Surrey Broadcast. Learn it, live it. <laughs> At gmail.com indeed. What are, we, what are we up to now? 15 wickets for spin for Surrey this season? I think how many? 17. 17. 17 as I live and breathe. There was nine last in the last game of last year, wasn't there? And you had to go back. There was 17 in total last season, nine in the final innings of the season for Surrey. And they've racked Utterly up 17 mad. in, what three are we innings. now? Four innings. Uh, uh, no, th three innings. Three, three innings. innings. Yeah, three. Yeah, of three. there's only one innings in the... With still six oh. wickets in the, not even two and a half innings. There's a man out in the deep. Place, it's a big old boundary away to our right on the Harleyford Road side, the Archbishop Tennyson School side. So boundary riders have tended to be 15 to 20 yards inside that boundary. Just back to that spin. Alex Stewart spoke in the pre-season about the side needing to evolve. If you do the same thing as you did the year before, it's improbable you win again. That all makes a lot of sense. Sides need to set new benchmarks for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one area of their game. Wickets with spin that wasn't a big part of the story. Well, they've they've found something in the first fortnight with the Kookaburra ball, steel especially. Yes, I mean, what will come into play more once the Dukes gets in their hands is mm. that there will be fewer opportunities, you would think, in the next couple of rounds, especially this time of year. And you would think you'd be more, more in it with the Dukes for the likes of Kimar Roach, Tom Laws, who swing it a bit more. It'll be interesting to see the composition of the team. I mean, Cameron Steele's done very, very well, but how do you leave him out? But, well, they're ruthless here. And we've seen in the last few years when we've had this block of games at the start of a campaign, a little bit of management, shall we say, of, uh, of fast bowlers. You're not going to see the same three or four turn out every single week. That's improbable. So you look through Surrey's forward calendar from here. Next week they have Kent away. The week after, Hampshire at home. Then Warwickshire at home. Then Worcester at home. Then Hampshire away. That's all in a run. They don't get a week off. That's a lovely shot. Placement was perfect there. It wasn't too far away from point. Left hand they're off. It's Skipped away from boundary off the last ball of the over. 136 for four. The deficit now is just seven. Now, Nicholas from Canada has been back in contact and he says, Surrey broadcast team. Well, that is what he calls us. Let's so just see the replay of the last ball. Beautifully played. I will check out Daniel's podcast ASAP. You really don't need to, but um, if you want to, 
yeah, it probably comes with a series of trigger warnings. I hope our producers put them on. Daniel's podcast, plural. You, you're a, you're a regular feature well, in a lot of them. Yeah, yours, the final yes. word podcasts, and TMS, TMS, and yes, I'm even doing one now. It's got nothing to do with cricket, in which I have to interview people who are genuinely clever and know lots about things. That's mm. actually quite arduous. I is have to is this the, for that. Is this the Authors Eleven podcast? Kind of. Mm. Although you know, we we, we have <laughs> non-authors as well. Melissa Harrison's not played for them, for okay. example, the great nature writer. She gave us a fantastic interview, which I'll, I will mention later on. But back to Nicholas, who's in Ottawa. With regards to Andrew searching for the Ottawa ground, it is beautiful Rideau Hall. Oh, oh. beats the outside edge. He's turned it consistently on a pitch that you know, the off spinners haven't had a great deal of fun from. It's a wrist spinner, of course. He's going to get a bit more. It hasn't turned a lot, but that's all it needs to turn, isn't it? Just that little fraction just past the outside edge. Love the energy through the crease. He's followed through. Both feet are off the ground, not just waiting for the catch, but really thrusting forward there. See it again here. Yeah. Getting dip on the ball because that action, the pivot, it's all in sync at the moment for him. Yeah. There's a lot going on to Cameron Steele delivery. He's got six wickets in the match so far, batted nicely as well. Rare occasions he's actually dropped short, but it'll just be the one. Rideau Hall is the home to the Governor General of Canada. It's where I myself play, says Nicholas, with the Ottawa Cricket Club, founded in 1849, and thus older than independent Canada <laughs> itself. Oh, Canada. <laughs> We play amid bemused tourists and sceptical Mountie security all throughout the summer. You are all invited, oh this is great news, mm. to our Heritage Clubhouse as my personal guests whenever you choose. Now, that's got to be a trip. Andrew Sampson is getting straight onto Skyscanner. <laughs> I like that. And um, we were asked a question about the only Canadian to have played cricket for Surrey. Was this a question that was <coughs> solved by Samo at the time, or is this an open No, he didn't, he didn't solve it. Okay. There was £100 in it if we could solve it. <laughs> so we're going to come to it now. End of the over, 137 for four. That deficit now down to just six. The Canadian Surrey player in question is Arthur Farmer, born 1815, died 1897, who played one match for a Surrey 11 against MCC during a career of 10 first-class matches, mostly with Cambridge. He scored three at number 11, a Surrey, won, a Surrey 11 won by an innings and 87 runs at Lords. Ah, oh, them's were the days. <laughs> we don't get to play at Lords anymore because Middlesex aren't good enough to be in the first division. But <laughs> one day. As Daniel guessed, he moved to Canada after his first-class playing days and indeed played for Canada once as well as some other local clubs. He says he's looking forward to seeing a result in this match. Well, a positive result would be lovely, wouldn't it? But um, at the moment, Somerset batting well here. It's got a bit cloudy and a bit breezy. As Dan Lawrence is into the attack. It's a spin at both ends here. There is a left-hander at one end, which should assist Dan Lawrence. He picked up two wickets earlier today. One with just his second ball to get rid of Sean Dixon, caught down the leg side. Stifled appeal, I think he got outside the line there. Sharp spin on that delivery, which mm. nearly was the undoing of Goldsworthy. He had quite a life by the looks of things here, Artie Farmer. Artie? He, uh, he was studying at Cambridge and played for the university in the 1830s. He took 25 wickets, including uh, five in an innings and ten in a match, and that was in the university match against Oxford in 1836, so, so a prestigious fixture there. For Cambridge, though, yeah? Yeah, for Cambridge mm. and the other mob. Yeah. He played, yes, further first-class fixtures following graduation. Played against the MCC. And then for the MCC against the combined Oxbridge University's team. And Surrey against the MCC. So a lot of MCC action there for him. 
He emigrated to Upper Canada, where he married, let me try and get this right, Louisa Emily de Blackier, daughter of uh, someone who was noteworthy. I'll better check his page. Oh, a, a politician. He married the daughter of a politician. The first chancellor of the University of Toronto. Sounds like a bit of a polymath, our arty. So he married well by the looks of things. And he died in Buffalo, New York, where I lived for a year when I was a student mm, yeah. in 1897 at the age of 82. There you go. So he left Canada to go to the United States. Yeah. Presumably yeah. after independence. Didn't like independence. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it's lovely that we're able to memorialise our Arthur Farmer today. He had a another over ticks by, 48 gone in this innings, 138 for four. Just give me a little eye on Surrey's over rate, and it's good. It's plus two. It's a little ripple of applause. It's like no, it's not for Goldsworth, he's 50, he's on 49. So he stands on the threshold of a half century now. Had a uh, nephew that played a couple of first class games for the MCC as well in the, in the, uh, between 1905 and 1906, so a cricketing family even after they... Your team now, of course, Colo, do you feel an affinity <laughs> with MCC now that you play for them? Yeah, well, made my debut, debut. Debut, yeah. Well, the batter's at the right ends at the moment with the right hander facing the leg spin of steel. That's how Surrey would like it. With the left hander, Rue facing Lawrence. But it's important just to note that overrate. Surrey are now going nicely. They were a little tick behind when they started this innings. Spin on at both ends is going to, you would think, keep it good. And that's a half century. For Lewis Goldsworthy. He's not looked in any trouble at all. Unhurried, unfussed, very compact. And he's frustrating Surrey here. Didn't have a great first innings, he's bounced back well in the second. His work is not even perhaps even halfway done yet, but he's keeping Somerset in this game. It took until September to get back in the Somerset first team for Goldsworthy last year. Made 100 upon return at, at Taunton against Kent. But, you know, there are these opportunities in the Somerset top six at the moment with Abel injured and Kola Kadbor uh, playing in India. And, look, if they were all available, maybe he wouldn't be in the first team to start the season. But here he is making it count here against the, the defending champions, and that, that won't be for nothing. So bit of a shootout with Tom Banton as well. Of course, yep. that's one player. And uh, he's, he's got the better of Banton in this match so far. You'd think Dixon as well, given and he Dixon, averaged 23 yeah. last year and he missed out in both innings here. Oh, the reverse. Which is a risky shot, but played pretty well by James Rue. He's unfurled that a couple of times. I wonder with James Rue how much he's thinking he has to impress in style as well as runs. He scored all those runs last year, but there's so much talk in the England setup about the way you score your runs, the speed at which you get them. You look at Ben Folkes, has been prolific in county cricket, but mm. that doesn't stop the England selectors wanting a more aggressive approach. I wonder if there's a nagging voice at the back of James Rue's mind going, I've got to develop a range of shots. <laughs> I hope not, for his sake. I'd like him to be able to develop at his own pace, in his own way. Because he's got a nice looking setup. He's standing on off stump here. Mm. I've noticed that he kind of opens up as the ball's being bowled, so he looks out towards cover and has the front foot in front mm. of the back foot, then at the last moment just gives himself a bit more room to access the ball, as, the, as, as they say now, the modern players. We've been set a task. We're going to come to it at the end of the over. I did see that. I might set it up for you, actually. Well, that's what expertly played. The conventional sweep this time doesn't need to reverse it. It's a good old piece of it along the ground, down through deep backward square, and that means scores are level. Sorry, we'll have to bat again. I didn't think that was ever really in doubt at the end of the over as we 
Take a look at this again. He's tried a couple of reverse sweeps, but this time, look at managed one. I feel like Somerset have really hung in there over the last two days. They they, they never really threw in the towel yesterday. They kept Surrey in check. Today took the wickets they needed to bat again. Yes, they, they conceded that 143 run deficit, but losing two relatively early wickets here, you could imagine a world where things fall away with scoreboard pressure. That it's not been the case through Lamanby, Goldsworthy, Renshaw for a time earlier. Now getting to scores level with six wickets in hand. So this is the task that's been sent me. Okay, I'll read it out. This is from uh, Jack. Uh, many happy returns to Daniel. Mm -hmm. With his birthday in mind, can he work out who are the top ten players with more international runs combined than the days he's been alive? So the first task for us is to work out how many days you've been alive. So let me do. Be, so uh, I'm you're good at this stuff. Well, 55 years, and I've been alive for about 14 leap years, perhaps. So 55, 50 times 365 would be. Uh, 18,250 18,269 if I add in the leap years plus 1,820-odd. 1, Where was I up to? 1820, I said 18,269 was your first number plus 1820, 20,089. 20, so we're looking at, let's yeah. go, let's set it. At, at 20,000 20, runs. 20,000. Well, international runs. Sachin Tendulkar. He's got 15,900 okay. test runs or whatever it is. So. Yep. One. Looking for 10. Surrey Broadcast at gmail.com if you want to play along. Ricky Ponting, surely, with all those ODI runs. Blake from Sri Lanka, who went pretty well. Kumara, might, might Sangha, Kara. Um, Raul Dravid. I think he'd be up there. Decent chance, yeah. Certainly played enough one-day cricket to make it possible. What did Jai... Oh, a little bit of fumble, but it's going to get away with it. Jai Warden, he played a lot of one-day cricket. Mm-hmm. I've got five so far, yeah. Who else is in the 10,000 club? Eunice Khan? Well, I doubt he would have made enough one-day runs. Eunice. I wonder if Chris Gale gets close. Mm, with the T20 the runs. T20 top runs plus the ODIs. Put a lot of ODIs, mm. didn't he? I think he might be a. He might be a dark horse. 50 overs, 143 for four for our top 10. So there been a glut of 10,000 run makers. Yeah. But we can. Alan Border went beyond. So it was Gaviska, then Border, then a ton of them. So yeah. Steve Waugh. Steve Ward played a lot of he played a lot of one day cricket, lot of one although day. tended to bat five Burst or six. Down the order a bit. We've done no T twenties. Mark War, Jack made. Callis has got to be up there. Jack Callis, there you go. Mark War or Full Short, he was about eight thousand in both, and he's pre T twenty. Sanath Jaya Saria would be a would an outside bet, but because he played so much one day cricket, but I don't know if it'll be enough to tilt him over into the 20,000 mark. Where's Joe Root in all this? He can't be far away. He's got he can't 13,000 test runs or something like that, hasn't he? Nearly, nearly 13,000. 12, 12 and a half. 12 and a half? Uh, no, I beg your pardon. 11.7. 11, 11.7, 11, OK. So I don't know if he's got 8,000 ODI runs. I know Coley's got 99 professional hundreds at the moment. That's including domestic, so when you... Not, not just international. Yeah, Virat Kohli's got to be in there. So has Kohli made enough across the three? Probably. Not made as many test runs as you'd think, though, would you? I like how we're not allowed to use Samson's database. He's just looking well, at the Can he confirm when we've got it right? So oh, yes, that's a good point. Yes, I think we're just looking at Daniel's days and then the runs against that. So the fact that he's not... <coughs> Are you confusing me? What's, what's no, up? no, it's OK. I think we're OK again. We're still looking at 20,000 runs, aren't yep. we? Yep, So can we tick them off? <laughs> we need to make a note of these, you know. Mm. Tendulka. 
Dravid, Ponting, Ponting Callis, Sangakara, Sangakara, possibly Jaya Wardena. Possibly, probably Jaya Wardena, maybe Coley. Probably Coley, T20 runs. Yeah. Would tip him over. <laughs> Dravid, possibly. Dravid feels a distinct possibility, although he's one day as surely. Mm. Lewis Goldsworthy comes back onto strike. For the last ball of this over, a little bit of confusion. It's a little bit messy out there. Just need to get back on it here. The lead. Are we a chance for Peterson to feature here? No, I wouldn't have thought so. Not quite. It was 8, His yeah. career wasn't as long as you think, no. was it? 2005 to 2014. Yeah. He didn't quite get to Gooch, did he? 8,900 8, no. was... Goldsworthy drives that last ball to short extra cover. It's been a fine knock from Goldsworthy. He's 50 from 120 balls today. As frustrated Surrey. Let's take a look at some of his highlights. Lovely drive through the offside when the sun was out. I remember that. It was <laughs> nice and warm then. Not afraid to give it a bit of a biff. That was at a tough Scalabari. time as well. That, that was when they were in a bit of strife. Got the full toss and put it away straight away. That was one of the shots of the day. Very close to the stumps at the non-striker's end. You can see here, though, that he's, he's happy playing both sides of the wicket. It's been a very accomplished knock from Goldsworthy. He's looked in no trouble whatsoever. And they were consecutive balls off Overton. His first over into the attack. Straight drive for four. Bit of a correction to leg stump. Clipped him through mid-wicket for four the next ball. It's a good presence at the crease. I'm going Chris Gale. Does computer say yes? No. Mm. So did he say there's ten? Well, I'm surely I, I posited. Twelve players with twenty thousand runs. Mm. Oh no. Needed to turn back a little more sharply than that, but Dan Lawrence has got the left handed rule on strike now. So we'll take a look at this replay. I think we'll find this ball just drifting a little down the leg side. Yeah. Well, it's not far. It's uh, straightened a little bit. So I think it was worth the question. Leg slip in place. No fine leg. And that's exactly where James Drew's going to hit it. There's a gap there, but I think... This has wisely been left open. He did this before, did Rory Burns, when he offered that area to Matt Renshaw and Lawrence ended up getting him LBW on the sweep. So I don't think Rory Burns is going to mind too much that Rue is playing the sweep. He'll be perfectly happy for a couple of fours to go down there if he also buys the wicket. Are they looking for the ball? No? Was did it hit the spectator? Oh, the ball's hit the spectator, oh actually. She's okay. So it's Has that pulled. bounced up off the rope? Yeah, maybe off the spongy rope. It's on that angle. That's nasty. No, it's not a spongy rope over there. It's just the traditional. Yeah. And it's a very difficult one when you're in the crowd because you're not expecting that. You see it going along the ground and suddenly it flies up. Looks like she's heading up the steps towards the pavilion. A bit taken care of up there. Interesting that that leg slip position. It's a, it's a spot that goes in and out of fashion, I think, that, mm. that the leg slip. You see, didn't see an awful lot of it. Till maybe the last 10 years or so. Certainly in modern cricket, it wasn't a position you'd see too much of for finger spin. But now, use someone like Ashwin or Nathan Lyon. They seldom bowl without one. Certainly in the second innings of matches. A lot of catches around the corner. At Surrey, it was a very potent position throughout the 50s, wasn't mm. it? Mm. I remember talking to Doug Insole about this as the 52nd over the innings comes to an end, 148 for six. But in the 50s, players played predominantly, played spin with the bat out in front of the pad. So the reason why Jim Laker would have a very fine leg slip would be the ball turns to the right hand, it gets the inside edge and goes to leg slip. Nowadays, 
you play with a bat sort of by the pad, you're looking more at a bat pad, so you're yeah. getting a, a squarer catch really to short leg. Whereas in the 50s, you're leaning forward, and the ball would tend to go finer, often inside edge. Well, where there's more leg slip now for that, far fewer silly points. Yes, you're right. Often hear it called for when, mm. it, when, when, when a batting side's holding out, where's the silly point? But it's just a, a mode of dismissal they're not as keen on now. Mm. You don't see it often. It's funny how voguish things can be. Mm. That one just slides straight on. So how many have we got? We've got eight. Jaya Saria. So we've not, so, so I think Samo's counting names. We just said, right. Even if they we were unsure at the time. Okay. So a couple more. I'll tell you what. A weird outlier might be. Ganguly played a lot of one-day cricket, but and he opened the batting, didn't he? No. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking, guys that have played a lot of limited overs cricket at the top of the order. At the top of the order. Possibly even. I mean, if Barbara Azam was a couple of years older, like players that have. It's nicely driven. There is a long on in place. You'll see into your shot. We're apparently out. missing a very obvious one, which doesn't reflect well upon so either of us. We've got three balls to go and we're off, by the way. Ravid Ponting. Did we... Uh, did, uh, it was... Sammy Cara, Jaya Wardner. So no South Africans. We're going to rule them out, apart from Callis. We've got him... Brian saying. Lara. Brian Lara, he's pretty good at cricket. Yeah, that was strange to miss out the world record holder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another Graham South African Smith? in the 12. No? Another A B. South A B. A B. There, he is. there we go. Of course, there's it's 10. A Who are the other two, Andrew? Inzi. Oh, Inzi's there, yeah. And Chandapal. There you go. Of course, Chandapal. Oh, now that looks close. Cameron still loved that. That was a very risky shot. I mean, I say shot, it was more like a indeterminate little dab, a reverse dab. You can see why Cameron still was keen on that. We need to see the, the front-on view, really. If anything, it might have done too much from what we saw from the behind view there. Also, the outside-the-line factor with the impact. He's getting that to turn quite sharply in. We're going to have a double change. We are. Yaz is going to come in for me. So I shall make way. We, I think we might have answered your question. We're just going to take a little look at that LBW again. Oh, done a bit too much. He is mm. fair way forward. Anyway, Yaz is going to come in now. Thank you, Daniel. I'm not sure who's replacing me. It'll be someone. Maybe you can find out, Daniel, as you make your way. Often, and Yaz jumps in in your place. What did you make of that leg before shout? I think it's done too much. Done too much. I think it's done too much. I think it's one of those where it either was going to be hitting him, out, hit, hitting him outside the line of off stump or spinning past leg. Mm. Uh, definitely hit him in line, but I think that would have gone on to comfortably pass leg stump. Double spin continues. Dan Lawrence. James Ruin, who rocks back, pushes it to Kimar Rocha cover point looks like I'm staying with you for another 10 minutes before Kachi jumps in so sounds good to me I was just going to say before the ball got to Kimar Roach not seen a lot of him this inning just mm. four overs so far 53 bold and just 10 in the first innings yeah easing himself into the season Rue gets down on one knee again. Picks up two. He looks really keen to, to, to use that sweep shot, doesn't mm. he? Early on, he reverse swept one from Cam Steele. There was the LBW shout at the end of the last over. And to be fair to him, Rory Burns is leaving vast space behind leg square, leg, leg, behind square leg on the leg side. Lawrence again. Oh, chips it just past a diving Lawrence. Would have been a screamer. Would have been a screamer. 
You can see why Surrey are persisting with the two spinners. They're creating half chances here. Little puff of dust as the ball pitched there yeah. as well, which is not for nothing. Spin to win here at the Oval. And also, on that previous delivery, encouraging turn, pitches full on, on leg stump, really straightens and draws a false shot from Rue. He's bowling with confidence, he's mixing it up. We said this morning that Shah Bashir yesterday looks like a bowler who, had, who felt at complete ease at the crease yesterday, the way that he buried what he was doing. And Lawrence strikes again, he picks up his third. James Rue edges that one straight to first hit. We were just talking about the turn that Lawrence was getting from around the wicket to the left-hander. It's another wicket to spin. Five wickets down, Somerset. All five to spin. Dan Lawrence has his third wicket. That's the 18th wicket, sorry, have taken this season to spin. In the entirety of 2023, it was 17. And again, you look the way he holds it back here. Bit of extra flight, giving it a chance to turn. Yep, that's a great take. To his left, at slip Overton. We nearly saw a screamer off his own bowling earlier in the over. And rightly celebrated three for Lawrence. Seven in the season for him already. Enjoying his new home ground. The added opportunity and responsibility. Took the new ball earlier. Picked up a wicket the first of this Somerset second dig. And picked up one in the middle session and final session now as well. It's not a classical off-spinner's action, but it's a classic off-spinner mm. dismissal. Around the wicket, on-off stump, turns just away, Rue defending, can only outside edge it, and worth reiterating, that is an outstanding catch from JV Overton. Very, very tall man, getting low, getting his fingers underneath the ball. And as we saw from that replay, a, a clean catch. Look at those figures from Dan Lawrence. 12 overs, 3 for 27. Somerset, 152 for 5. They only lead by nine and they're five wickets down. Although, as we said earlier, they bat deep. Pretorius at number 10 in the first innings. Averages just under 30 with the bat in first-class cricket. And as Andrew reminded us earlier, Shrebush is the only Somerset player not to have a first-class century to his hmm. name. Yeah, I just feel the way that Lawrence has commanded that crease throughout the course of the, the couple of days that he's had the chance to bowl in this match. He's varied it. Often you see with part-timers, they are so determined to land their stock delivery, if you like, that they can be a bit samey, a bit predictable. But that's not been the experience with Lawrence, who's varied his pace. And in that over, a couple of balls went straight through. Remember the one with the arm that was given not out leg before? Then later in the over, again, more flight, more turn, wider on the crease to let it go, finds the edge and... Well, as you say, that, that is a, a classic off-spinning dismissal and really enhancing your stocks. Change of bowling here as Gus Atkinson comes into the attack, replacing Cam Steele. Goldsworthy on strike. Resolute at the crease. 124 deliveries. 51 runs scored. Really crucial last hour or so. 14.5 overs remaining in the day. Well, this might be their best time to win the match here, sorry. And I don't mean winning it by close of play, but it's not going to be that easy to bat with the ball turning. It's not It's not at its brightest here. A bit of cloud overhead. And with Surrey feeling like they're in top of the game. The lead's only nine. One or two more here. And they may not require too much time tomorrow as that's helped away for four. Is that pad or thigh pad? No, it was on off the blade, so Goldsworthy another boundary. But if, if yes, if they can do the majority of the heavy lifting between now and the close, still plenty of time, then they may only need an hour or two tomorrow and, and mm. that weather forecast may not be as big a deal. And with about just under four sessions to go in round two, it looks like if this is a game that you can win, you might be the only division oh, one yeah. side winning. Yeah, there aren't many games. Oof, Atkinson bowling straight to Goldsworthy, who defends it towards mid-on, but more than a hint of an inside edge there. Does definitely did not middle it. So just one win last week in Division 1 with Essex doing the job on, on the final day. When thinking ahead to 
other games that might have rain as a factor. Such high scoring matches across the country, of course, that yeah, this could almost count as double if they can get the job done from here. Oh, stump the stump again from Atkinson, posing questions for Goldsworthy. Now, I'll tell you what, that says 80 mile an hour, but you can almost ignore that. That the, this isn't, I mean, the, 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 the discrepancy between what you see on the screen and, and the lived experience of watching it. And I know there's all sorts of speed gun politics around the world. I don't want to dive into that, but that's, um, that's a, that he's got wheels, Atkinson, and that mm. laconic approach, almost Archer esque with the way he lets the ball go. Uh, that, that's, um, that's a real test, even for Goldsworthy on 56. No, he's bowled with really good rhythm in this second innings. Not got a wicket to his name yet, but you feel like one's around the corner. But yeah, just looking around the grounds at the moment, just looking where where could we get results in Division One? Essex are currently 73 for two in their second innings, leading by 190 against Kent at Chelmsford for a long time today. It looks like Essex would be able to enforce the follow-on. Mm. But um, a Herculean effort from Ben Compton ensured that Kent got, got over the line. It's possible that Essex forced some sort of, um, you know, they might dangle the carrot at some point tomorrow. Again, Axon very straight. One slip and a man at a catching short mid wicket. That's the end of that over. Six runs from it. Somerset 158 for five, leading by 15. Elsewhere in Division 1, Hampshire are 6 for 1, training by 111 against Lancashire. So Lancashire on top there. Mm -hmm. At a really crucial final hour or so there. A couple more wickets and you'd say Lancashire in pole position, even with a bit of weather tomorrow to, to force home the victory. Uh, Notts uh, leading by 169 at Trent Bridge against Worcester. Three wickets down in the second innings again. Sort of similarly placed to where Essex are against Kent. Warwickshire, Durham. Well, I guess whether or not there's a result hinges on what happens for the rest of the day. Ben Rain is 93 not out. Durham only need another 48 runs to avoid the following, which is some effort considering that they needed 550 odd to avoid it in the first place. Um, Matt Potts, 28 not out there as well. Dan Lawrence continues. The new man, Lewis Gregory, defends it into the offside. It's good pace, isn't it? 51 mile an hour around that 50 number. It's exactly where you want to be as an off spinner. I think the wicket taking delivery was 50.2. Not trying to do too much. I really like how much air he gives it. You 50 mile per hour again. From Lawrence. Quite a few fielders back uh, for the new man. Sorry, I've toyed around what they've done with the field off Lawrence in this innings. Big shout for LBW, ignored by the umpire. Just bowling with beautiful rhythm. I think the pace is a big part of it. So, yeah, outside the line here is the replay will, will confirm high as well in all probability. You can see that side spin again, yeah. Mm. Bit high, but Lawrence won really well. Lovely. Yeah, and again, it's this that idea that getting the chance to bowl more, not just being chucked the ball for, you know, six overs here, eight overs there across a match, being said, no, no, you're going to put a shift in. It's mm. your job to bowl in this game. And owning that, feeling that. And also, he's been treated as a first-class citizen, this mm. spinner. I think too often in county cricket, you'll see overs bowled by spinners, and actually, they're basically bowling just to get the over rate up. Mm. Um, get through your overs quickly was you can tell here that Lawrence knows what his role is he's tossing it up putting a lot of action on the ball oh finds the outside edge again Gregory will pick up a couple of runs but it's another really nice piece of bowling from Dan Lawrence who's bowling with threat to both the right and left handers at the moment two right handers in now but you just 
a couple of overs ago, got the big wicket of James Root, one of the form players in the country in 2023. When he finds his length, he's very threatening because he gets a proper dip on the ball, mm. entices the player forward sometimes, and they don't quite get to that pitch of the ball. You're kind of climbing the ladder, isn't he? Getting up nice and high. Spinning down the back of the ball. Giving it a chance to dip. Not Again, you talk about part-time spinners who could end up just bowling darts because the, the objective is to, to not get smacked and try and attack the stumps. And spin's not as much of an issue. Well, that, that couldn't be any further from the case from what we've seen from Lawrence here today. Atkinson in again, and I wonder if we'll see a couple of short balls this over. We've got a man, mm. a deep fine leg, deep square, but also Kimar Roach is interestingly placed, a deep third, but quite a fine deep third. They're more, I think, for the top edge rather than the thick outside edge that goes through the gully region. Two more for Goldsworthy, he moves on to 58. Pretty handy they can give Roach a, a run before the close of play here. So it's 12.4 overs, you think it's it's going to be spin at one end, at our Vauxhall end. And the chance to throw the ball to Roach, it should be pretty fresh. 14 overs in the match so far. Didn't do a lot of work at Old Trafford last week either. There's a short one. They've gone up and he's got him. The short ball works for Atkinson. We were saying just in the previous over that a wicket felt like it was just round the corner for Atkinson. He's bowled with really good pace in this spell. Good rhythm. There's not a whole lot of movement out there, but Atkinson is causing problems. That's a huge wicket for Surrey. The in-man Goldsworthy falls for 58. Somerset 162 for six. He'll be disappointed with that, Goldsworthy, knowing the short ball was surely coming. It was telegraphed with the field. And the first time that he's gone upstairs, he's tried to hook him. And instead helped it into the gloves of folks. So extra pace from Atkinson, as we talked about throughout. But not great shot selection in the context of where the game is from Goldsworthy. We'll see it again here. What you'd say from Atkinson, that's a really well-directed bouncer. Yeah. It's not just short, it's straight. It's right at the helmet. Really difficult height to negotiate for Goldsworthy. And that is a huge wicket. Adam called it a couple of overs ago. This is a huge final hour for Surrey in pursuit of victory. Given what the weather might do tomorrow, and given where other games are at in this round of fixtures, if they can get another another one or two wickets here today, it could be pivotal. Gosh, I know it's an easy comparison to make with the way they approach the crease, but I don't want to overplay this point. But it, his bouncer does look like Archer's. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, it just, it, it, you, the front on action at the last moment, he lets the ball go in front of him, similar to Boomer as well. It just adds to that extra yard because the ball's literally being let close to a yard further forward than it would be a bowler who's letting it go with a more mm. classical side on action. It feels like his bounces are quite hard to pick up. Mm. Um, and he's got a very similar, very similar action, I think, to, to Archer. There's not a lot of visible change in it. I, mean, I don't think batters pick up cues from, from Atkinson very easily. So lead 19. Yeah, the captain Gregory now batting with Aldridge, who's had a good season so far. Pfeiffer in Surrey's first innings, but yeah, clearly a lot of work to do now. 12 overs till stumps. Short right. again from Atkinson. Got a leg slip in play. Atkinson got Aldridge with a short pitch delivery in the first inning, so I'm sure he'll use that ploy again. I think he played that okay, actually. There's oohs and ahs, but he did pull inside the line at the last moment. It's fine. But yeah, the two men back plus the leg slip. Uh, plus the deep third. You know what's coming. Two left in the over. Which ball will it be directed at the lid? Oh, again. Ouch. Aldrich gets in the way of it, but not 
Yeah, it looks like that struck the glove. Just take a moment, young man. No need to hurry through this, Aldridge. Might have even been wrist. It was certainly in that direction. Yeah, yeah. That's, on, that's on the jumper somewhere. That will not tickle. Tell you what, he's worn that well. <laughs> he's worn that very well. You wouldn't know. That might, that's going to leave a real mark. So the, the, the short leg goes in for the final ball. This will be a test. Double bluff. Slightly full of delivery. And Aldridge gets in behind that one. Somerset 162 for six. And sorry, are continuing to cause some problems with the Somerset batters. Even though there's not that much movement through the air, the spin of Dan Lawrence and the pace and bounce of Gus Atkinson is doing the work. Sorry, at the moment, Somerset 162 for six as Adam Collins takes a break. And is that it for the day for Adam? Catch you guys tomorrow. He'll be back tomorrow as Katia Whitney comes in for a really, really crucial last 12 overs of the day here. The whole question with the Kookaburra ball is how do you create as a bowling side wicket-taking opportunities when there isn't that usual movement through the air as the ball gets older. And sorry, through the spin of Cam Steele and Dan Lawrence and the pace of Gus Atkinson, have that threat. Katya, how impressed have you been with, with Dan Lawrence today? Someone who's not done a lot of bowling for Essex in the last couple of years. Four for last week, three for 29 this week. He's been really impressive. Yeah, I was looking at the um, at the at the Rue wicket before I came on air. Lawrence in again. And what struck me about that was it was a proper spinner's wicket, like flight through the air, fired into the pitch, bit straightened up a bit into the slips. It was a proper spinner's wicket, much more than a part timer. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how his role develops for Surrey, because. So we saw him coming in down the order yesterday um, and normally the opportunities have come a bit further up so if he's going to fulfil more of this all-rounder all role and, and bowl a lot more overs then it'll be interesting to see how that develops throughout the course of the season. Yeah, I think his batting position is a direct consequence of how much sorry, anticipate using him with the ball. I think they anticipate him doing a lot of a lot of work, bowling a lot of overs. I'll be interested to know Andrew. The most overs he's bowled in a in a county suburb before. Yeah, and he made no bones about coming to Surrey was largely to do with furthering his opportunities for England and and getting that opportunity to score runs. He's been England's de facto spare batter for a while now, having not played cricket for England since 2022 for about two years, I think. And that's a long time to be the next man or next cab off the rank without being able to force your force your way through. And with the with Jack Leach's consistent injuries and the young spinners, maybe he sees an opportunity over the summer on pitches that might not turn as much to force his way through. He's that kind of uh, Ben Stokes, Brendan McCullum player, uh, that kind of all-rounder. So it's not hard to see him coming through. Field change for Aldrich, mid on and mid wicket come in. Aldridge defends. Another over is completed. Some say 163 for six. Effectively 20 for six. I found it quite interesting how Rory Burns has been very flexible with his feels for his spinners. Completely different feel there for two different new right-handed batters. Aldridge has no one out of that inner ring. Whereas there's quite a lot of protection for, for Gregory, who was impressive with the bat in the Somerset first innings. <laughs> Atkinson draws another player miss. I think that one again maybe kept slightly low. Interesting looking at 
Gregory there getting really right back in his crease before the ball was even delivered. Almost certainly in anticipation of the short delivery. Again, a field difference between what Surrey have for Gregory versus Aldridge. No leg slip in, in play for Gregory. Aldridge, who looked a little bit uncomfortable early on against the short ball, having got out against the short ball in the first inning, he's got that leg slip in. Or oh, Fuller again from Atkinson. It's a point we've made over the course of the four days that Surrey's attack just has such a different feel to Somerset's. You think back to this morning when Surrey's tail were batting in, in sunshine and conditions and Somerset's attack looked looked like they were just waiting for things to happen, whereas this Surrey attack with Atkinson in it and with Dan Lawrence and with Cam Steele really makes things happen and you can feel now that Surrey are really hunting wickets under cloudy skies facing, facing Gus Atkinson with his tail up. Yeah, I think a huge part of Surrey's success is not just they have every week field five quality bowlers, it's five different bowlers, different types of bowlers. Even when they, they field five right arm seamers. You know, Dan Worrell is very different to Tom Laws, who's very different to Jordan Clark, who's very different to Gus Atkinson, who's very different to Kimar Roach. Go searching for a fuller ball. Tempted Yorker over pitches slightly, and Gregory drives that one straight down the ground. It's well retrieved, though, by Jordan Clark, the fielder at mid on, who saves one. Somerset runs three, which brings Aldridge on strike for the final two deliveries of the over. It's another point about, about Surrey's attack that when they do lose players to England, they'll lose Atkinson at some point this summer. They, they lose Jamie Overton occasionally to England, that they haven't lost their one point of difference. They've always got someone different coming into the attack at different points of the summer. And in terms of a sustained championship campaign, that's really important. Well, Cam Steele has essentially been the, the Will Jacks number two for a couple of years and does a really good job at that. Every time he comes in, does more than a job. Short again. And Aldridge sways out the way. Often in English cricket of the last couple of years, there have been lots of bowlers who take a lot of wickets with a new ball when it's swinging. There aren't many guys who take lots of wickets who predominantly bowl, bowl with the older ball. There have been times in the past where England squads are composed entirely of guys who are, who are new ball bowlers. I think that is a big part of why Atkinson has been fast-tracked over the last year or so. He excels at something where there are very few other English bowlers who even do what he does as he completes another over, three runs off it. 166 for six, 10 overs remaining in the day. Somerset lead by 23. Dan Lawrence will continue. So with this first ball from Dan Lawrence, this will be, so he's bowled 49 overs so far this season. After 49.1 overs, he will equal the most he has ever bowled in a county championship season. And then we just check the date. It is April the 14th. Do you think he would have picked that when, he's first, when he first came to Surrey, that he would have done that by the first two games? Or do you think it's a quirk of the conditions and the Kookaburra ball? I think the Kookaburra ball has definitely played a part. just in that spinners bowl more because it swings less but equally I, I think a lot of people this isn't this is by no means a hot take I think a lot of people saw um, we see the floodlights are now now on I think when a lot a lot of people when they saw Lawrence bowl for England briefly on that tour of the Caribbean a couple of years ago into the offside and quick single for Gregory they saw how much action he got on the ball and even off just just seeing him briefly in the Caribbean I think people thought you know this is this is more than a normal finger spin there's something different about Lawrence and on those very very flat pitches he, he looked okay Oh, dropped at first slip. Lawrence draws another false shot from a Somerset player. Aldridge. 
Aldridge edges one to Jamie Overton, who looks in more than a bit of discomfort here. He's not moved since getting to the ball, and yeah. it looks like we're going to have a break of break in play here. Um, yeah, it's been been a good 20, 25 seconds, and, and Overton has yet to move. Yeah, he went down immediately and immediately looked in quite a lot of pain. Wasn't concerned about where the ball was going, just was on the floor, head in his hands. Yeah, the sorry physio has, has run onto the field and we hope that Overton's OK. Took an excellent catch at first slip not that long ago off the bowling of Dan Lawrence to get rid of the dangerous James Rue. Did very, very well to, to get down to it, getting his fingers underneath the ball. As we look at the replay here, Lawrence starting outside off stump. There's that arc, the drip, the drop. And Oten gets to the ball, gets two hands onto it, but can't quite keep hold of it. It's like it's that right leg that he's holding. For a big man, he did well to get down to it, right low to the ground, diving to his left. He's a very, very good slip fielder, very reliable, both off the spinners and the seamers, as we look at the reverse angle replay here. Yeah, it looks like it gets stuck in the turf slightly, that right knee. Well, he's up on his feet, which is a, which is a good sign. Yeah, that's another aspect of Lawrence's performance with the ball that's been really impressive, is that he's been threatening to both right-handers and left-handers. And I wonder as well that there's, there's real similarity between how Lawrence bowls and how Will Jacks bowls. And I wonder, actually, as two guys who are predominantly batters, They've almost got an advantage as young spinners play so much white ball cricket and you're just doing your best to not get hit. So many young spinners, finger spinners coming through ball really flat. And it's noticeable that with both Jax and Lawrence, they give it so much more air than, than most finger spinners do. And sure, they're not finished articles by all means with the ball. You know, I, th I still think both probably not quite as accurate with their lengths as most um, top level finger spinners but they definitely get a lot of action on the ball they're not afraid to to toss it up and that's a big part of why I think we've seen Lawrence have success not only this week but last week against Lancashire you really get some serious flight air and crucially drop on the ball who deceives batters with his lengths as well Jamie Overton still on the field which is good to see Lawrence continues Oh, he plays and misses again. Yeah, something that struck me about Lawrence watching him over the course of, of today um, is that for someone who, whose bowling isn't their main discipline, there's a lot of thought in how he sends down his deliveries. You've seen him, with the help of Rory Burns, but doing some of his own fielding placements, moving some of the fielders, and he looks like he knows what he's doing. Lawrence Wh again hits the inside edge of Aldridge's bat. Which for part-timers which Lawrence is more than but for someone who could be considered a part-timer it's not always the case driven into the offside no run Dan Lawrence completes another over what figures he's got three for 31 off 15 overs um, before we see the 61st over the innings we're going to take a look at the six Somerset wickets to fall so far Lawrence striking with his first over opening the bowling down the leg side Sean Dixon and then again getting Matt Renshaw the overseas Australia bat who looked excellent in the first innings and Cam Steele with a big wicket of Tom Lambie who looked excellent in the first and second innings and getting one to stick into the pitch to get rid of Tom Banton for Lawrence struck again to get the dangerous James Drew with a lovely delivery and an excellent catch. Low catch from Jamie Overton for Gus Atkinson got in on the action to pick up the sixth Somerset wicket to fall. Yeah, I think on, on Lawrence we're already seeing a complete rebrand, I think. Um, in terms of the number of overs he's, he's bowled, he's already bowled, as we said, a couple of overs ago the most overs he has bowled in a single county championship season and we're only in round two um, he is a part-timer no more 
And I think Surrey knew what they were doing when they when they signed him. They had that in mind. You mentioned that he's a similar kind of kind of utility player to Will Jacks. How do you see Lawrence's introduction affecting Will Jacks' role in the side? Well, I think in in the 2024 summer at least, um, the IPL England white ball players will not play much county championship cricket, given where the fixtures are. You've got the IPL that's the first eight weeks of the season. Then you've got straight into the Pakistan T20I series, straight into the T20 World Cup. Cut into the offside, that's well fielded by the man at point. Then you have a couple of rounds in the middle of the summer. And then England white ball team play again in September. So I think if Will Jacks is around all summer, he might only be available for three rounds. And also, given his workload, given the time he spent away, I wouldn't be surprised if he takes a break during one of those rounds. Which is why I think Lawrence is such a good signing. He's essentially covering for the role that Will Jacks has performed over the last couple of years. And I think Alex Stewart was talking about this um, when he did an interview with, with Sky prior to, prior to the start of the season, that it's really important for successful sides to ta challenge their players by bringing in good players. So you don't keep things the same, always trying to freshen up, even if you've recently been successful. Another short ball from Atkinson that Gregory safely ducks under. You know, we're talking here about what do they do when Tom Laws, well, Tom Laws is available for selection, not playing today. What happens when Dan Worrell's back? You've got 13 players, the 11 here plus those two. You you feel really deserve to be playing. And that's, a, <laughs> I guess, sorry, would say that's a really good problem to have. Yeah, it's a huge squad with so much depth. Swatted away. Through the offside, Gregory will pick up four runs as the ball just about reaches the very, very long offside boundary. Gregory moves to 12, Somerset 171 for six. They lead by 28. I'm about to be replaced by Dan Norcross, who will take you through to the close. Now, it should be me to the close, but... I don't know if this has been discussed. Flurry of wickets. Let's say that catch had been taken the previous over. Seven down, another couple go soon after that. The extra half hour would loom on the horizon. Hello, Taha. Hi, Tan. How are you? Well, I'm just thoroughly absorbed by this brilliant game. Lawrence again denied Another wicket. Previous over. Drop catch. It's a sharp one to first slip. And low as well. It's a big man, Overton. But he's got terrifically safe hands. So it's fairly rare to see him drop one. Really good to see that he's OK. He looked in basically Ooh. a world of pain, basically, when he went down there. Didn't he? Clutching his knee. Absolutely. He looked like a top Premier League footballer at that point after being tackled gently from behind. I was concerned for him, but um, it's good to see he's back up and on his feet. Lawrence with three wickets today. Two of them, the openers. Oh, I say, that's not far away from off stump as well. See the umpire signals. I'd be very disappointing if it's. Is it going to be signalled as by? It is a rather rare, rare side of a by. There was one by in Somerset's first innings, and um, it was when a bouncer was bowled to the number 11, Sharp Bashir. And Lewis Gregory called him through for a run to get on strike. So Ben Fox had taken every ball until that time. I think that's the first first bunnies of the innings. I think. So the first buys that have happened without 
the ball going into Ben Folks's glance. Nicely played by Aldridge. Easing onto the back foot, finding the gap between point and extra cover. Watched it right onto the middle of the bat. The lead goes up 36. It's a lovely shot. Don't, didn't look too short either, but he's uh, he's got well back to it. Well, he's a, he's a good looking player, but the problem is he bounced out the first innings, which is a bit of a red rag to the fierce bulls of Surrey's pace bowling attack. He's going to retain strike with that single off the last ball of the over. Seven remain in theory today and uh, I'm going to take you round the grounds round the grounds in the style of Kevin Howells at Chelmsford Essex 120 for three against Kent. They lead by 237. Matt Critchley's there on 16. Jordan Cox on 25. So they'll be batting out the rest of the day and need to battle a little longer into tomorrow before they can contemplate a declaration you would think. Glamorgan have declared and they have set Derbyshire 401 to win. They made 361 for seven in their second innings. And the, this is down in the second division. Cork 126 and James Harris 61. Not out. Gloucestershire against Yorkshire also in the second innings. Gloucestershire have been set the slightly unlikely target of 498 to win. And they are 47 for one. Cameron Bancroft unbeaten on seven from 39 balls at the moment, so he's digging in. Back into the first division, Hampshire against Lancashire. Lancashire got themselves a first innings lead of 117. A significant lead. Ooh, a slightly loose shot, that from Aldridge. And again, I think we're going to see a few short balls at Aldridge for reasons just discussed. Hampshire in their second innings, a 21 for one. Lost Middleton for one. Felix Middleton. But since then, Ali or and Nick Gubbins steadying the ship. But they've got a lot of work to do there to make that game safe. In the second division, Sussex declared on 694 for nine. Quite the total. John Simpson made his double hundred in the end, 205 not out he finished on. 23 fours and five sixes. Some biffing in the lower order from Jack Carson and Carvelas, who made 55 from 40. So that gave them a lead of 356. Leicestershire in their second innings, 53 for one. Now he's got hold of that well as Aldridge. And the despairing dive from Ollie Pope is in vain. So just letting Atkinson know he can play the short ball. Didn't quite get up. He's quite a tall fellow, Casey Aldridge. Got on top of it and hit it into the ground, which was the key to the success of that. Slightly flinchy, but I think it bothered the pigeons more than it bothered well, he Casey definitely, Aldridge. He's definitely watched it onto the bat. It's, and his reward is a that leg slip moving out to sort of backward square leg. There's an absolute run fest going on at Wantage Road. Only eight wickets have fallen in the entire match. North Hants made 552 for six, declared Middlesex in response. And I think there's a bit of pent up frustration in this. <laughs> a 515 for two. Max Holden unbeaten on 189 from 355 balls. In contrast, Louis de Pleu. He's 180 not out of 189 balls. It's impossible to say his name without channeling Inspector Clouseau, I find. Deploy. 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 I'm getting South African pronunciation advice here from Andrew Sampson. But oh. you know. Now, this last ball produced what's, what technically might be called a drop. But <laughs> I'm not going to... I'm not going to quite give it that status as the ball was hit firmly and at short leg. It looked rather painful. Jamie Smith in there. It's nicely played. Pitched up off the short balls. 
I wondered when Atkinson was going to go full on at the stumps, and he's done it there. So, Middlesex, sorry, 519 for two now. They trail by just 33 runs at the end of the over. Six remain in the day here. A tread bridge. Nottinghamshire made 399. Worcestershire in reply of 355, so deficit of 44. They've got Nottinghamshire in a bit of bother here at 143 for six, so that game is bubbling up. That game, weather permitting, looks like it could result in a positive result one way or the other. And uh, wickets have rather tumbled of late from 125 for one. Five have gone down for just 12 runs. I see if I mean made 40, Ben Duckett 63, Slater 23, no one else in double figures and four wickets for Smith. It's again nicely played by Aldridge. Back foot punch into the offside. And finally, Warwickshire against Durham. Durham were made to follow on in the end. So replying to 698 for three, they mustered a mere 517. <laughs> so that game is very much alive. The tail of that was 145 from Alex Lees. Ben Rain 93. Don't like they might avoid the follow-on, but they lost their last three wickets for ten runs. They were promptly put straight back in, and they lost an early wicket. Alex Lees, who had a great birthday for a while. With that 145 in the first innings, well, he's out, caught by Burgess off the bowling of Hannon Dolby for one. So, Durham struggling there. A lot of eyes are going to be placed towards the heavens tomorrow, you would think. Not least here at the Oval, where Surrey are in a very strong position. Good bit of fielding there. Ensured there'd be no single for Lewis Gregory. But it's, it's looking increasingly unlikely they'll be able to force a victory tonight now. I don't think the extra half hour is going to come into play. Just watching Lawrence these last few overs, I guess one of the distinctions you make between a, a part-timer and a frontline bowler is not obviously beyond the sort of obvious of wickets and overs bowled, but what they do with the ball, and he's getting lovely drift and some sharp turn as well. There's action there, isn't there? That's the thing. There's action on the ball. There's action in the action. Yeah. End of the over. It was ticked by. Five remain today. 187 for six. That lead 44. Just creeping up. And you, you, you constantly watch him and you wonder with the all the stuff that's going on before he actually releases the ball, does that help him? Does that hinder him? At times it looks like it gives him further momentum. At times it feels like he might be taking away something. Um, but at the moment he's got this nice shape going into the right-hander, which isn't always easy as an off-spin bowler. When you'd probably rather prefer bowling to the lefty and taking it away from them, going from around the wicket, but he's, yeah, he's getting a nice shape from over the wicket. and. I think he's going to be bowling alongside Cam Steele now. Yep, Cameron Steele back into the attack. He's got two right-handers to bowl at. So he will be taking the ball away, in theory, from the outside edges of both these batters, Gregory and Aldridge. So he's leading wicket-taker this season at the moment. Up two in this innings to go with a four in the first. Five at Old Trafford. So 11 wickets in the County Championship already for Cameron Steele. Just trying to keep his hands warm. It's got a bit chilly out there of late. It's a bit of a breeze. Oh, beats the outside edge. Indeterminate push from Aldridge. What he did so well in the first innings, I thought, so I was. Got lovely drift into sort of middle, middle and leg. And then just enough turn either to take the outside edge where Jamie Overton snaffled a couple of catches. Or on spectacular occasion to shiver the timbers. 
Yeah, it doesn't seem like he's a he's not a massive turner of the ball. You're not going to see too much side spin, but he kind of gets sort of over it a bit. So he gets a bit of extra bounce. He's not a he's not a big man, but the ball does sort of climb on on the batter. You saw it with the last ball. And he's got a, a busy action, hasn't he? Colo was pointing out both his feet off the ground in the follow through. It's a, it's a real effort goes into it. It's not a sort of rolling like, like Shane Warne is sort of coming off a couple of paces. Got an immense amount of spin, but the action was all in the shoulder. There's a lot of body in Steele's action. He takes another thick edge to backward point. Yeah, there's a lot of work in the follow through. I think Yaz pointed it out to me, and I think he mentioned it on air as well. Uh, sort of similarities to, to Yasser Shah, mm. both for Pakistan, many years. Well, that's a bit short, it's got the treatment. Very occasionally he's dropped short. No, actually, it's I've a lot of sympathy with him here because it is cold out there. If you're going to bowl wrist spin and your fingers are a bit cold when you come in, first over of a spell, just didn't quite land that. But it's well put away by Aldridge. He's looked a lot more comfortable against the slower bowlers. Four overs remain, that lead creeping ever further up to 49. Now, the news of the weather tomorrow is not great. Doesn't look like a washout, but it also looks like there will be interruptions. The rain irksomely is due to arrive at seven o'clock in the morning with light rain, gusty winds, and then, very disturbingly around 10 o'clock, heavy rain, 80%. That we don't like. I think there's every chance that the morning session will be in peril. Because the rain percentage likelihoods are big, up to around about one o'clock. So it could have an early lunch there. Furious work from the ground staff. And then the chance another little shower blowing in a little later around four o'clock. So Surrey would dearly like another wicket. Any wicket they can prize out tonight. It's crucial. So we could have a bit of sort of fruitless sloshing around for a morning session. We'll be here though on the live stream. Giving you weather updates. We'll send out hardy souls to report on sogginess. Nice bit of air from Lawrence. Probably just hoping the tempter a loose shot here from Gregory. He's just happy to show the forward defence. Well, if you're Somerset here, it's all about getting to the close, isn't it? Because they'll, they'll be aware of the weather forecast themselves. They don't want to give Surrey a sniff here in the last couple of overs. squirted away through backward point. That was, I think, quite clever bowling from Lawrence. He said, OK, if you're going to just defend the straight one, here's a tempt to see how you get on. And he nearly bought the wicket, but instead, Gregory gets away with it. And he also takes that lead up above 50. The lead 53 now, with three overs remaining. Yeah, that was, that was the one. I think Gregory's probably telling himself to, you know, just calm down, play sensibly, but it was wide. It was there to be hit, but he was, it wasn't a convincing stroke. No. But yeah, now <laughs> Aldridge is on strike, but Gregory, he definitely had a bit of fun in the first innings when he was facing Cameron Steele, and so he's going <laughs> to have to just temper himself a bit. Yeah, we've got a lovely staggered field on the offside. Again in the air, just in the gap where there aren't fielders. We've got a, an interesting field. There's a short extra cover, Dom Sibley, then there's a slightly deeper extra cover looking over Sibley's left shoulder. A wide-ish mid-off, a backward point. And then the sweeper, Kimar Roach, out on the deep point 
boundary about 15 20 yards in or so so here we go steal to Gregory that first ball there was just sort of that kind of pretty much bang on in terms of where you want to bowl right now as a leg spinner late in the day just tempting tempting that drive and seeing if they're gonna play it this late in the day when they really need to protect their wickets Yep, Gregory is, is doing a good job of looking like he's obdurate, resolute, and going to defend. So I wonder if Steele might just float one up. Backward point is sometimes quite a key position for the leg spinner, isn't he? Ball turns away, you go on the drive, you just slightly lose your shape, and it fades the backward point oh that looks very close oh my word that is a risky leave padding up this stage particularly to steel who's not turning it a great deal but it's still probably still missing off stump. Probably it's a tight one though, it's isn't a tight it? Tight one. If, it, if that was the Google, I don't know that it was. It sort of went maybe out of the front of the hand. Gregory survives, picks up a single. He's had a heart in his mouth when he padded that away. There was a huge appeal, but he survives. Two overs left in the day. But an email from Steve. Hello, Steve. You can email us at surreybroadcast at gmail.com. He says, I've had you on all day. Wow. Poor thing. Steve Shipcott. Thanks for making the day before I go back to teach that bit less depressing. Oh, Steve, I feel for you. It's a bit harsh on your students, Steve. Well, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know his students, Taha. <laughs> he might be... Might be being euphemistic. It could be worse. But Steve, I, I remember, we all remember having to go back to school as, as students. And I suppose the advantage of the summer break was that at least there was cricket to play. But if you're teaching, perhaps not so much. So our sympathies are with you, Steve. Hopefully you've got the odd free period here and there. You can keep an eye on us tomorrow. This game could well bubble up into an absolute nerve jangler tomorrow. If we lose a bit of play in the morning. Somerset dig in. Surrey desperate for those arse ball wickets. Who knows how deep this game could go tomorrow. Lawrence, just before that delivery, I think he signalled for everyone to just come in a few steps closer. Lights are on, we're into his last over of the day. So he just wants to add a bit of extra pressure. Yeah, there are no boundary riders. There's three in the ring on the offside, a backward point extra mid off. That slit and the short leg that you can see, forward short leg. And then backward square leg. Wideish mid wicket, a short mid wicket, and the mid on. So clearly, Lawrence is saying, "Do you want to try and whack a boundary over the infield? Give it a go." He's sort of dictating terms here, and interesting to know how much he's learned from Simon Harmer over the years, his old Essex teammate. He's been the best off spinner in the country for quite a long time now so Lawrence is you know Essex was mainly just watching on as a fielder oh look they all spread the field the field all spreads here because they quite like to bowl at Casey Aldridge perhaps I think that's what they're saying and you don't really like that as a batter do you <laughs> <laughs> he survives survives but ultimate over of the day there will be just one more over remaining in the day. If a wicket falls, they'll all troop off. 69th over of the innings. So a new ball 
will become available in 11 overs tomorrow. But as I say, a lot of eyes will be spent staring at the heavens. You're back in tomorrow? I am. Huzzah. Hopefully not to watch the rainfall in the morning. So 200 up for Somerset. That's the applause you can hear ringing out around the ground. There's still some hardy spectators who have quite sensibly brought some more layers today. The first two days were glorious, warm spring days. Today we've been hurled back into early spring. So Aldridge will be back on strike with four balls left. Sorry, won't be displeased by that. That was a little bit surprised there that they opted for the single. Well, I suppose in number eight, isn't it? You take any run you can get at this stage, don't you? Just trying to eke out as big a lead as possible. Oh, it's <laughs> the outside edge again. It's a bit, a bit quicker that ball. It was 51 miles an hour, a couple of miles an hour quicker than Steele's average. Just a bit more on yeah. that. That was so close to the outside edge. Two balls to go, two balls to survive. That's all Aldridge and Somerset will be thinking of here. Been another enthralling day's cricket. Surrey on top, but Somerset hanging on. That's well bowled again from Cameron Steele. He's bowled a really nice line this over. Forcing Aldridge to play it. All four, all three deliveries that he's faced so far. But I wonder if he just tosses this one up a bit slower. Silly point in there to just add to the drama of the last ball of the day. Here we go. Last ball of the third day. Oh, it nearly gets through. Expansive drive, a thick inside edge. That's the power of the silly point, isn't it? Someone comes into your eye line. But Aldridge survives, moves to 20, 204 for six. Somerset will close on. They lead by 61. Let's take a look at those six wickets to fall today, predominantly to Surrey's spinners. It started the wicket of Sean Dixon, who just flicked one down the leg side. Well taken by Ben Folks. Then Matt Renshaw on the sweep, trap, bang in front, LBW. That was the first two wickets there to Dan Lawrence. And then Cameron still getting one to spin back in and trapping Lamanby LBW. That was a horrible spoon to backward point. Then Lawrence again with the edge, expertly taken by Jamie Overton. And, well, a big pull by Goldsworthy. Gets a feather off Atkinson through to the keeper to depart. It was a big wicket. Goldsworthy had played really well for his 58. Goals early 58, Lamb will be 51, the top scorers. But again, look at Surrey Spinners. Lawrence, 3 for 45 off 19. He's bowled accurately and consistently. And Cameron Steele, 2 for 53 from 21 overs. They're giving very little away. They've not got a lot to play with. There's not a huge amount of assistance in the pitch, but it's been spin. Spin has been the story of much of this match, quite bizarrely. Earlier in the day, Surrey advanced to 428. Casey Aldridge got good reward for his efforts taking five for 64 there was some good lower order resistance from Surrey but it was hard going it was it was tricky to score runs quickly so it's been a slow day in terms of runs scored but an enthralling one with wickets going down at regular intervals tomorrow 
we're going to be gazing at the skies, hoping that we can get out there as soon as humanly possible, because Somerset lead by 61, but with six wickets down, and with interruptions likely, this game could go, who knows, it could go anyway, yet. Why do you join us? 10.45, Zahar will be here, I'll be here, Andrew Sampson will be here, Adam Collins will be here. The crew will be back. I don't know if Cameron Ponson will be here. Phil Walker will be here. Jake will be here. All our cameramen will be here. 10.45 tomorrow. Hopefully we will be able to bring you good news. But if we can't initially, I'm sure we will do later in the day to see the conclusion of what has been an enthralling match between Surrey and Somerset. But from me, Daniel Norcross, thank you, by the way, for all your birthday wishes. I'm going to go off and watch Midsummer Murders and have a takeaway. That's what you do when you're 55. Goodbye.